Welcome everyone. My name is Mark Ritchie and I have the honor of serving as president of Global Minnesota, your host for today. Today we are commemorating World Food Day. It celebrates the birthday of the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. It was first observed in 1981, so we're carrying on a very rich and very long tradition. Some of you have come and been part of World Food Day for decades. Some of you, this may be your very first time, your very first opportunity. So welcome to all, wherever you're calling in from, Zooming in or YouTubing it, wherever you are on the planet. I know that if you've joined us today, you share our passion for reaching that global goal for sustainable development of zero hunger and take pride in the success that we've had over the last decades in reducing hunger, malnourishment, and food insecurity worldwide. But I'm also guessing you share our broken hearts to the fact of our going backwards on the world food insecurity front. We know from every corner of the planet there have been uh, very uh, uh, disturbing reports, specific situations, but just in general. We've gone backwards for a couple years and we now want to regain that momentum using today as a way for us to move again forward. We're gonna start today by looking at the three big things that are happening that have been making us all less secure in our food supply. One is the climate crisis, the second is the COVID-19 pandemic. And the third are conflicts, violent conflicts within countries and across borders. This morning, we'll be hearing from the world experts, the leaders of the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Food Program, uh, uh, ECOSOC at the UN. We will also be focusing on how we frame our strategy for moving ahead to move us towards those 2030 Global Goals for Sustainable Developments, the SDGs, with zero hunger in our minds. The afternoon, we'll be looking at solutions. Panels will feature some of the success stories where people are combining the day-to-day -day work of making their lives and their neighbors and their communities more food secure with solutions that tackle the underlying causes of the climate disruption, of our breakdown in public health, of conflicts between people over land or water or whatever it might be. So those three C's, that conflict and COVID and, and, and climate, will be our focus during the day. And our goal is to give everyone who's viewing the opportunity to learn the facts, the ideas, the approaches, the information you need if you want to try to work in concert with others around the planet to reach this goal of zero hunger by 2030 and to reverse the backward direction we've headed in food insecurity. We'll be kicking off the day with a warm welcome by our wonderful governor, Tim Waltz. He's a sustainable development champion, a climate smart champion and a strong proponent and active leader for social and economic justice. After his welcome, we'll be joined by the global head of the Food and Agriculture Organization. They're the prim primary sponsor of World Food Day. This occasion uh, celebrates their founding date right after the Second World War. In fact, immediately following the creation of the UN, their first act of creation was creating the Food and Agriculture Organization to tackle that global famine that the whole world faced after the Second World War. Director General Chu Dong Yu is the lead um, of that uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. We'll hear from him first. Then we'll hear from the head of the UN's World Food Program. Uh, the Honorable David Beasley. He was our keynote speaker last year, World Food Day 2020. Very coincidentally, but very fortuitously, he had just been honored the World Food Program and he represented them by the Nobel Peace Prize Committee for their work in advancing peace and in combating and really challenging 
the way that food is used as a weapon in war. And so we're so pleased that he could join us again today. And finally, we'll hear from the new, relatively new head of our North American Liaison Office of the Food and Agricultural Organization, Jocelyn Brown Hall. And you'll hear some about the wonderful things FAO has been doing in North America and around the world to celebrate this in over 150 countries worldwide. Before we start those sessions, I have two housekeeping things. One is I want to make sure that you know that there is closed captioning for anyone hard of hearing, deaf, or any other need for closed captioning. Instructions are on the YouTube feed in the description box. They'll also be repeated on a slide throughout the day, but I want to make sure anyone who needs that kind of uh, accommodation, that kind of opportunity, um, there are the instructions there on the YouTube page. And then finally, I want to thank everyone who's made today's event and the opportunity we have to work together really possible. It's an amazing team here at Global Minnesota and a fantastic board, uh, our board chair, uh, Muffy McMillan, and the whole team there on the executive committee, but the whole organization has to pull together to pull off a really big event like this. And we couldn't do it without the support and participation of all of the speakers. You'll see a number of them in the morning and many more in the afternoon they are really crucial to our success our ability to make this happen and then finally to all of our members so those are individuals companies nonprofits they give us support that is financial that makes free events like this one which is broadcast worldwide and will be archived essentially forever and available to teachers and professors to rotaries and everybody else for the next 10 years or longer, those supporters are the ones who make this possible. We're also very pleased and very proud to be financially supported by our own state of Minnesota and by the US State Department. We're part of their overall effort to make sure that more and more engagement, and this fits with our mission, which is advancing international understanding and engagement. We do that by connecting people to the world and the world to Minnesota. Today, we're fortunate to be able to connect the whole planet together thanks to this wonderful technology. And I want to welcome our amazing Governor Tim Waltz to join us for kicking off our World Food Day 2021. Thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Minnesota Governor Tim Walls here. Thank you to all of you who have joined us from across the United States from over two dozen countries. I'm truly honored to celebrate World Food Day 2021 with all of you today. This annual event celebrates the founding of the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. This year's theme for World Food Day is Our Actions Are Our Future, and it could not be more relevant. As we continue to face global challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, we see how these challenges have impacted food security and agriculture. But when crisis hit, Minnesotans step up to help our neighbors and friends. By working together to tackle the challenges that come before us, we can create a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable world. I look forward to our continued work together to achieve that very goal. Take care and enjoy World Food Day. Mark, thank you very much. It's great to be back with you and Global Minnesota for World Food Day this year. The people and businesses of Minnesota are absolutely vital and vital supporters of the World Food Program and our work all around the world. So it's, it's a part of who you are. It is what you do. So thank you. I'm particularly grateful also for the leadership of Cargill and General Mills for their active partnership with us. They, they do amazing things, both through financial support, but also through their active involvement with the World Food Program USA. All these contributions of time, talent, treasure, allow us to both feed people and build systems that help contribute to peace and lay the pathway to a food secure and hopeful future. I have to tell, tell you all though, that the situation right now, it's not good. It's worse than when I spoke with you last year. We face 
the interconnected problems of hunger, insecurity, and migration as a daily reality. And we see how the climate crisis is combining with conflict and now COVID's economic impact to deepen hunger and make our world and our work even harder. Together, these factors have plunged 300 million more people into hunger and food insecurity. Without stepped up action and support, we risk a hunger pandemic following in the wake of the global health pandemic. We have hunger in Yemen, Afghanistan, Tigray, South Sudan, Madagascar, Central America, Haiti, and the list goes on and on. The coming year will be a critical turning point in global hunger. 811 million people go to bed hunger each night and 41 million people are on the brink of famine, knocking on famine's door as we speak right now. And COVID-19 delivered the hardest blow in decades to world hunger and many of the world's most vulnerable nations are not out of the woods yet. Hunger has the potential to destabilize nations and regions around the world. Conflict and food security are mutually reinforcing this problem. When you heard from me last, we spoke about conflict as the major drive of hunger worldwide. And I'm sorry to say that this is still the case. Anyone who takes a cursory glance at the current headlines will know how recent events have exacerbated hunger in Afghanistan and especially the horrible conditions that people are facing now in Ethiopia. There, people are fighting not just for food, but they're fighting for their lives. WFP is central in Ethiopia, doing all that we can to get trucks of aid to those who are facing starvation. Then there is climate. For example, first-hand evidence of the impact of weather events. We need look no further than Madagascar, where I just visited. You'll see there, drought upon drought has left families helpless and with no means to feed themselves. Hunger will worsen later this month as we enter the lean season, the period between planting and harvesting when food stocks run low or run out. Hundreds of thousands of lives are at risk in Madagascar, the only place in the world right now where famine-like conditions have been driven by climate, not conflict. I saw this myself firsthand, and it's unforgettably heartbreaking. Look at Kenya, where droughts and funding shortages have forced us to do something we, we never wanted to do. Rations were reduced by necessity, giving people who are already struggling even fewer calories to live on. But I do have some good news. The United States continues to be the world's most generous donor to the United Nations World Food Program, both through government support and through private sector actors like those on this call. Any given year, WP distributes over 4 million metric tons of food, more than a quarter of which comes through grants from the United States government, the United States taxpayer. That support comes from almost 20 states across the Union, including Minnesota. These American-grown commodities are critical to feeding the world through WFP and private markets. I've been in Washington talking to senators about the historic needs we're facing. They know that the support that WFP has from the American people and that without this support from the American people, U.S. companies and the U.S. government, millions more would be facing famine. Thank you for all you do to support the World Food Program. And thanks for having me here with you again, Mark. Great to be with you. Dear friends, this year's World Food Day found us at a critical moment. The COVID-19 pandemic remains a global challenge causing the untold losses and hardship. The impacts of the climate crisis are all around us. Crops have gone up in flames. Homes have been washed away. Countless lives have been thrown into turmoil. 
our swords are with the people in Afghanistan, Haiti, and many other humanitarian emergencies. Global food security challenges have not been this severe for years. Yet, in the past year, we have also witnessed the resilience and power within all of us. And we owe our gratitude to all our food heroes who have kept the production up and market shelf stocking. We at FAO have also prepared and positioned ourselves to better support the members in dealing with shocks and challenges. Our new strategic framework 2022 to 2031, endorsed by FAO 194 members, supports the 2030 agenda through transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems. For better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life leaving no one behind. The UN Food System Summit last month saw the world coming together committed to transforming our global agri-food system together. It was a People's Summit, a Solution Summit, and Action Summit. With hundreds of national dialogues contributing ideas and action plans demonstrating our collective commitment. This World Food Day calls on us to walk the talk and take the action. As a producers, distributors, all consumers, we each have the power to make a positive impact on the transformation. Our actions are our future. Let this world for day be day one of the future without hunger. Thank you. Hello, I am Jocelyn Brown Hall. I'm the director of the Liaison Office for North America of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. We're based here in Washington, DC, and we cover both the United States and Canada. I am pleased to wish all of you a happy World Food Day this morning at this exciting and timely symposium hosted by Global Minnesota. Collective action across 150 countries is what makes World Food Day one of the most celebrated days of the United Nations calendar. Hundreds of events and outreach activities, such as the one today, bring together governments, businesses, civil society, and the public to raise awareness and do some calls to action for those who suffer from hunger and for the need to ensure healthy diets for all. World Food Day also marks the founding of FAO on October 16, 1945 in Quebec, Canada. This followed its conception two years prior at a meeting held in Hot Springs, Virginia, where 44 governments met and expressed the need for a specialized UN agency to focus on food, nutrition, and agriculture. Today, over 811 million people are suffering from global hunger while over 3 billion people cannot afford healthy diets. Meanwhile, a third of the food produced today is lost or wasted, even as agriculture contributes to a third of the greenhouse gas emissions. We have to change. World Food Day aims not only to remind us of the challenges we are facing today, but to inspire action by all sectors to build a future of food that we want. The theme this year is our actions or our future, and it calls for collective measures at every level of the food system for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life for all. Each one of us, whether you're a producer, distributor, processor, or consumer, has a role to play to build a more inclusive, resilient, equitable, and sustainable food system. As the FAO Director General mentioned, there is power within each one of us to make positive changes to end hunger and build sustainable food systems. All of us can take action today that will lead us to better food systems tomorrow, where we appreciate the genuine cost and labor that goes into food, as well as the people who produce it. That's why as part of World Food Day last year and this one, we've been spotlighting food heroes who ensure that food reaches our table and they also promote sustainable agri-food agri systems. 
This year, we're excited to feature food heroes from North America, including the former White House chef for the Obamas, Sam Cass, Indigenous People's chef and advocate, Rich Francis from Canada, and Chef Jose Andreas, who probably needs no introduction, but he's the founder of the World Central Kitchen. Our regional food heroes include Monique Chan, founder of Bruised in Canada, and Passion Murray, who's known for leading Detroit Dirt. From improving school nutrition to promoting indigenous foodways, building resilience, and addressing food waste, these heroes are all working to have an impact at the community, national, and global levels. By sharing their stories, we hope to inspire you to act. You can also join the World Food Day Food Heroes campaign by sharing a picture thanking your food hero on social media using, using the hashtags World Food Day and Food Heroes. Other World Food Day activities that we have this week include an Indigenous Chefs Cook-Off, a Twitter chat about sustainable agriculture, a poetry competition, and a law lecture about the importance of regulations um, to food systems. We're happy to inform you that the United States Senate passed a World Food Day resolution, which we also introduced in the House. The resolution is a call to action to address the three drivers of global food insecurity, climate, economic downturns and con conflicts, all of which have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, we have introduced World Food Day state proclamations in the DC, Maryland and Virginia's tri-state area. We invite you to join us next year to introduce legislation or proclamation in your state. My hope is that each of you feels inspired to make a change this World Food Day, whether it's through diversifying your diet composting, recycling, reducing food loss or waste, or educating your friends and family about more nutritious, environmentally and socially responsible food products. We invite you to head over to the World FAO World Food Day website to find World Food Day events that take place nearby to you. You can also register your own event, no matter how big or small, to be included in the Global Celebration and Awareness Day. Thank you so much for having me. We're grateful for our partnership with Global Minnesota and wish you all an impactful and healthy World Food Day. Thank you. Thank you to the world leaders who have contributed their thoughts and also their energy and their life's work to the same mission, the same values, the same objectives that we share here of reaching that goal of zero hunger and addressing hunger wherever it is caused by whatever circumstances we must find the solutions and world food day gives us a chance to bring a lot of those ideas and leaders together i want to highlight other activities going on around the country and the planet uh, just so that you know how many important things are happening um, the last couple of days the un has had their world food security their global food security summit and they've been looking at mechanisms to recharge and restart the efforts that were taking us forward to greater food security until we were hit by the COVID and these climate dif difficulties extreme weather and the conflicts yesterday was announced the uh, this year's uh, world food prize our colleagues and friends down in iowa announced and they put the focus this year on fisheries and the role of our fisheries, small and artisanal and family fishers and others um, in addressing that food supply and food security issue worldwide. And of course, it's something we need to keep in mind everywhere, protecting our oceans, our lakes, our streams, our water, our biodiversity, our fish, our other marine animals. Our, our goal of worldwide food security includes keeping the whole planet a safe and ecologically strong biosystem. Today, some other organizations have made some important announcements. Our good friends at the Regenerative Agriculture Foundation announced a series of grants to indigenous and people of color organizations advancing what they're calling recovery regenerative practices in agriculture. And this afternoon, actually, you'll be hearing from a couple of those leaders uh, from the Iowa tribe of Nebraska and Kansas. So we're excited that they were honored in this way today. 
We also know that uh, today is a very special day in a larger context because it's the last day of Hispanic Heritage Month as celebrated here in the United States. Um, started in September 15th, um, our organization and many others have had a number of activities. But today was special because so many organizations lifted up the role of our Hispanic, Latino and Latinx partners, neighbors, friends and colleagues in the whole global food system, whether it's in production as farmers or farm workers or working in the food industry or bringing forth a cuisine that's appropriate and also the role that indigenous producers have played for thousands of years, bringing us the crops that we so critically depend on to today. These were from the contributions in many instances uh, from Central and South America, from Mexico, and from our own region here. So it's the last day of Hispanic Heritage Month, but if you haven't had a chance to uh, see some of those resources, that would actually be, um, uh, for many of you, maybe an opportunity to see how to connect with that important um, global opportunity next year. I was so happy to hear about all of the FAO activities, uh, food and agriculture organization activities here in North America and around the world. I know there's about 150 countries where there are things happening. So this is a sign of momentum. This is a sign of change happening and so glad that we can be part of that. We're about to move to a very special part of our World Food Day. Some of you have heard in the past of the social gastronomy movement. It was uh, born out of the vision and values and culture of a group of chefs in Brazil. They were looking at everything at food waste to just hunger in the favelas and they began developing a way of thinking about food as solution. And that social gastronomy movement grew out from there to be a whole wide global movement. And um, that global movement is taking the lead in many, many countries over the next three days. So today, tomorrow and Sunday with big ambitions globally, delivering a million meals and many other things. We have coordinated our timing with them to live stream their kickoff, their opening of their three days of events. You can see on the screen a list of the presenters. We will be going to their live stream uh, to catch their first part of their program. We'll hear from many different countries, exciting solutions. And again, it fits our focus of the day. We wanna make sure we have the facts and the big picture about uh, food security and insecurity, what's causing it, what are the different characteristics of what we need to do to turn this around. But we'll also be highlighting and celebrating the solutions that people have been developing in their own communities, in their neighborhoods, in the countryside, for their whole regions. This is a theme for us here at Global Minnesota, which is that we have the solutions within our grasp, but we need to make sure that the solutions that are important in the short term and hunger must be addressed immediately. And I think Governor Beasley from the World Food Program really highlighted this and the Nobel Committee when they honored um, World Food Program with the Nobel Prize talked about the urgency of addressing hunger. But what we know is that in all things, we must think of the solutions for the seven generations, for the future. Yes, we have things that we must do today to protect ourselves in the pandemic, whether that's vaccination and mask and all of the things, but we know we must also take appropriate steps to strengthen our public health system. We need to make sure there's food on the table. Yes, of course, but we also need to make sure that our fishing practices and how we produce and how we process and deliver food meets those criteria, those standards of reducing waste, of reducing carbon emissions, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So as we head into a future, conscious of the challenges created by conflict, by the climate crisis, by the COVID pandemic, we go into that future knowing that we have the solutions and they can be simultaneously putting food on the table and dealing with the underlying causes of conflict. 
the underlying causes of this climate crisis, the underlying weakness in our public health system that made us vulnerable to this pandemic and its destructive effects on our economy. So we're thrilled to join Social Gastronomy live at their kickoff. Thank you again for being with us here today. All right, I see lots of faces popping back into the room. Um, we do have some technical glitches, so bear with us. Charles, are you back in the room with us? I am. I am here. Thanks, Nikki. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Perfect. So we usually have a harvest moment, which we will do in the chat right now. So anything that struck you, that inspired you, someone amazing you've met in your little group, uh, please share actively in the chat, because right now the hour has hit and we're actually going live. Um, so I'll welcome everyone that's actually joining us through the live stream on YouTube. We are cross broadcasting. We are cross-broadcasting with Global Minnesota World Food Day Symposium. Um, so there are a bunch of people joining us through the live stream just now. So welcome everyone that's joining us at this hour. Charles, to kick off our main dialogue, I'll hand over to you. Great, thank you so much, Nikki, and welcome everyone to this exciting uh, universal uh, table where we are going to have an opportunity to hear from some uh, extraordinary, extraordinary guests who are joining us from different time zones and different locations around the world. Over this time, we're going to really, we're gonna have two conversations. Uh, we've asked our, our guests in advance, we've, Nikki and I've had conversations with all of them to invite them to respond to a question that relates to what they've learned about themselves in the context of creating connections, collaborations and partnerships. So we're going to explore that uh, together in conversation. And then we're going to transition into a conversation around possibility in this time of COVID conflict and climate change. What are the possibilities that our guests are seeing? So uh, we're going to engage our, our, our guests in, in sharing a little bit at the outset. We'll evolve that into a bit of a dialogue with each other. Nikki and I will be asking questions and our, our, our greatest sense of excitement and hope here is that amongst the, uh, the guests who are joining us, they're gonna discover overlaps of intersection and interest and possibility. And, uh, and that all of you who are, who are joining and observing this will hear some ideas, some inspiration that will, will help build on the incredible work that we know that so many of you are doing in this space of using food as a tool for social change. So a delight to be here uh, on this uh, on the universal table as part of the uh, the overall summit. And I think Nikki, we're going to start by uh, brief introductions of our guests. Yes, um, so I'll kick us off. I'm really excited to welcome Karina Nielsen, who's the mayor of Malmö in Sweden. Um, Karina actually hosted us um, exactly two years ago in Malmö, where we had our last in-person social gastronomy movement summit, and we had a beautiful moment at the City Hall, uh, learning so much more about this great city quite frankly it really impressed me because it's so inclusive so diverse and and it celebrates its diversity um and also has received many awards for its sustainable development and much more so do check out moment if you're ever in sweden you must must pass by the south 
And we learned that, 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 Karina makes, that Karina makes amazing rhubarb cookies. <laughs> so our, our next guest, I, I'm sure for many people there, there's there's been hardships with uh, with COVID. And, and for many of you, I hope there have also been some silver linings. I know a silver lining for me was meeting a uh, a new neighbor, uh, Charles McNeil, who, as you see on the slide, is the senior policy advisor for forest and climate at the UN Environment Program. Uh, it turns out that uh, Charles used to live and spend a lot of his time in New York City, but he uh, he now lives very close to me on a place called Bowen Island uh, here in British Columbia, and absolutely thrilled to be getting to know uh, Charles. The list of his achievements, involvement, and presentations in, in topics related to climate change, um, indigenous peoples, uh, initiatives. I mean, it's the list is so long. It's, it's extraordinary. And Charles, I'm just so, so happy uh, that you're here and able to join us this morning. And the one thing I want to share with everyone about Charles is he has, uh, he went vegetarian in the 70s and has been a devout vegan uh, for 15 years. And uh, his honoring of plants is something that uh, I have so much uh, admiration for. So welcome, Charles. Um, our next table guest of today is Mariana Vasconcelos. Um, she is a Brazilian entrepreneur and the founder of AgroSmart and is also one of our wonderful social gastronomy movement community members. Um, where do I start? Well, being the daughter of <laughs> farmers, she knows that the farmer struggles really well on the ground and now uses technology to better um, agriculture and really connect um, for a more resilient and climate resilient specifically as well, um, agro sector. She's Forbes 30 under 30, uh, MIT um, innovator, she's a web tech pioneer and many more. So really, really happy to have uh, Mariana at the table as well. And I do remember on a personal note, <laughs> as we're on both, actually during the Rio Olympics, my very first panel in Portuguese, I was sitting next to this wonderful woman that would from time to time do little translations <laughs> into English for me. So I'll definitely never forget that moment. Welcome, Mariana. Hi, everyone. Hey, Mariana, good morning. Another of our special guests uh, joining us uh, on the, at the table this morning is, is Michelle Grog. As you can see, she's vice president and corporate of, and corporate respons of corporate responsibility and executive director at the Cargill Foundation. Um, what I learned uh, in my conversation with Michelle, I met her for the first time last week, uh, is her passion for food security nutrition and sustainability. And if you read her bio, that's evidenced by her involvement in so many uh, different organizations having to do with uh, water, uh, having to do with sustainability, and just, just really quite extraordinary. And Michelle, I just want to do a special call out uh, to your organization, to Cargill, who has been behind the social gastronomy movement and been so supportive ever since the beginning. So uh, welcome and thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Thrilled to be here. Thanks, Charles. Wonderful. Now we're going to move all the way to Nepal. So I've got uh, one of our uh, late, latest late at night guests, just like from Korea, we have even someone joining. Um, Tulsi Giri. Tulsi is the co-creator of a, um, association Food Network. So how do we go from food chains to food um, networks? It's all about net weaving. He's also a social entrepreneur in many other areas like Bazaar, where he connects farmers and consumers directly, breaking both silos. And um, I really want to make a special um, shout out today because uh, we're honored to actually have Tulsi because it's evening for him. And right now it's the um, Tashang in Nepal, one of the biggest festives and goes on for two weeks and today is a very special moment for him because it's um, a celebration of victory of good over evil and actually a time for family reunions exchange gifts and blessings so i hope you find gifts and blessings in our session today Tulsi, as well so thank you so much for being here thank you i'm happy to be here Again, welcome, welcome to all of you. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to begin our conversation together. Uh, but before we do that, um, I'd like to take just- Charles, we're missing, yeah. we're missing two table guests. Who are we missing? 
Oh, Maureen and Mauricio. Oh, Maureen, my, my apologies. Oh, I'm jumping too quickly to Maureen. Oh, how could I forget? Maureen, uh, welcome joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, just, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Um, so um, Maureen is the uh, is the founder of Tuli Vayama. And if you go to the website, which, which I did a few days ago, it has got to be one of the most inspirational uh, set of images of young people engaged in growing food. And it's reflective of Marine's extraordinary commitment to the elimination of malnutrition and teaching of nutrition. Uh, it's just, I, I, have, I have a big garden, but boy, when I look at some of what Maureen's doing in the city with vertical gardens, it's just extraordinary. The other thing uh, about Maureen is she was recently the youth voice at the United Nations Food Summit. And uh, I just, her energy and her passion are so infectious. And I'm just so grateful that Maureen's here with us. Welcome, Maureen. And last but not least, and I think that, Charles, it, I must have drilled too much. We aren't going to be on time. We have to be on time. So I, I, I'm sorry for putting the pressure on that. Oh, yeah, no, no, um, no. So la <laughs> last but not least, I would like to introduce Mauricio Rodas, who's a former mayor of Quito. And nowadays, I'm not even going to list everything that he does, because I don't know how he does it with sleeping and taking care of his family as well. But he's in countless city and climate initiatives across the globe. And Mauricio and I go many years back, actually. Um, we did meet at the World Economic Forum. And I have to say, on a personal note, I was really inspired because Mauricio was working outside of the country, outside of um, Ecuador, uh, living abroad. And then he developed a responsible government mob model, government model, and decided to go back to his country and um, actually ran for, for president, became the mayor of Quito, so really committed to, to advancing um, his country, his city, and so I'm really excited that you're joining us in our dialogue today, running between commitments. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you so much, Nikki, uh, for the invitation. It is great to be here uh, in this uh, um, great uh, space for discussing how gastronomy can become a driver for social change and improving people's lives. So thank you so much. Um, during my time as mayor of Quito, I have uh, the opportunity to working with different initiatives regarding gastronomy in the city, including an urban garden program that I will be talking about later on today. So thank you so much. Great to be here. Thanks, Now, Charles, you can kick us now, off. <laughs> now, now we'll move into where we're going next. I just, again, thank you, thank you, thank you to our guests, our special table guests. And I'm looking forward to this, this next hour, roughly, that we're going to have together to explore and to think together on behalf of how we advance our individual and our collective work in influencing change uh, in so many different ways around the, around the world. Um, you'll see on the slide right now, we call it our recipe for food systems transformation and the three elements that are so core to the efforts and the work of the social gastronomy movement. It's, it's all about uh, connection and how do we create connection. We invited people who arrived a little bit early to this gathering to gather in small groups to connect with each other around food rituals. And uh, we, we consistently try and create these opportunities for connection because through those connections, oftentimes the opportunity for identifying what might we do together? Where's the potential for some collaboration? What things we could do that we simply couldn't do alone arise. And from collaboration, we've watched partnerships emerge amongst and between people in the 80 plus countries that are now part of the social gastronomy movement. So connection, collaboration, and partnership is, is at the heart of the, the, the recipe behind so, the social gastronomy movement. And we've invited our guests to reflect on their own experience and to share a story of connection, collaboration, or partnership with a particular consideration to a second model I just want to uh, reference and acknowledge. And that is a, a recognition that all change begins with ourselves. We can talk about large scale systems change, we can talk about societal change, but regardless of the scale or the nature of change, it all begins with me. So our invitation to our guests this morning is to share a story and we've asked them to each take about about two or three minutes 
to share a story of a, an experience of connection, an experience of collaboration that may have led to a partnership. And what have they learned about themselves in the context of, of that work? And we're going to we're going to hear from each of our, our guests in the same close to the same order. Um, I'll be calling on them. Um, and uh, after we hear each of their stories, Nikki and I are going to we weave together some of the themes that we're hearing. But we will also invite you as as the guests around this table together. If there's something that you heard uh, that really struck you that you want to build on or link to after we hear the stories from each of you, let's turn this into uh, as much of a dinner or breakfast or lunch roundtable as we possibly can. So, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start with uh, with Charles just because you happen to be geographically uh, closest to me. Um, and uh, ask you to share your your story of connection, collaboration, or partnership, and uh, what you've learned about yourself in the in the journeys you've been on. Great. Well, thank you. What an honor and a pleasure to be with people from all over the world. And <clears throat> my story relates to something I think that that each of us can can understand, and that's the impact on climate change that we've seen all over the world, the, the floods, the droughts, the fires, the hurricanes, the extreme weather, extreme temperatures. We only need to look outside our windows now for evidence that climate change is an existential threat. And here in British Columbia, Canada, a little town just a few hours north of here, Lytton, uh, registered the highest temperature in the history of this country of Canada just a few months ago. And then tragically, a few days later, it burned to the ground due to a wildfire. We're seeing this everywhere. And, and we're experiencing it. No one's safe. No one is going to get away from this until we solve it anywhere. So, And it so happens that recent reports confirm that there's no way to avoid catastrophic climate change without protecting tropical forests, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, the forests of Asia, where many of the people participant, participating now are. So it's also true that a major driver of tropical deforestation is agriculture, particularly animal agriculture. 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon is due to the cattle industry for beef. So clearly one of the best things we can do for climate is to stop eating beef, among other things. But to address this issue in 2008, I helped create a program called the UN RED program, Reducing Deforestation and Forest Degradation in Developing Countries. And at the time, it was a wild idea. Now it's a $400 million program operating in 65 countries. And the lesson in connection, collaboration, and partnership for me is that when we created the governance structure that would oversee this program, we managed to ensure that indigenous peoples had the same rights and responsibilities as entire governments and as UN agencies, that indigenous peoples had full seats on the governing board. They had veto power to stop projects and investments that they considered uh, detrimental. And, and we achieved this by appealing to the humanity and the heart of the high level government officials who had to make that decision. We didn't deal with them as bureaucrats and automatons. That we asked them to step outside of what had been standard practice for probably generations. And it turned out to be something of an historic breakthrough because this hadn't been done in multinational programs that I'd ever seen. Indigenous people's power and authority was recognized to be equal to that of governments and, and agencies. So this allowed Indigenous peoples to be constructive co-creators of the programs to protect their forests rather than, as has often been the case, excluding them from the process so they could only be heard by their demonstrations and protests on the streets outside. So instead of being opponents of the programs on the outside, they became leaders from the inside. And, and what did I learn uh, about myself? It, it sounds maybe sort of trite, but I learned that we should never limit ourselves or censor ourselves just because something has never been done before. I recall standing in front of this group of high level representatives of governments from all over the world to propose this. And I was sort of terrified thinking this is for sure going to be thrown out, never possibly accepted, but I just went for it anyway. And I learned that that even if I think something's impossible, it's worth really, really going for it. We need to dare to think beyond what we know or can even imagine. That's what my lesson was. Beautiful. Beautiful, Charles. Super example of you actually have no idea what's possible uh, until you try and limiting or censoring yourself is 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 only going to lower the potential or possibility. Um, 
I'm I'm going to just just because of the potential links that I hear uh, here, Maureen. I'm I'm going to go to you uh, next. Uh, just because of what Charles just closed with uh, in terms of uh, aspiring to possibilities that you may not have previously imagined and uh, invite you to share your story of connection, collaboration, partnership, and what you've learned. Maureen. Well, thank you, Charles. Uh, it was really great. And um, I kept nodding when listening to Charles uh, when you were speaking, and that's really inspiring. Um, so for me, I would say is... Um, Growing up and seeing um, caregivers uh, make decisions or make hard decisions of who who of their children is going to eat, this um, did not sit right with me because I I am a firm believer of um, everyone has access to food and no one is chooses where they should be born. So this is actually what led me into studying nutrition um, at bachelor's degree level, um, so that I could be able to be equipped with uh, the technical knowledge of how to uh, eradicate or address malnutrition from a technical point of view, um, eradication with the meaning or reduction uh, of malnutrition cases and food insecurity. So while in school, I realized the knowledge that I'm getting, actually, I'm sharing it with my family members. But remember, non-communicable diseases are on the rise. This is um, actually not just a, a Kenyan or an African problem, but this is a global problem. One in three people are malnourished. Yesterday, I was talking to one of uh, a health worker, and they were telling me at the health facility, they are actually seeing more incidence rates of children uh, suffering from overnutrition as opposed to undernutrition. So I, I thought to myself, how do I uh, change this narrative? How do I share the knowledge that I am getting far and beyond my family members? Uh, that is how Tulevema was born. And um, so what Tulevema does, and Tulevema is actually a Swahili word for let's eat right. Tule is eat, Viema is right. Um, so Tuleviema raises awareness of proper feeding habits among community members. We mainly work with young women of reproductive age because um, in the Kenyan culture or in the African culture, a woman is the one who is in charge of her kitchen. So once the woman appreciates um, various nutrients that she's supposed to be feeding her family, the various types of food that she should be feeding her family and why these foods, are, these types of or varieties of foods are important, she's going to replicate this. And um, also to bring this, um, the lessons that we share in class and to make them more practical is we equip these young women of reproductive age to cultivate indigenous vegetables on kitchen gardens. Uh, why indigenous vegetables is one as a way of promoting the uh, our culture, even as urbanization happens and takes place, the rapid urbanization, we still have roots where we belong. And also these indigenous vegetables are more nutritious, they're, they're more nutrient dense as opposed to the exotic vegetables. Uh, so the women cultivate four varieties of these indigenous vegetables for their household consumption, and then they sell the surplus to meet other household needs. Um, what I have been able to learn so uh, throughout this journey is, one, we all have important ideas. Um, there is nothing too small, uh, regardless of where you sit. Um, you always have something to share and you always have something to learn from the other person. And um, the, the ability or the courage to keep going and um, action what you think, um, what really annoys, action what you have identified as a challenge in maybe like society and uh, just get going. Sometimes you don't have all the answers, but just start uh, you'll figure out, you'll meet very supportive people along the way, people whom you can be able to engage and then uh, share ideas, and um, you'll be there. So Beautiful. I would say that is I'm not sure. Uh, Maureen, thank you. Begin the walk and others will join you. Have the courage. You know, and I, I think given your your passion for nutrition and addressing malnutrition, Michelle, you're kind of in the middle of my screen, and that topic I think is one I know is one that's uh, is is so core for you. So maybe uh, we'll go to you next for your story. Sure, happy to. Um, so I love this notion of connection, collaboration, and partnership. Um, it is what we do at Cargill every day in terms of our role in the supply chain, connecting farmers to markets and customers to key ingredients, but it's also what we do in our communities. So how do we connect 
um, across and within our, our communities. And a lot of our work, as you're, as you're pointing out, Charles, is around improving access to, to food, making sure that we can nourish the world. Um, we know that to achieve a more sustainable food system, it requires participation from all the sectors. So many of the people who are around this table today, um, we have to collaborate, we have to partner. We talk about the sustainable development goals and believe that SDG 17 is actually the most important. Um, we have to have partnerships to achieve all the rest. And so that's very much where we, where we come from um, and how we're focused. So this notion of connection, collaboration and partnership is, is part of what we do every day. Um, and I'm lucky to work with a team of people who develop partnerships around the world to advance food security and nutrition, improve equity, strengthen livelihoods. Um, one example that I wanted to talk about is some of the work that we've done with CARE um, over the years, and that's really to put women at the heart of many of the investments that, that we're making. So whether we are um, funding savings and loan programs for women in India or um, helping cocoa farmers um, improve their yields and incomes, or working with women in Central America to help provide alternative income sources. Um, all of these are um, impactful investments that result in um, improving food security. Women are more likely to invest those dollars back into their families. Kids are going to school, we're seeing families better nourished and we're seeing stronger communities. And so through these kinds of partnerships, we've learned a few things. One, I think trust. We have to have trust as a foundation for these partnerships. Um, we have to we have to believe and agree that um, we are all working toward toward the same goals. We may agree to disagree, but we have to have trust and faith that that we can work through those challenges. That's one. Two, I think um, one of the big lessons learned is that we have to have a long term commitment. These are big changes that we're trying to make, and so it doesn't happen in a year. So Cargill often makes three five year um, commitments to our partnerships. And in cases like work that we've done with the World Food Program, our partnership spans more than 20 years. The work that we've done with CARE spans more than 60 years. These are long-term partnerships, long-term investments um, that we're making in terms of resources, but also building the relationships that we need to drive real change. And then back to Charles's point about innovation and a willingness to take risks. I remember not too long ago sitting around a table talking about this idea of the social gastronomy movement. How could we connect people across the world who share this view that we can improve um, improve food security and we can we can connect food with social justice. And here we are today sitting around a virtual table all connected based on an idea that um, that happened just a few years ago. Um, and then we've been able to connect that work right here in our hometown community. I'm sitting in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where Global Minnesota is um, helping to broadcast this, this, this important conversation as part of our uh, World Food Day activities. And we can highlight great organizations like Appetite for Change who are doing um, incredible work here to link food and social justice. So um, learnings, trust, commitment, and um, the willingness to innovate and take risks are some of the key learnings that we've had. So. Great to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And clearly there's some themes that are emerging here um, in terms of taking, making those commitments, building trust and, and, and exploring uh, over time. Um, I'm going to go from there. Tulsi, let's, uh, let's jump to, uh, to Nepal and, uh, and hear, uh, hear a little of your story. Yes. Uh, namaste everyone again. Um, I would like to connect the story to what Maureen just said before. When you start and when you keep going, you will find lots of people around you to support and you can just then keep on going. It was back in 2002. I started becoming social entrepreneur as a young guy wanting to do something in food and agriculture and starting organic business, uh, which I realized at the moment it was too early for, for our uh, city to start uh, organic shop uh, first in the town. And it was a hard job. And already first year, we were all, all like going down as a business, you know. So I decided to go back because I was starting in Switzerland before, and then I decided to go back to Switzerland. But then I met, luckily, I met Patrick Honour, who is one of the co-founders of uh, Social Gastronomy Movement as well. And we built up this friendship together. And I came back to Nepal and restarted what we are doing. And I'm still continuing all those initiatives. And not only one initiative now, like multiple initiatives and getting connected to all these lovely people in SGM, you know, uh, being around the globe, learning. And it's like, then we 
we started working together. So it was like the connection was there and it started becoming collaborations with multiple peoples, multiple uh, friends from around the globe. And then the partnership built up and um, not like we are trying to create, like we discuss a lot about like what is food and how we could work with entrepreneurs working around food. And I love the term actors in the food, like who produce, who sell, who process the food, you know, all the actions in the ground who are doing the hard job for the food to come to the plate, you know? So our dream is if we could build up a society where food becomes a collaborative commons and not, you know, so if it becomes the asset of commons, then nobody would go hungry, nobody would fight for food or it would be a beautiful society. So uh, because of the connection and collaborations, the, the journey is directed towards that and we're still moving on and hopefully it will be, we'll, we'll reach there someday all together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tulsi. As, as I listen to you, I have this image of uh, planting many seeds and many flowers grow. And, and I've heard the stories from Patrick of the work that you're doing in Nepal with, with many others planting many seeds and, and the many flowers uh, that are growing. Um, let's um, on, on that note, maybe move to Mariana and, uh, and Mariana, hear your story. No, I feel excited as me and Tulsi, we share that vision and technology and agriculture. I'm excited for the post panel conversations and see how we can partner and generate impact. So I think that, that's the sense of those dialogues, right? Uh, I decided to tell a story that has a lot to do with this moment and also on how we can do something small. Like there is many ways to create partnerships that will change the whole world, but there's also ways to act local. Uh, Brazil suffered a lot with the COVID crisis and especially Manaus, that is the city capital of the state of the Amazonas, where the Amazon forest is located, suffered a lot with the lack of oxygen. So a lot of people died and the whole city collapsed. And at that moment, uh, I was very worried on how could we help? We do have a subsidiary of my company in the region. And it's like, we are not doctors. We don't understand about oxygen, just have no idea how to help. So we started looking what else was uh, the, the consequences of the lack of the oxygen in those chaos. And it turned out that there was a huge poverty, like a lot of people lost their jobs. They were not being able to access food. And a lot of farmers were not able to sell their produce anymore. So we partnered with a local startup that what they did is like to intermediate the, the transactions between farmers and markets. So use it, they use it to help farmers to, to sell their produce to, to the city fairs and, and consumers. And with them, we bought the produce from the farmers and donated to the families that could not afford it. So we end up in less than two weeks uh, helping 2,000 families uh, to alleviate a little bit of the suffering of lack of access to food and support financially the smallholder farmers in the region. And I think what I learned from it is like that there is always something you can do. <laughs> you just have to look for it. Like maybe you don't have the expertise, you don't know. And it doesn't have to be big because like in myself before that, I'm always looking something to be the moonshot, exponential and great. And it's like, and then sometimes you end up not doing stuff because you just think they're not big enough. And I think like we have to act and help even if just a small help. Thank you so much. Mariana, again, this, this theme of the power of connections and collaboration that occurs and what's possible when people come together uh, that you may not, have, may not have seen at the outset. So um, let's go, Maurizio. You can hear your story about connection, collaboration, partnership, and what you've learned about yourself. Over to you. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, so, so I would like to talk about um, an initiative that we uh, developed um, during my time as mayor of Quito. So we, we developed uh, the, an urban garden program, which um, meant the possibility of interacting with different stakeholders. It was really an initiative about uh, sharing responsibilities and um, partnership building 
basically. So um, the reason we, we decided to, to, to foster this program was because uh, on the one hand, we wanted to address the issue of poverty alleviation by providing um, low-income families the opportunity to, you know, to, to grow food uh, in their homes uh, and then you know, sell uh, those products through a very well-established uh, chain of distribution. Uh, we also were addressing issues regarding gender because 85% uh, of people um, you know, working on these uh, urban gardens were women. Uh, we were, of course, also addressing the issue of uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, regarding climate change. And we were also addressing issues regarding food security. So, uh, you know, this is the kind of uh, initiatives through which you can establish a very positive uh, scheme of, 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 of partnerships. Um, we learn a lot. We learn a lot. I personally learn uh, from very inspiring uh, stories from people working on these uh, urban gardens. Uh, I remember a, a lady, uh, a woman named uh, Elma, who talked to me about how she was growing avocados in, in her garden. And uh, previously, their, her family didn't like avocados. <laughs> but then when, when uh, she started growing avocados with organic uh, methodologies, then they realize the, the healthy uh, and nutrition, uh, very positive aspects of avocados. And then the, the, her family became a big fan of avocados, right? So that's, that's, that, that's a kind of very nice and interesting anecdotes you get from uh, working with people on the ground, uh, in this case, from City Hall, but supporting an initiative that was community driven uh, like the Urban Garden Program. So that's that's my story. Maritza, thank you so much. And I, I just want to acknowledge, and, and again, a common theme, the, the, the power of the stories, your own story, but the story of other people and, and what they're doing. It's beautiful. Karina. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor for me and the city of Malmö to be part of this, um, uh, really. And I want to share a story when I was um, chairman for the environmental committee 2005. And uh, I listened to a representative from uh, Fair Trade City who has been in uh, South America, the banana plantation, and she talked about that. And I, I get very affected of, of that telling. So um, after that, 2006, we was uh, the first fair trade city in Sweden. And uh, we worked on with that. We have a food uh, policy uh, going 10 years from 2010 to 2020 and in this year we have really done a lot uh, i want to share some examples but i think uh, my what i learn is that you as a politician you have to make some policies you have to set up goals and you have to check them ask for them what is the result to keep the interest uh, and you have to to really do a long time commitment and we work together with NGOs and also uh, business and entrepreneurs but in this food uh, program we have for example in the school um, we have found out a new word we call it foodology <laughs> I, I don't know if it exists, but uh, uh, 13 to 15 years old pupil in their schedule uh, discuss every week about food. And that's all aspects from the uh, cultural, from the farming, for food waste, ethical questions and um, food safety and so on. So they are really 
have a focus on food and, and the climate, of course, what we do with uh, the climate and what the impact the food has. And then we also have a special program supporting the entrepreneurs, uh, for example, about food safety, package, packaging uh, and um, uh, make climate smart products and also uh, urban uh, planting farming. So we could support people who want to uh, really live on urban uh, farming uh, in a small uh, size, but uh, still that you can earn some money and uh, live on it. So we have a lot of examples and uh, for now we, for example, in Sweden, the, the children get free lunch in school. So we served every day 50,000 lunches in the city of Malmö to children. And uh, we have 100% ecological um, vegetables in that. So we have reached the goal we set up actually, uh, reach it before the schedule also. So, um, and we also work with um, uh, the SDGs mail, uh, sustainable, uh, yes, you know, the, the UN goal. So we had that as a, a structure for our whole. Uh, budget working. So yeah, that was a little uh, from my, but I think uh, we need also politicians who take these uh, um, policies and really check up. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Karina. And, and thank you for all that, that you've done in support of, of the SGM, the Social Gastronomy Movement as well, hosting uh, the summit that happened there two years ago. I know that your leadership is absolutely instrumental in so much of what's happening. And uh, as you've said, it's only possible through the engagement of others uh, as well. So, um, it's beautiful to be watching. I don't know if, if you sitting at the table have also been watching the, the chat as well as listening uh, to, to those who are sitting here. It's beautiful to see some of, of what um, folks are saying. And I want to acknowledge that we have two audiences. We have those who are here on Zoom and are putting in their chat. And then we have Global Minnesota who may not see the chat, but uh, just want to call out and acknowledge that people are, are shouting out uh, to our table guests, what they appreciate about the importance of touching hearts, about the importance of building trust, uh, recognizing that no step is too small, especially when you begin because others will join you and come along. So we're hearing many things in the chat. But what I'd like to do, and, and Mariana, you sort of set the tone by saying, oh, I can't wait to have the conversation with the other people here at this table. Um, I'd like to us to try and imagine that we are sitting around a table together. You've all heard each other, each other's stories, each other's challenges, each other's actions, uh, your own learnings. And I'd, I'd like to open it uh, to anyone who would like to ask a question or reflect on or make a comment in response to anything you've heard uh, from the others. And you can just unmute yourself and, uh, and jump in. Charles. Maybe I have a question for Maureen. Uh, such a touching and inspiring story of, of the impact of, of local foods and, and, um, and taking care of each other. I'm just wondering, Maureen, how, how can you connect your work with, with the broader international community? Is there any way that, that uh, those of us around the world can help you in the kind of work you're doing at the local level? Wow, uh, thanks. I, Charles, um, thank you so much for uh, that question. Uh, yeah, um, so yes, uh, if we, one of the ways of uh, supporting or connecting with Trulebiuma, we have, um, we are currently available on all social media platforms. That means Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, so, and we are also, you're also free to, 
perhaps further this conversation um, via also email. Uh, I'll drop the email address on the chat box um, and also our social media platforms. Um, and also another way would be um, just to interact with um, the content that we share. Uh, we frequently ask, like we post the indigenous vegetables that we, that our women cultivate. Um, we would like to hear are these vegetables perhaps available maybe yeah they could be indigenous but also could there be a variety that is similar to that in your country and um yes but i'm happy to have a further conversation on that thank you others questions of each other or comments or anything you'd like to elaborate on tulsi uh, I just wanted to add what Kareen, Kareen, uh, uh, did I mention it? Okay. <laughs> what you just told about uh, the school nutrition, you know, uh, we had the initiative uh, in 2019, we were trying to start like a school meal uh, initiative. And for us, it was so hard to convince the school and the uh, government bodies, the municipality, and all those people who are important in that sector. Like we work with farmers, we have lots of food. and the idea was just to connect those food with the school canteens and it was like tough and then COVID came we had to stop that uh, initiative at the moment but uh, we are trying to initiate but what I wanted to reiterate is it is not just only the entrepreneurs or initiatives that could bring in but also the policy makers need to come on the same table and then then it is easy you know I have faced that challenge and thank you for serving 50,000 meals each day there for the kids I would love to do that soon Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Tulsi. Karina, did you want to comment at all on that? Mm, no, yeah. I, I, maybe it's a, it's special for Sweden that we have that uh, free lunch. But uh, of course, there is brave politicians, uh, history, uh, who have decided this. But uh, it's also depending uh, today uh, from un different municipalities what the the what you say do really do uh, about these lunches because you can of course uh, very cheap uh, food and not good but uh, we can also put a lot of effort in it and, and learn the children to eat vegetables and uh, try new uh, recipes and so so they get something uh, with them from this um, meal Michelle? Yeah, I just wanted to add on. I mean, I, this, this notion about school-based nutrition is so important, and I think we see it in places like Sweden where you're really leading the way. Um, there's a lot of conversation in the United States even around universal school meals. Um, to your point, Tulsi, how do we connect farmers to those markets? It's a great market, um, especially for smallholder farmers, and we're, we're doing that work as well with the World Food Program um, in parts of Central America where we're able to connect farmers um, with with schools. Um, and so I think for this group just to think about where can we create more of those connections. Um, it's a great economic opportunity and it's meeting a need that is just so significant for students. We need them fed so that they're able to learn. It's a great call out. Beautiful. Ariana. In Brazil, uh, a lot of cities, uh, the schools provide, free, uh, the public schools provide free meals for the kids and they source from family farmers. So like in many places, it's already the protocol. There is a lot to improve in terms of nutrition, like actually have planned meals after they buy it, how do they use it, what they use as uh, protein and so on, like there's a lot to improve. But there is this, and then when they suspended the classes in COVID, that's what triggered like the the complications for the smallholder farmers all, all over the country and in that line since we have like two representatives of the public sector i also want to understand in their vision how like a companies like mine that provide technology for creating climate resilience and farmers uh, how can we connect to the to the so, so civil society in the case of the unep and the and, and the governments to, to support those challenges. Mariana, I just want to build on your question and direct it to Maurizio and, and uh, Karina. Charles started by saying, sharing his story of appealing to humanity and heart of governments. 
and that it was by connecting to their hearts that the the shifts were made um if we might circle back to find out what you did charles in that particular situation but Maurizio, i'd be really curious to hear you know building on mariana's question you know when these connections and potential collaborations are are found kind of in the community in the field how what role can government play in helping move those to more impactful broad partnerships the role of government and 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 how to how to appeal to the, the hearts and humanity of government. So Maurizio and then maybe Karina, we could hear from you as well. Well, I think that um, city governments are in a unique position to do that because they are the closest level of government to the people, right? Uh, so, so, you know, uh, local authorities um, understand uh, daily needs from the community um and and probably because of that they are the most um fit to to undertake proper solutions to you know to 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 to, to improve uh, people's lives now um i have a big concern about what's going on right now because uh cities obviously have been at the forefront of dealing with covid-19 once again, cities have been at the forefront of dealing with one of the most uh, global pressing issues, in this case, a pandemic. Just like we uh, have seen cities doing so with climate change, with migration, and some other very, very uh, pressing issues. Uh, now, the question here is, are cities uh, capable of undertaking this kind of, of, of challenges? Uh, if, for example, they don't have proper access to financing, uh, unfortunately, in many countries of the world, cities are not allowed to internationally borrow. Uh, in some other many, many countries, uh, cities need a national government's guarantee to access to international finance, a, a, a national government guarantee that might not be granted because of political rivalries between the national government and the local authority. And this is important because if we think about cities as the closest or local governments as the closest level of government to address uh, daily people's needs, uh, they frequently are not able to do so because of this kind of obstacles to uh, receive the necessary uh, financial resources to undertake initiatives to effectively tackle the climate change, to build resilience capabilities, uh, to face with challenges like COVID-19 and others. So, so th that's why partnership building is so important. That's why, you know, it is important to have this kind of spaces to discuss about the ways in which we can improve people's lives at the local level uh, by uh, here thinking that gastronomy can become an industry for a partnership building, for fostering uh, different kind of economic activities, job creation in cities, uh, but also the access of cities to finance these kind of initiatives, not only at the national, but also at the international level. Beautiful. Thank you, Maurice. You know, following up on that theme, if I could, I, I, I've always believed that that uh, the cities is where the battle to save the planet or or not is going to be won or lost, and that mayors are incredibly important. That most of the economic you know activity of the world happens there at the local level, and I so I'm just wondering for. Karina and also from Mauricio, you've you've done things in the cities that other cities have not. You've taken a risk, you've swung out, you've stepped up. And I just wonder how is it that you found the courage and the support to, to do that? Uh, because most don't. So what is it that allowed you to to kind of have that impact to 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 really be innovative? You're unusual. And, and what's your secret? Thank you, and uh, I agree with Mauricio that uh, the city level often take initiative uh, and uh, is in the front line with the climate uh, work, for example. And uh, in uh, Malmö, we are a city with 350,000 inhabitants coming from 182 different nationalities. So we are a really multicultural city and half of the population is under 35 years. So we are also a very young city. 
And uh, I really think we, we get courage from our citizens and uh, try to have a good di dialogue uh, in different ways. But we also in Sweden have the system that we in the city, local level can take taxes. So we, of course, have a, a, a opportunity to finance in, a, in a, another way than um, other cities that get all their money from the national level. And Maurizio, for you, to Charles's question, the source of courage to act comes from? It must come from, from uh, under, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 th I think that, you know, as much as you can engage the community in the decision making process in a city, the better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can do that through various ways. Something that, that we implemented here in Quito was a uh, participatory budgeting process. Uh, so we actually heard communities' ideas about how the money would be spent for community works uh, and, and, you know, local infrastructure developing. Um, and, and not only that resembled people's needs, but also it was a very interesting vehicle to encourage people's participation. And I think that, again, uh, as much as you can have that kind of participation um, will always be, be, be positive and important. Um, going back to the example of the of the urban garden program, uh, you know, sharing knowledge, ideas, and initiatives among that community was very meaningful. Uh, we learned a lot. We learned a lot. I mean, as, as local authorities, but also people working on the actual program uh, also learned a lot, and they improved uh, their ways of you know channeling. Uh, their, 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 the distribution of their products, they raise their income uh, by doing so. So again, uh, you know, having uh, an open channel for community engagement and, and the provision of, of, of ideas uh, and input will always be, be very, very important. I, I, I want to just build on this a little bit and bring in a comment from one of our, our observers, Mark Series, he, he's written, it requires the collaboration of not only governments, but of farmers, businesses, industries, NG NGOs, and individuals. And Nikki's comment prior to that is, and it needs a foundation of trust. And Michelle, you know, you, you touched on this topic of the importance of building trust. Would really be curious to hear from you a little, um, what, are you, what are you learning? about what it takes to build that trust. Certainly you shared in your opening comments that that commitment to the long-term is key, but what else? Well, I think, I mean, in, in, I mean, in addition to a long-term commitment, you have to be really willing to listen, right? So we have to come to the table as true partners um, and, and equals when we're trying to develop um, new programs and, and, and partnerships to, to drive change. And so for me, yes, it's, it's about trust, but we have to be able to, to listen to each other. We have to be able to adapt. Um, and bring in others that, that we're going to learn from. We don't have all the answers. Um, we know a lot, but we don't know it all. And I think part of creating successful partnerships that lead change is that you bring in the right people to do the right work. So we're going to need local governments, right? We're going to need farmers. We're going to need NGOs um, to come in with, with their expertise. And so um, I think it's about really looking holistically at challenges before us and who has the right skills and resources to, to drive that change. Beautiful. The right people coming together to listen deeply with and to each other to discover where those intersections of possibility might be. I'm going to shift the conversation in just a moment into the possibility space, but I'd like to, uh, Maureen, I saw that you un unmuted yourself for a moment there. Um, just if there are any other comments around themes that have been emerging that you've been hearing at this table, Maureen. Yes, uh, I just wanted to add on to what Michelle has said um, and and say also involving um, like the community members or whoever the stakeholders involved in identifying the challenge. Sometimes what I perceive as a challenge may not necessarily be what the community think. 
the community could think or other stakeholders could think that's like a secondary challenge. So uh, also as you involve them in um, implementation, also identification of the challenge is uh, vital in involving the relevant stakeholders. Mm. That's what I wanted to add. Yeah. Charles, I see you've unmuted. Yeah, just to, you know, in that example of me presenting to a bunch of high level government officials, I think what, what was important was to remember that they're human beings above all, beneath it all, that, that we need to not be intimidated by titles and just sort of be careful and rigorous about addressing ourselves to the human being there and not to the office or the, 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 the you know, all, all, all of that. And somehow that's hard to do in political affairs, but, but it, it works sometimes when when we do that and and charles so just just build on that a little bit is there anything in particular i mean M michelle's offered you know listening is absolutely key is there anything you've found in your work and working with officials in those positions that has helped connect at that shared humanity and heart level anything by way of a practice or a way of being it's a, it's a really good question. I, I think it's it's just sort of reminding myself that this is a person who was born and grows up and lives just like every single one of us, that his and her concerns are just the same fundamental concerns that we all have about uh, caring for our family and our loved ones and and, and aspiration for a future that, that whatever uh, political constraints they're under that beneath all of that there is that same aspiration for for a whole new world that we all share and just to keep that in mind as as i'm engaging with them beautiful beautiful thank you i'm going to shift us into the in this last 15 minutes that we have together into the second part of our conversation which is you know an acknowledgement of can think of it as the three C's that we face, and, and they've been mentioned here in this conversation. Uh, certainly climate change uh, is a challenge. Uh, conflict, uh, some more so in different locations than others, but certainly conflict, and the challenges of COVID. So, you know, we, we could look at these three C's, climate change, conflict, and COVID as problems and, and challenges or difficulties. Our invitation to you and coming to this table was to think about what is a what is a possibility that is compelling and engaging your heart right now uh, that you see uh, in this space of social gastronomy in the context of climate conflict or COVID. What's a possibility that's compelling or exciting uh, that 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 you're engaged in or see? And maybe we'll start um, with uh, Mariana. And uh, and go around, just go go around the table, and then to Karina, and then to Charles, and we'll go from there. Mariana. Oh, let's try. Okay. Well, I think uh, it's a great moment that we're living, and with all the COVID challenge that we had, we were posted with a great opportunity of restarting. Right. Like there's many campaigns from Global Compact, from the UN, and so on. That like we cannot just go back. We have to go back differently. And the, the pandemic raised the awareness around food because many people just became aware in the beginning when everything was missing in the supermarket and so on. And like the, 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 the worries were around, we cannot lack food. We already have health issues. We cannot have food issues. So like I saw uh, an awareness, a shared awareness among the, the several stakeholders on thinking about the food supply chain. So I think that that create a momentum for us to discuss about the climate crisis and so on. And I think the way that we change the food system and make it more resilient to the climate crisis it starts with the consumer and the food that we have in our table. So when we make conscious choices, when we push brands, retailers, food and beverage industries into our trading like Cardiol, into bringing to us consumers more traceability, more transparency, then that creates a domino effect because they have to go back to their supply chain and they have to support farmers into building that uh, production model that will allow them for having data, for allow that will allow them to communicate to the consumers. And then you can tackle all at once, like yields increase that we need in order to feed more people, 
climate resilience and traceability. Beautiful. Thanks, Mariana. Karina, a possibility that you see. Yeah, uh, it's maybe not about food, uh, but uh, I think the the pandemic has no had no good things. But one thing I could see, and that's uh, that we have taken the step over the doorstep to the digital meeting world as we do now. We can meeting without traveling and I think that's very good for the climate. So that's a good, uh, the technique I, I think have been there for a long time but uh, it has been some resistance so we don't use it uh, like we could. But now we have a lot of meeting uh, digital and we found out it works very well and uh, for myself, I also sit with uh, my iPad on the table and eat together with people in uh, other parts of Sweden uh, through uh, FaceTime, for example. So uh, you can really uh, enjoy these uh, digital possibilities and that I think we have to thank COVID a little for that. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Karina. And Karina, I don't know if you'll have the time, but please join one of the Universal Kitchens. It's incredible some of the folks that are going to be, the chefs that are going to be sharing and cooking and eating together. Talk about possibility, uh, made possible by technology. Uh, Charles, possibility that is exciting or compelling to you right now. Uh, I have several. One is, uh, you know, we saw during COVID that when governments choose to prioritize something, they can allocate enormous resources immediately. When governments uh, feel political pressure, they can they can they can be take serious action. So they can take serious action on climate if they feel that political will, and that's one message. Uh, secondly, that there's, as Mariana said, there's an opportunity to build back better. This is the time to accelerate the long overdue phasing out of fossil fuels for a resilient and low carbon economy. This is the time, and I'm really encouraged to see uh, growth in plant-based foods so people are understanding that to eat more plants and less meat is critical for their health, for ethics, and for forests and the climate. That I'm seeing and encouraging. And the last thing is I'm seeing a kind of historic potential for reconciliation between religious leaders and indigenous leaders. In my work with the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative, I'm seeing the potential for healing where religious leaders, starting with Pope Francis, are literally apologizing to indigenous peoples for 500 years of oppression and suppression, and indigenous peoples are generously responding to that. This new alliance offers a whole new hope for protecting the tropical forests um, and the indigenous people's rights around the world. Beautiful. Thank you, Charles. I'm going to go Tulsi, then Michelle, then Mauricio, and then Maureen. Tulsi, possibility that excites you. Yes. Uh, I would like to tell my own story that we went through these two years. You know, before COVID, we, I had six initiatives simultaneously, some were, some were starting, some were already in a kind of phase. But then COVID, and they, they were all towards like, tackling the climate change as an issue in a in a bigger topic. Uh, but then COVID came in and then uh, the first lockdown, we had to shut down everything. So we were like all confused, not sure what to do. But fortunately, you know, ever in my life as an entrepreneur with our digital, uh, Kethi digital platform that we have connecting farmers and uh, the market, I made the biggest money during this uh, pandemic time and that was like for an entrepreneur it was a like great thing you know like the customers were responding positively and um, they were like buying local food with us uh, digitally uh, and our farmers were happy because we they could like even sell during the pandemic and that was a lovely like as an entrepreneur it was like doing great so tech thing it works even with pandemic or challenges there, there is a solution we can all work out. Second thing, you know, like we were planning for Nepal food as a big event, like yearly event as fair and summit. Uh, but then this again, COVID broke it down. We couldn't do that. But after having the digital presence and after like uh, being engaged, like we said, like, okay, let's do something. Like we are part of the UN food system summit. So let's do the virtual dialogue. And it's amazing. Now our farmers are using our platform and they are part in the digital uh, meetings. Our farmers are attending them. Come on, like in Nepal, they can, like farmers can use the technology and be at, in the same table to discuss, which was like 
everyone thought it is too much like farmers can't use the technology that's wrong now it's proven so and uh, and then this virtual network of like nepal food grew now like last week we did like first physical event with uh, universal plate uh, uh, with scm and it went fantastic and the new collaborations initiated and now like we had like network of more than 300 uh, initiatives from around the country who are in the pool of our like network of Nepal food. We have the platform completely best running. So uh, the challenges can become opportunities and it's possibilities and it's going on. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tulsi. Michelle. Sure. Well, I just want to highlight the resilience in, in, in people that we've seen. Um, it's been it's been remarkable. So we talk about this notion of building back better. And I fully agree, Charles and Mariana, with some of the things that, that, that you both said. We do need to build back better. And I think there was a great reset. People are looking at what are what are the priorities? What do we want to focus on? Where do I find more meaning and impact in the work that I'm doing? And we're certainly seeing that. I think people at Cargill are working harder than ever to make sure that we get food where it's needed. Um, this important focus on farmers. And Maureen, you talked about making sure we've got community members and in, in the conversation to help direct it. Same with farmers. We talk a lot about the changes that need to happen in agriculture and food, and there's not always farmers at the table. And so one of the things we really prioritize at Cargill is how do we make sure we have those voices there? They are the environmental stewards. We're seeing remarkable change and in innovation um, in agriculture and farmers are, are leading the way through regenerative agricultural practices. And so I think that's really exciting. Um, on the community level too, we talked about the role of cities. I mean. The, the amazing resilience of our cities and our communities to respond to COVID, to respond to climate, I think gives us a lot of hope. Um, we've, we've seen great, great agility, great um, adaptability and amazing collaboration. Um, we're seeing people partner who haven't before. We just experienced you know, significant impact from Hurricane Ida um, to Cargill's facilities in, in New Orleans and to many of our employees. And we had one of our nonprofit partners who works on river cleanups go down, donate generators to food banks to make sure that people could access to food. So creating these connections um, and, and a real willingness to help one another, I think is one of the great outcomes um, of this one certainly gives me a lot of hope. Thank you so much, Michelle. Mauricio possibility that's compelling to you at the moment well i think uh, um yeah like like um michelle just mentioned cities have uh, shown extraordinary leadership around the world by taking very innovative and bold uh, decisions uh, in many cases even more so than national governments to protect the population from covid related risks and they have been doing so also regarding other kinds of, of, of threats. You know, we've seen cities like Athens uh, facing the challenge of forest fires because of extreme heat during the summer. We've seen cities in the west coast of the U.S. and in Canada during the summer also experiencing very high temperatures. And, and therefore, you know, local authorities taking bold, bold decisions and initiatives uh, to protect their population, particularly the most vulnerable from, from heat related risks. So cities are, are perfect spaces for innovation. Uh, and, and in that regard, I think that cities can become really a driver. Uh, and I really think this is a great opportunity. Uh, cities can become a driver for the building back better strategy all over the world. Uh, I would like to see um, cities, for example, receiving some of the financial resources that are being part of the recovery packages that are being set up by national governments. We have seen uh, multi-trillion dollar um, recovery packages being set up uh, in many countries around the world. Okay, I think it is time. Uh, to disperse some of that money into cities so cities can implement climate change related projects, can build uh, resilience capabilities, uh, can foster different industries for economic growth and job creation, like for example, the gastronomy, the social gastronomy uh, sector. So uh, that's the kind of opportunities I see now. And again, having the, the, the chance of speaking about this in these spaces, uh, it is very, very relevant in order to come up with ideas and innovative solutions for this to happen. Thank you so much, Maurizio. Maureen, we'll end with your comment on what you see as possible. Um, 
what I see as possible is um, COVID-19 has clearly, just as Mariana has said, um, it has exposed uh, the fragility of our food systems. But what really excites me is um, during the UN Food Systems Summit, there's a group of, there's a youth coalition that came together and um, we, we wrote, um, it's a youth pledge that calls for governments and businesses and private sector um, want to listen to young people uh, and um, the ideas that they have towards building back a stronger food systems and also not only a pledge because that's the pledge part of the campaign but also actions for change what are some of the actions of change young people in the different countries that they, we all come from what would you like to see your government and um, commit more towards and uh, that's what really gives me um that's what I see as a possibility because currently we have over 103,000 uh, pledges from all over the world. And this is a campaign uh, that was launched on the 18th of May. Um, so with that very, uh, um, we, we launched it in May and we are now in October and we've been able to gather over 103,000 signatures. Um, it shows that young people are committed towards building a stronger food systems, uh, governments, um, business, private sector. We are calling on to all those people to be able to support because um, as Karina also mentioned that they have a very youthful population. And um, if it is to be, it is definitely up to us. And uh, yes, so that is what really excites me. And the campaign is called Act for Food, Act for Change, which I highly recommend all of you to be a part of. Uh, we say it's a youth pledge, but um, we're an all-inclusive um, team. So you do not have to be below 30 years. You can also pledge as an ally. And I encourage you to share it with your networks because together we can do this. Oh, Maureen, thank you so much. Wow. Uh, wow. We're at our time. And I just, I, I, want to, I want to keep going. I want to go have food with each of you and explore these. But I just want to, in summary, uh, three things say a huge, huge right. thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. to the six of you for being here. Two things have really uh, struck me. The power of the collective. And I'm thinking of, and I'm going to change Margaret Mead's famous quote just a little bit. Never doubt that a small group of committed farmers, youth, chefs, government leaders, and NGOs can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And the second thing that struck, has struck me is the, the power of the heart. And Charles, you started us off with uh, that acknowledgement that we're all connected. And I am going to close us with a poem uh, that comes from an Indigenous leader here in Canada. Some of the folks in the social gastronomy movement uh, know this. It's actually, it's a reading out of a lovely book by Richard Wagamasi called Embers. Uh, he's an uh, Ojibwe elder, and fortunately he's passed away. Just take about a minute to read this. And I think it really touches on, on so many of the points. From our very first breath, we are in relationship. With that indrawn draft of air, we become joined to everything that ever was, is, and ever will be. When we exhale, we forge that relationship by virtue of the act of living. Our breath commingles with all breath, and we are all part of everything. That's the simple fact of things. We are born into a state of relationship, and our ceremonies, our rituals, and even our meetings are guides to lead us deeper into that relationship with all things. Big lesson, relationships never end, they just change. And believing that lies the freedom to carry compassion, empathy, love, kindness, and respect into and through whatever changes. We are made more by that practice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's an absolute delight to share this time this morning with you and my fresh blueberries, which I will eat when we finish. So we're, uh, we're now going to uh, go into, uh, back into small groups um, and, uh, and have a bit of a conversation with a few other folks. It may be uh, the same people you were with before. There may be a few others. Uh, we've tried to organize, organize this so people of the same language.
Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back everyone to Global Minnesota's World Food Day 2021. We're focusing on the impacts of climate, the COVID pandemic conflicts on food security. In these morning sessions, we're looking at the big picture. In the afternoon, we'll be looking at solutions and successes that people are having, both addressing food insecurity in the short term, but simultaneously the underlying causes of some of the climate crisis, the COVID pandemic and the deep impact it's had on our economy and the conflicts that are happening within and between communities, nations, peoples. I'm so pleased this morning to welcome our guests to look at the large picture, the impact of how the climate crisis, the extreme weather situation we've been facing in some recent times uh, is affecting um, food security and really the world's largest industry, food and agriculture. Joyce Chang is the global head of research and that is a part and member of the management team of JP, Morgan, JP Morgan's corporate and investment banker. She's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Inter-American Dialogue. She serves on the board of director of many important uh, civic and nonprofit organizations like Triple Up and Girls Inc. And she's also in charge of the JP Morgan's Corporate Investment Bank Women's Network. Joyce, welcome to World Food Day 2021. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for giving us an overview of how climate is affecting food security and the world's largest industry. It's great to be with you, Mark, and great to be with everybody at Global Minnesota. So this morning, we are seeing the big picture. How do you approach this as you, as director of research of one of the world's largest banking and investment institution, the whole planet often is looking to you and to your organization for the big picture, the long term. How is climate affecting food and agriculture and food security? Well, I think big picture, we have to start with where we are at, at with COVID-19. And we are seeing really the first increase in poverty in two decades. And that's very important when we talk um, about food poverty, because it's not food supply, it's affordability that's the real problem. So the increase in poverty is the first thing that I'd like to address. And then who is really most vulnerable? And that goes to many of the low income emerging markets countries, and also women being adversely impacted. So let me just walk through a couple of these issues. Well, the big difference that I see right now is the starting point of this pandemic is worse than previous crises because we've had the real reversal um, of a two year, um, two decades of improving um, the poverty numbers. We estimate that close to 90 million people are likely to fall below the extreme poverty threshold this year. Um, and it's not surprising that the places that have the greatest issues are in Africa and South Asia. Um, they're suffering from the most pervasive forms of poverty and environmental vulnerability, sub-Saharan Africa. And here, agriculture represents a disproportionately large share of GDP that employs up to about 80% of the rural economy. And when we take a look at just farming um, in parts of Africa, it's often in heavily degraded lands that lack high quality 
inputs like seed and fertilizer and access to agricultural markets. Um, and when we take a look at subsistence farmers, they represent about half of the world's hungry people. And if you take a look at that and even just break it down further, um, half of that in turn are women. So we estimate that um, more than 820 million people, one in nine are undernourished today, um, experiencing a shortage of food every day. Well, over twice that number have moderate food insecurity and frequently compromise on the quantity or the quality of food that they consume. Um, so that really has grown in tandem also with a rise in human conflict, forced displacement and migration, a topic that I'll talk a little bit about as well. And our estimate is when you link this to climate change, if this is left unaddressed or just use the world's banks numbers, this could actually push an additional 100 million people into poverty by 2030. Um, and uh, we have tried to actually calculate in macro terms what the loss of this is, but um, 520 billion of annual consumption losses, um, 26 million people into poverty annually every year. Um, and the poor are much more likely to be impacted by climate change because they often work in sectors that are much more susceptible to extreme weather conditions. Um, and also vulnerable ones, they're near rivers affected by rising sea levels. So if no action is taken, the World Bank estimates that by 2050, approximately 143 million people will be forced to internally migrate due to climate related consequences hitting Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Latin America. So that's the first point, just the poverty and the impact on emerging markets countries who bear the burden. So emerging markets have the burden of um, temperatures that are warmer to begin with, so that amplifies the current challenges. They have a larger reliance on agriculture. They have less financial capacity to invest in uh, adaptive and modernized technologies. Um, and we have really seen that over the next century, extreme weather events are likely to become more frequent. Um, tropical storms um, in South and East Asia and Latin America in the Caribbean, um, you know, and we take a look, not just at the World Bank, but some of the estimates by the International Monetary Fund, and they estimate that for some of these smaller countries, like the Caribbean islands, they're 18 times higher for small countries than larger ones, as far as the cost of damage from natural disasters. And they have less resources to defend themselves. Um, and then we look at things also, um, you know, the tropical storms, but then also things like water scarcity. And here in the Middle East and North Africa, we see that over 60% of the population is exposed to very high degrees of water stress compared to 36% on the global average. And water losses, even just in this region in the Middle East, could be anywhere between 6 to 14% of GDP by 2050 due to climate-related water scarcity. So this crisis has really hit the emerging markets um, you know, more um, you know, squarely. And then finally, I just want to say something on women, um, how women have been impacted. Um, but this pandemic has been a big setback for women globally. We've actually seen 54 million women from employment um, globally dislocated. And even in the United States, I'm you know, the most advanced country for women in the labor force, we're at a 33 year low. Um, we had 2.3 million women leave the labor force. But um, natural disasters have a bigger impact on women compared to men. And this is due to a number of different factors, the access to information, early warnings, um, limited access to resources, versus that can build um, resilience. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Some of them are societal, cultural, and religious norms. Um, much of this is because women bear the burden of child and elderly care. So they're most likely to be at home taking care of others when disasters hit, and that makes escaping more challenging. And we've seen this in a number of different examples. Um, you know, we've seen this in Hurricane Harvey in 2007, when many women chose not to evacuate because they were caring for others. Um, when we look at um, cyclones that hit in Bangladesh, um, you know, 90% of women actually didn't even receive the women um, because they were delivered to men in public spaces. They didn't meet women who were waiting in their homes. So I, we are really seeing um, just three big macro themes come out, an increase in poverty, a bigger impact on emerging markets from these crises, and a bigger impact on women. Joyce, thank you for that incredible overview and for bringing our attention to the interconnectivity of these problems and challenges, the special impacts on women, people of color in other parts of the planet, but you also brought it home to things that 
are happening basically in every part of the world. You're mentioning of Harvey and these large mega events. We just had the special, uh, perhaps first time ever, when the hurricane that hit New Orleans ultimately killed so many people in New Jersey and New York. And there's a new dynamic that you were bringing our attention to. I'm wondering in your research, how you apply this to what policymakers should be considering and thinking about if we know these facts, what are the implications for where we move to be more preventative, to really uh, change uh, who is being affected and, and how our societies could be stronger if we took more affirmative action? Well, I think we have to target um, some of the lowest income you know, segments of the population and also the emerging markets areas. But I also just want to say um, a word on urbanization because climate migration and increased urbanization is one of the big themes that we're seeing as well. Um, and just as we've seen that climate change is skewed towards the developing world, it, it also skews the climate migration. Um, and climate change has been linked to migration across um, emerging markets you know, from drought and land degradation in sub-Saharan Africa, in India and Mexico flooding and Vietnam and Bangladesh rising sea levels and the Pacific Islands, you know, closer to home even we've seen like all the problems in Miami, um, just to name a few. So we are seeing that if you look at this just globally, one of the big issues we're going to see in the absence of policy action is that climate change could affect the movement of 143 million people within their country's borders by 2050. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa stands out to be most affected. And what we are seeing is that you know 55% of the global population already lives in urban areas, but this could actually hit 68% by 2050, mostly driven by Asia and Africa. And the most populous cities in the world are already predominantly in emerging markets regions. But if you take a look at the World Bank's forecasts, they think that you could actually see Delhi becoming the largest city in the world by 2030, overtaking Tokyo as the largest city. Another one of the uncaptured costs that I want to talk about and also put some numbers around is the impact that climate change has on local air pollution. Um, and if we take a look at Asia, the Middle East and North Africa, um, the IMF estimates that uncaptured costs could rise to as much as 13 to 18 percent of GDP. Um, you know, and with those costs really not coming from global warming, but rather the adverse effects to local air pollution. So we have a lot of uh, um, uh, big impacts to deal with um, immediately, but then there's also um, policies that we need to take that are more preventive. Um, and I do want to just say a few words on deforestation right now, because forests cover about 30% of global land area, but um, half of the world's forests is are concentrated in just five countries. Um, you know, Brazil gets a lot of this focus, but you know, we see that um, the estimates on just the total um, forest area as a percentage of the total land area has actually gone down um, to about 30% um, from 32.5% in 1990. So a loss of 178 million hectares of forests, um, you know, that is like about a thousand football fields every hour, <laughs> um, just to put that into perspective. Um, and so one thing that we are looking at is just that, you know, the agricultural expansion is about 73% of the deforestation worldwide. And that puts the food sector and its value chain really under the spot by getting back to the food security issue. So deforestation um, is a, a, a big part of the um, things that we can do to try to look at uh, how we plan um, to change these numbers so that they don't play out as, as they could. Um, and so we are looking at, uh, you know, policy such as, um, you know, what can you do, like if you take a country like Brazil to increase the production of, um, you know, cattle ranching, which is a major driver of deforestation in Brazil. Um, what can you do to increase the um, efficiency in production to also um, you know, uh, decrease the deforestation. 
And I think that just sort of closer to home, there's this whole growing debate about the sustainable food products, right? That the alternative protein market was a niche a few years ago, but now it's becoming increasingly mainstream. Um, Plant-based proteins are you know, much less resource intensive. They can represent an opportunity. And you know, it's, it's very interesting when we take a look at the numbers, um, plant-based proteins are no longer a niche. Um, and they've become much more, when we look at the growth um, from consumers, they account for as much as, you know, sort of half of the growth that we have seen, um, you know, in, in, um, in some of the consumers' um, you know, um, protein index, um, you know, really changing their consumption patterns. So there's a lot of changes in emerging markets, some changes in, um, you know, uh, developed markets also just in this food security program and how we use less resources in food production in a more preventive way. And then there's the actual impact of these disasters where we have to have policies targeted to the areas where um, people are migrating to and concentrating where these crises are concentrated. I really appreciate that you've taken our conversation into that broader, the food system. And I know that the United Nations just last week for the very first time held a global conference on food systems. And I think that's a very positive sign that bigger thinking is now not just a, a good thing, a, a nice thing, it's what we must do. And you put your context in different boxes. There are emergencies that happen, a civil war, a hurricane, an earthquake. We have to be prepared, do what we can to prevent them, be prepared. Then there's the urbanization and just the context of the urbanization, different diets, different health outcomes, often negative health outcomes. And then the trends that we can see, deforestation, what do we do? The trend towards new kinds of proteins, for example. I'm wondering if from that analysis, you're beginning to see um, that companies that are aware, let's say taking advantage of your research, are they making adjustments in ways that are reinforcing the positive upward spiral or do they look for an angle or a corner that might help them in a short term but may not be so good for the planet long term? Well, I mean, one thing I have to say um, from this pandemic is that ESG, environmental social government risk, have moved into the mainstream. This has really moved from a nice to have to a must have. So you are getting much more focus within the industry on deforestation, gas emissions, um, working conditions as well, um, the inequities that increased um, during this pandemic. And some of this is actually coming down to looking at, at, at um, animal agriculture, you know, as well. Um, and, you know, more of a, also a generational change that consumers are turning to plant-based products as well. So I think that this part of the movement is actually in a very nascent stage. I think these generational changes really mean that um, you will have that companies will have to focus more on reporting on these issues, responding to these issues, um, but they're also going to have to change, um, you know, I think to a more sustainable business model across um, a, a number of areas, including the consumer package goods. Um, and if you look at the sustainability marketed products, that's like half of the growth of consumer packaged products. If you look at the period from 2015 to 2019, and it was a trend that accelerated during the pandemic. So this is no longer a niche. ESG is no longer a nice to have. I mean, it is something that is really with us to stay. Well, this is uh, some very, very good news that some of these big picture trends are moving us in the right direction. I know that here in Minnesota, one of the things that you mentioned, just the dislocation, the, the movement of people, um, you know, Minnesota is the place with the highest percentage of refugees and asylum seekers in the country. There's been an incredible positive contribution. And we have, um, you know, different waves of immigration and, and people coming. But many years ago, the big uh, immigration from Southeast Asia and the Hmong American Farmers Association is now one of our most dynamic and really creative energizing of our food producer groups. Our newer integrations, our, Somal, our Minnesota Somali Farmers Association is another one of those hugely creative and making connections back. So we know that out of each instance, 
There are things that will challenge us and things that give us some suggestions of solutions. And you've given us such a positive message this morning about how, you know, you didn't sugarcoat the problem and the fact that we've gone backwards on some key things and we've got some gigantic challenges, but you also gave us insights into how those challenges, those problems have pushed us and pushed some things we already knew into a new direction. But you've also given us that insight about it's a generational change that's taking place. And so in that way, we all are in this together, but each of us will play a different role. Joyce Chang, whenever we have your participation, your wisdom, your experience here at Global Minnesota, you give us both a picture of this world and its complexities and challenges and insights into what we can do. Thank you again for being with us here today, uh, World Food Day 2021, and thanks for the work that you do in the service to our whole nation and to the planet. Thank you again. Well, Mark, um, and to everybody at Global Minnesota and for World Food Day, it's great to be with all of you. And as somebody who grew up in the Midwest and Iowa, you know, I've always really looked at Minnesota and the way that they sort of are at the intersection of this sort of innovation in agriculture, um, you know, a center for refugees, and, and really a place where a lot of these issues just um, come to a head and they've always been able to innovate. Um, with a real awareness, not just of you know what is happening in the U.S., but in you know global markets as well. So it's just been a real pleasure to be with you today um, and to be part of this event. Great, thank you again, thank and you. with fun to see you back in the Midwest. Bye now. Bye bye. Welcome back to Global Minnesota's World Food Day Symposium 2021. All day long, we'll be looking at the questions of food security and food insecurity, but especially the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, the way that climate disruption has been changing our access to food and the lives of farmers and conflict. How have conflicts between countries and within countries also created an insecure situation? Today, I'm joined by a good friend of Global Minnesota's, good friend of Minnesota and of our uh, work here, um, Ambassador Ahmed Awan, former ambassador to the United States, former foreign minister, and a person whose global vision on how the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has affected the whole planet, has affected all of Africa, has affected the country of Somalia, our neighbors and our friends. So Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today for our World Food Program. And I wanna open just with a, an open-ended question. How are you seeing this COVID pandemic affecting your folks in Somalia, broadly speaking in Africa, but around the world, because you're a world leader in seeing these larger pictures and these impacts on the lives of individuals. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, I'm pleased to be uh, to join you today on the World Food Day uh, in commemoration of the FAO. Uh, I have uh, uh, I've prepared a uh, uh, few remarks on the impact of the COVID on Somalia. And uh, the, the, and, uh, in, a, in a moment, I will get to that. But as you said, the, uh, the COVID uh, impact is uh, severe uh, on, the, on the world stage. Uh, People are, are suffering as a result of this uh, uh, COVID uh, around the world, uh, more so in countries that are uh, very uh, vulnerable and have a, 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 have a, a weak a health system. It's, uh, uh, it's good news that uh, finally the world was able to 
to to manage to come up with uh, uh, vaccination for the uh, for the for the for the pandemic, uh, but that is not uh, uh, distributed uh, equitably around the world. It may be uh, uh, happening in uh, in places like Minnesota and in the United States and Europe and Canada more so than it is in in Africa. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, this uh, the vaccination and and any uh, uh, cure or treatment for the uh, for the effect of the of the pandemic is uh, is uh, is also shared with with Africa, including uh, Somalia. So that would be my uh, uh, mark, my uh, my general statement of the state of the uh, pandemic around the world. And on Somalia, I know you are very specific about how this has affected your fellow countrymen. Before I make few remarks related to the topic at hand, let me provide a brief context for our discussion. Somalia is an enigma. It's presently one of the most fragile countries in the world but it is a country that's potentially rich in all kinds of natural resources and wealth. After several decades of, of violent conflict, and now I'm referring to the fragility part of the enigma and collapse of the state, Somalia is going through challenging process of state building on new foundations of constitutionalism, federalism, and democratic governance. Significant progress has been made on these fronts, but much remains to be done, including strengthening of state institutions that will ensure the, these reforms to be implemented. The goal of all of this is, of course, to enable the Somali people to live in a peaceful, stable, democratic, and prosperous country. The paradox Somalia is Somalia has the potential not only to avail high living standards for its people, but can help it in feeding the rest of the world. That is because Somalia has a vast, fer fertile agricultural land, huge livestock population, and the longest continental coastal line in Africa, which is rich in fishery and other mineral resources, and where huge wind energy can be garnered or generated to give just an idea of the immense resources that are available in Somalia. Uh, however, Somalia is currently dealing with a number of security challenges. In addition to weak state institutions that cannot cope with the demands of the population, the terrorism of Al-Shabaab is still bedeviling the, the nation. There is also the ever-present recurrence of floods, droughts, and in recent years, the menace of locusts that continue to create periodic havoc in the lives of the people. These problems intensified the fragility of the country and aggravated the situation of the vulnerable groups. It is under these dire circumstances that the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic came to Somalia on early 2020 and confounded the security challenges faced by the people. The first COVID-19 case was registered in Mogadishu on 16 March 2020. Somalia was ill-prepared to cope with the pandemic and its impact. The health system of the country was very weak. There were only three functional PCRs in the whole country, one in Mogadishu, one in Hargeisa, and one in Garoui, for the first few months for an estimated population of 15 million just to give an example of the, of the weak uh, health system. There were severe shortages of prevention tools and testing kits for the COVID. The panic that was, that was uh, created by the uncertain situation of the COVID has initially paralyzed the country. To address this dire situation, the government formed a high level task force led by the former prime minister in which I was a key member. The task force, which met every day for three months, 
with working subcommittees was mandated to monitor the situation, to raise the necessary resources, and to provide the required responses to health and socioeconomic impact of the COVID. With the help of the World Bank, IMF, UN Mission in Somalia, UNSOM, UN agencies led by WHO and IOM, INGOs, and a number of friendly countries, including the USA, Turkey, China, the EU, and others, the government was able to avert a disastrous impact of the COVID-19. The total death rate from 16 March 20 to 25 September 2021 is 1,149, according to the records of the Ministry of Health of the Federal Government of Somalia. As the initial panic of the pandemic subsided, the attention shifted to the socioeconomic impact of the COVID. There was no readily available data to assess these impacts, but FAO, Minister of Agriculture, and the National, B National Bureau of Statistics, with the help of other relevant international partners, have been able to do preliminary surveys and assessments, such as National Agri-Food Systems and COVID-19 in Somalia by FAO, and Somalia Socioeconomic Impact Assessment by the Ministry of Planning. These and other anecdotal evidences show the negative socioeconomic impact of the COVID-19 in Somalia. And I mentioned it, the mitigating factors that reduce the, uh, the severity of the, of the uh, uh, COVID uh, impact on socioeconomic Somalia included the resiliency and the entrepreneurship of the Somali people, which has helped them to cushion the negative impact of the COVID and to absorb its shocks. More importantly, uh, the remittance by the Somali diaspora, including the vibrant Somali community in Minnesota, was critical in lessening the function of the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic. And then I mentioned it, uh, uh, the uh, two key recommendations, which is easing the, uh, the, the remittances uh, process from uh, countries like the United States, for example, or from Minnesota to Somalia, which is limited by uh, uh, by uh, by the uh, by the fear of uh, uh, many reaching uh, uh, terrorists. That risk is now uh, much reduced, and it's about time that Somali remittances are helped to to function uh, normally, which will help the Somali people uh, cope with the. Uh, with uh, these challenges uh, that I mentioned. And also the international community's attention is, is required uh, to, uh, to focus on strengthening the, the, uh, the state uh, institutions in Somalia, which are the best uh, means of uh, uh, addressing uh, whenever pandemics, droughts, uh, I mean, arise or, or, or come to fall. Thank you. Thank you for showing us that connection, that connection with the international organizations, the connections with the diaspora that are all over the world, but especially here in Minnesota, we have 75,000 uh, 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 new Minnesotans from Somalia and so many others. But I do want to move to those uh, ideas that you have suggestions for things that can be done because this COVID pandemic is going on. We were hopeful that it was, you know, going to be a shorter term, but now we can see. So please give us some ideas for our viewers who are from around the whole world uh, about things that people could be doing and anticipating and planning to help cushion this impact in Somalia and, and I'm assuming for other parts of the world as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Mark, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity uh, for me to, to, to make some uh, recommendations. Uh, one that come to mind is uh, I alluded in my uh, short brief remarks that uh, the remittances of the Somali people 
has had uh, perhaps uh, a big impact in, in reducing the, the socioeconomic uh, impact of the COVID and, and, and for the Somali people to absorb the, the shock of the, of the pandemic. Uh, but the remittances continue to suffer from uh, restrictions uh, around the world as a result of uh, uh, perhaps now defunct concerns of uh, 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 you know terrorism uh, and uh, related issues, and it will be helpful if uh, because the, the 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 lockdown of the uh, in many in many countries, including the United States, of the. Uh, of the economic activities in the society and the movement has also uh, put a pressure on the uh, uh, the remittance uh, which was helpful to the Somali community uh, not only to deal with the uh, with the impact of the impact, imp, uh, economic impact of the of the covid but also the overall uh, economic health of of Somalia so one appeal uh, and we did this uh, as a minister uh, when I was uh, in the office as a minister of foreign affairs. Uh, I and by the way, thank you uh, very much for correcting uh, my title. I'm a former minister of foreign affairs. Uh, I'm not currently uh, in that in that portfolio. So the remittances is uh, is, is, a, is a critical thing for Somalia. A friend was telling me that there was a study by uh, WFP which suggested that uh, remittances uh, do not only only help uh, the economic well-being of the so uh, people in Somalia, uh, but also was uh, strangely enough very uh, critical in in reducing uh, the 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 impact of droughts uh, uh, in Somalia along the uh, of course the the support of the international community like WFP and the rest so that's one thing the other thing is I also mentioned it alluded to the weakness of the state institutions uh, in Somalia after the uh, the challenges that we have faced as a nation and therefore. There is a need of the international community also giving attention to the strengthening of the of the uh, state institutions because it's easy uh, uh, maybe to uh, to go through uh, shortcuts where uh, you know food aid is provided to the community vulnerable communities and the rest of it but that will be always needed if there are no uh, in state institutions that can address the root causes of the challenges. And in that, the, the Somali community in, in Minnesota uh, can play a, a good role. Uh, how uh, this to be done, we can discuss uh, further in, in future meetings. But those two things, attention to state in, uh, strengthening of state institutions, to cope with these kinds of uh, 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 future uh, shocks and uh, helping the, the easing the, 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 the operations of the Somali remittances to reach the targeted population is, is very important. Of course, investment in Somalia like the uh, the, the the natural rich natural resource in Somalia like the wind energy as we have discussed in mark is something that will uh, will help the, uh, the Somali people and the world and the neighboring countries thank you well thank you for bringing these elements in the importance of the diaspora community and the entire system for remittances also the institution building and the other uh, possible resources. 
I know your vision has been one of a blue economy that kept the oceans alive and vibrant, providing food, but also many other services. And I've been very um, excited in Minnesota because a former uh, minister of women and children's uh, affairs in the Somali government has become our uh, state commissioner, assistant commissioner for immigrant and refugees and leading our response to the new arrivals from Afghanistan. So we are seeing the world is interconnected in so many ways and the leadership of the Somali community here in Minnesota is part of what I have come to know as the leadership of the Somali community broadly. And today's uh, first conversation about these specific issues for me um, with you, Mr. Ambassador, but I hope that we can continue this conversation, but more than that, that we can begin to effectively put into practice these ideas and suggestions and recommendations that you've made to us today. Thank you so much for being part of our World Food Day 2021. And I look forward to working together with you as we, for the whole world, make sure that the panic and the pandemic, which have come together around COVID-19, are challenges that we find bring us closer together as we move towards a brighter future. Thank you again for being part of today's conversation. Thank you, Mark. It has been an honor. Welcome back to our Global Minnesota World Food Day 2021. Thank you to all of you who've tuned in from all over the planet. I think we're up to 34 or 35 countries. And thank you to our presenters this morning who've been giving us the benefit of the big picture. Our look today at the impacts of COVID climate and violent conflict on food insecurity. We were making progress, very good progress over the last decade. The last two years, we've been going backwards. What can we do today in terms of learning about the larger strategic view, vision of why have we moved backwards? And then how can we take the success stories that we're gonna be uh, focusing on in the afternoon to help give us momentum for moving forward again? We've heard about the climate impacts. We've been now speaking about the COVID impacts. I wanna to turn to the theme that has run through the program and will continue to be in all of our conversations about food security. And that's the way that violent conflict, uh, the displacement of people, the loss of land, the loss of access to water or lakes or food, how conflict has been one of the big disruptors that has been, resulted in us going backwards in our food security. The United Nations was created because the world said we cannot fight another world war. We must find another way. And the first agency they created, the Food and Agriculture Organization, who we celebrate their founding today, was a recognition that food and food security was absolutely crucial to maintaining the peace and the lack of food security was a driver of war. And last year, our keynote at this event was um, had just a week before received the Nobel Peace Prize for the contributions of the UN's World Food Program in can put giving the opportunity for peace, but also pushing back against the use of food as a weapon. We are thrilled this morning that we have His Excellency Ambassador Colin uh, Kilapal, who is the president of the UN Economic and Social Council. That's the part of the UN that focuses on the things that are the root causes of conflict and are the um, the items and they're the topics of human rights and responsibilities that we think about in the larger context of food security. Mr. Ambassador, so grateful that you could join us today. And I know from watching your speeches and the UN Conference on Food System, also over last week's meetings of the World Food Security Council, please give us your overview of where are we with understanding how conflict comes 
from going backwards on food insecurity and how important food security is to resolving our wars between nations, between peoples on this planet. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. It's a pleasure to see you and uh, Excellencies, colleagues, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am indeed delighted uh, to join you this afternoon to commemorate the World Food Day 2021 under the auspices of the Global Minnesota International Symposium. I have uh, perused through the program of the day um, and I noted that it covers a wide range of topics uh, that one way or the other relates or affects food security, thereby demonstrating the diverse correlation of food security and other facets of development, especially the sustainable development goals. I have been asked to speak to the linkages between uh, violent conflict and food security, as uh, Mark just said, a topic that is very close to my heart, of course, because I come from a continent which continues to be directly affected by food insecurity as a result of protracted uh, conflicts. Uh, just to mention that in 2017, uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization identified conflicts as the leading cause of global food crisis. The increases in the number and complexity of conflicts have continued to erode the gains made in food security and nutrition, leading fragile countries to the brink of famine. According to statistics, also in 2017, more than half of undernourished people and almost 80% of stunted children lived in countries struggling with some form of conflict, violence, or fragility. More recently, the FAO and WFP have also warned that acute food insecurity is likely to deteriorate further in 23 countries before November this year, that is next month, putting many lives and livelihoods at risk and also more than half of these hotspots are in the Africa region where I come from. Furthermore, the 2021 Global Report on Food Crisis confirms that conflict continues to be the primary driver for the largest share with 65% of people likely to face acute food insecurity. Given the above scenario, uh, conflict and other forms of violence are likely to continue driving food insecurity in many areas. That includes Afghanistan, Central Sahel, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Northern Nigeria, Northern Mozambique, Myanmar, the Sudan, and Yemen, just to mention those. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there is no doubt that conflict has ripple effects on everyday life, triggering population displacement, abandonment of agricultural land, loss of lives and assets, disruption of trade and crop, thereby disrupting food production and resulting in food insecurity. Moreover, food insecurity itself perpetuates violent conflict as communities fight to survive, resulting in chaotic situations that further disrupt humanitarian assistance, thus worsening famine and also diseases. The United Nations, its organs and agencies are committed to the SDG 2 on zero hunger by 2030. There are concerted efforts and collaboration within these institutions to ensure that the world rid itself of hunger. I therefore wish to take this opportunity to congratulate the World Food Program, WFP, for having been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize last year. This achievement is exemplary of WFP's efforts 
and explicit approach to conflict resolution as key to getting food aid to people who need it and re-establishing food production in post-conflict areas. The success of the World Food Program demonstrates the importance of the support that the UN and its agencies have to play in conflict situations, especially to help the victims to quickly recover. The United Nations Development Program, UNDP, also plays a significant role in ensuring that while the peace and security pillar of the UN is busy doing peace building, the UNDP works on economic and development recovery. This is in recognition that there can be no peace without development and that post-conflict recovery and resuming development after conflicts is key to effective peace building. Moderator, as the president of ECOSOC this year, I have a number of priorities that addresses specific target areas for action relevant to violent conflict and food security, both directly and indirectly. ECOSOC has an opportune moment to better utilize the newly mandated meeting on transition from relief to development to deliver on our mandate, particularly on the situations in the Sahel and Haiti, given their challenges to date. To complement the work performed by other UN organs and relevant bodies, I intend to leverage the role of ECOSOC to effectively assist countries emerging from conflict to return onto the road to long-term and sustainable development. This can be achieved by further strengthening the relationship between ECOSOC and such important bodies like the Peace Building Commission through joint meetings in order to ensure more integrated support by the UN development system on humanitarian and development activities and support to peaceful societies. In addition, we intend to do more to address widening inequalities, especially where the impact of inequality are a threat to peace and security and where violent conflict may arise. The COVID-19 pandemic, for example, has impacted the poorest and most vulnerable with multifaceted impacts that have exposed and further exacerbated pre-existing inequalities within and between countries. ECOSOC will promote dialogue this year on what is required to address the root causes of these inequalities and thus reinforce national and international efforts to promote equality. We will also continue the exploration of the interlinkages between inequalities, structural racism, and the SDGs. I believe that we can do and achieve more in this area. Within this situation, we are compelled to prioritize swift recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic through urgent access to vaccines for everyone because no one is safe until everyone is safe. I therefore join the call for vaccines to be treated as a global common good, not for some, but for everyone. We must take urgent measures to prioritize the most vulnerable, particularly those in situations of conflict and emerging from conflict. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as I have already indicated, the relationship between food insecurity and violent conflict is that of a vicious cycle, as violent conflict can lead to food insecurity, while food insecurity can lead to violent conflict. ECOSOC will therefore continue to do more to address those factors that can result in food insecurity. The escalation in the frequency of extreme weather events including the catastrophic heat waves, the hurricanes, the floods, and droughts, is often a precursor to food insecurity and, as a result, violent conflict. The least developed countries, the LDCs, and the small island developments, developing states, the seeds, are the most vulnerable. 
we are thus reminded of the urgent need to address climate change and biodiversity loss. In this regard, sustainable food systems have the potential to help prevent conflict, not only by ensuring food security, but also by protecting the environment and supporting health and generating productive livelihoods. The nexus between integrated food systems, food security, poverty, climate change, water, biodiversity, and sustainable agriculture is integral to preventing conflict in many instances. ECOSOC will play an important role in the follow-up to the COP26 next month by supporting efforts to incorporate climate resilience into COVID-19 response and recovery initiatives to implement effective adaptation measures, especially in the most vulnerable countries, including by investing in climate resilient technologies and early warning systems and continuing to address the socioeconomic dimensions of climate change. An ambitious post-2020 biodiversity framework at the upcoming meeting of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP15, will address important issues of preserving biodiversity, including genetic resources for food and agriculture. A scaled up ambition for sustainable use of oceans, including for sustainable fisheries, will be brought through next year's UN Oceans Conference. As I have previously noted, developing countries have greater needs and experience high risks of food insecurity and violent conflict. However, less than 20% of the stimulus and recovery funds have been spent in these countries. If we want to avoid additional conflicts and address the rising hotspots of hunger, then we must implement ambitious and innovative debt reduction and relief while mobilizing resources for the immediate humanitarian response and for long-term investments in sustainable food systems. Through the Financing for Development Forum in 2022, we in ECOSOC intend to continue to advance discussions on how developing countries can be assisted financially. In pursuing the above mentioned initiatives, ECOSOC will embrace the value of diversity of contributions through multi-stakeholder engagement and will continue to serve as a formidable platform for inclusive dialogue and to foster partnerships. This is because I believe that the multifaceted problems we face as a result of the nexus between food security and violent conflict requires a multifaceted approach that involves all stakeholders from government, academia, business, the youth, civil society, and international organizations. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to assure you once again that the United Nations understands the relationship between conflict and food security and is fully engaged in addressing it through its various organs and agencies. While others are more directly involved in the immediate humanitarian response and peace building, the ECOSOC, which I'm currently president, and its subsidiary bodies and the HLPF, which is the high level political forum, are also working in the long run to support international solidarity and a more sustainable future through the achievement of the SDGs. We must all work together to address the economic and social issues at the root of violent conflict, especially those creating massive refugee streams and with completely insecure food supplies. With so many urgent challenges, the role of ECOSOC has become as equally important as that of the Security Council and the UN General Assembly. I would like to conclude my statement by emphasizing that ECOSOC will rise to the occasion of the Decade of Action and Delivery for Sustainable Development, 
in keeping with the obligations to guide the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 sustainable goals. The theme of this year's ECOSOC session, building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda, demands that global solidarity, multilateralism, and cooperation be leveraged to overcome inequalities and bridge the North-South divide, which cannot be allowed to widen further. As president of ECOS, I am also fully committed to supporting the UN Secretary General to address the emerging challenges facing the international community and his recently launched report on our common agenda. I look forward to this afternoon's panel presentations that will delve further into these and other solutions, both in the short and long term. I thank you very much for your kind attention and thanks again, Mark, for this opportunity. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for taking time out today to be with us and for your very hopeful message, a very large scope of what ECOSOC is engaged in and the whole UN system. I'm very proud to be living in Minnesota, a state where one of the founders of the UN, our governor, uh, Harold Stassen from Minnesota, and he was famous for his articulation of the importance of making sure that human rights was built into the basic structure of the UN, that addressing hunger and other issues. He was from a farm community. I am proud that that heritage and tradition is being carried on today with ECOSOC's leadership. And thank you for that leadership and for reminding us of its roots and its future that we are all part of. We'll look forward to the panels this afternoon addressing how food and food raising and gardening is part of re uh, restoring peace in some of our communities and we'll be reminded of your wisdom and words about how it's crucial for peace on the planet. Thank you again, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mark. This next section for our program We'll have a series of very, very short videos from some of our best partners, Food and Agriculture Organization, the uh, Second Harvest Heartland, who's one of our most important food assistance organization who we're partnering with on a special uh, membership promotion this, uh, this month, where we're making sure that um, more and more families who need food assistance can receive that. And also, um, uh, there's an organization in our region called uh, Greater MSP. It's about connecting to our broader community. And within Greater MSP, there's a very special coalition, the Embold Coalition, of our major companies that work in food, agriculture, food processing, food research. And um, Embold is really making a heavy push forward on sustainability, looking at the sustainable development goals and other indicators to address climate and to address these issues. So we'll have a few minutes of these short, I think lively videos, and we'll be back for our noon, our special noon presente. Um, James Mogwandi, who's the CEO of Equity uh, Group, which is um, a bank and healthcare and education and many community services in East Africa. Uh, James's vision and what they've done there has become internationally known and he was named last year's uh, a businessman in, in the peace by the Oslo Peace Forum. So we're going to hear a very large vision about these topics that Mr. Ambassador was just referring to how we address the issues that are creating the conflicts as a way of dealing with the conflicts that are making all of the challenges, the climate challenges and the COVID challenges, so much worse. So we're talking chickens and eggs all the time, 
But this afternoon, we move into talking about solutions that address getting food on the table, but addressing simultaneously the underlying causes of these drivers of food insecurity. So um, uh, catch these videos now, uh, maybe a chance for a little tiny break, and we'll be back at the top of the hour. Thank you. Hello, and happy World Food Day to my fellow Minnesotans, folks across the country, and across the globe. My name is Robin Manthe, and I'm the Managing Director for Minnesota Central Kitchen. I'm both excited and proud to be with you on this important day of learning how to create a more sustainable, equitable, and resilient food future for the world. I believe in the power of food and the power of community. I left the corporate world to join an organization that's changing the way food gets to people who need it. At Minnesota Central Kitchen, we provide prepared meals to those who need them the most. These meals provide nutrition, convenience, and care to those who have barriers to preparing their own meals. One theme of today's symposium is building back better and what that means during the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. Minnesota Central Kitchen, an initiative of Second Harvest Heartland, was born in the weekend Minnesota shut down at the beginning of the pandemic. Our strategy was to use a network of partners to address the need of prepared meals. And there were three key components that came together to make it happen. I think of it as a triangle. Our end goal is working with distribution partners to get meals where people need them, bringing a meal to people where they are. In the process, and what was important during the pandemic, we partner with restaurants and other commercial kitchens to make those meals. We invest in them, invest in those local businesses to re and hire furlough workers and employ people. And at the beginning, we rescue food that might not otherwise be used in the food system. And together, now in our second year, we have more than 100 partners working to provide meals. We've provided over 1.8 million meals to date. Our commitment to building back better continues to be at the forefront of what we do. COVID has laid bare the depth and urgency of hunger. The need both for prepared meals as well as the distinct divide that we call the racial hunger divide, where community of colors are disproportionately impacted. To give you an example of how we're addressing these factors, we work with Afro Deli, our kitchen, and Skyline Towers, a low-income housing development, to deliver more than 500 takeout restaurant quality halal meals each week. This is community feeding community in partnership. What we know is no one should have to face hunger, especially as they weather uncertainty and crisis and fear. So thank you for joining us in this work, providing prepared meals. Your support helps bring ready to eat meals directly to the places they are needed the most and the people who need them the most. Thank you and enjoy the day. For each and every one of us, food tells a story. It starts with agriculture and our actions impact its journey each step of the way. We have one planet and are part of one system. We must work together to build a better future. We need to reconnect with nature and work as one. Let's rewrite the story of food for a better, more sustainable world. Our actions are our future. Embold is working to accelerate solutions to the most pressing challenges facing food and agriculture, particularly our changing climate and other natural resource challenges and the world's growing demand for food. The Embold Coalition of Minnesota-based companies, researchers, and nonprofits has come together to help lead the way to the future of food. 
And the mission of MBOLD is to make sure that we feed a growing global population at the same time stewarding the resources of the earth, not only for now, but also for years to come. And it's a mission that really only MBOLD can fulfill because we have a combination of capabilities. Companies have been around a long time in food and ag, but also leading research institutes. And companies and organizations that actually like to collaborate with each other. For Minnesota, MBOLD means that we are making a statement to the world that solutions to the greatest global challenges in food and agriculture are going to come from this place. And what that means is it means it's going to be more good jobs, more fast growth companies, and more cutting edge research done here. This collaboration is a real opportunity for businesses across the food and agriculture sector who are rooted and committed here in Minnesota but have global reach to really bring together the best minds in the world to tackle big challenges. We have the opportunity to have farmers, innovators, research institutions, private and public companies to work together really to figure out how to feed the world in a safe, responsible and sustainable way. And Minnesota has the infrastructure and the ecosystem to make that happen. The global future of food and agriculture is here. MBOLD is an initiative of the Greater MSP Partnership. Greater MSP accelerates regional competitiveness and inclusive economic growth through job creation, capital investment, and execution of strategic initiatives. Welcome back everyone to Global Minnesota's World Food Day 2021 Symposium. Thank you for tuning in. We have people from dozens of countries from all over the planet. And I'm so pleased to have as our special guest today, Dr. James Mwandi. He's the Group Managing Director and CEO of Equity Group Holdings and Executive Chairman of the Executive Group Foundation. I've gotten to know and appreciate the work of Dr. Bhagwanti, James, as he likes to be called, um, because he has been one of the leaders in thinking about where Africa is going in the future and how important it is for the whole planet that we understand the dynamism, the creativity, the productivity, and the importance of the African continent in general for the well-being of the whole planet. He's a thought leader, a disruptive entrepreneur, the successful and very, very philanthropic leader, one of the most important banking organizations in all of Africa, the largest in East and Central Africa. I got to know the work of Equity Bank because of their special focus on agriculture, on small and medium-sized entrepreneurs small farmers, medium-sized farmers, and they have made this not only a priority in the life of their bank, but as they have expanded throughout the region, they've continued to make agriculture, food production and agriculture, a key priority. In fact, they have a vision of a Marshall Plan for Africa. They have a vision for how the long-term development will continue to be based on understanding how important that sector is, the agriculture producers, the food sector in general. It's of course been a difficult and upside down period for everybody all over the planet, but James has been continuing to keep his North Star focused on the social impact and the importance of sustainability and resilience in his region, but also for the entire planet. And for that work, that amazing work that he's been involved in with his team there in Nairobi, he was awarded the 2020 Oslo Business for Peace Award, among many other recognitions from the Bloomberg 50 for Global Vision, the Forbes African Person of the Year, Ernst & Young World Entrepreneur of the Year, International Planned Parenthood Federation awards and people from one end of the planet to the next have recognized that his dynamism and his values based approach 
to banking and other important necessary services like education and healthcare is both a bright star for the continent of Africa and the countries where they're working, but it's also a leadership position for the whole planet. And so today, as we're looking at the impacts of the COVID crisis, the climate crisis, a violent conflict, how have these impacted food security and what are some of the solutions? I thought of who was the person on the planet that in my mind was doing the most to bring that perspective. How do we solve our immediate problems in ways that give us that long-term addressing of the underlying conditions? And so Dr. Mugwandi, today is our opportunity to learn from you, to be um, uh, become inspired by what you've been doing and to give us a sense of why equity has found this focus on food and agriculture so important from the beginning. Maybe we could start with that question. How, how did this come to be a key focus for equity? Thank you very much, Mark, for having me in this conversation, and I'm deeply grateful. Uh, equity uh, was formed uh, as a social solution uh, to the challenges uh, facing a farming community uh, in Dulo, Kenya. Uh, but uh, from that genesis of uh, serving a village, it has grown to have its presence in uh, seven countries. Uh, in this village, the objective was to bring financial tools to the Lulo community fully engaged in agricultural activities so that they could improve their lives, uh, they could live lives of dignity, and they could expand their opportunities for wealth creation. So essentially, equity has stuck to its original mission. And that is why we have only expanded the essence and purpose for which equity was uh, formed. So in the United States, we're seeing this um, opportunity for trade, for investment. Has equity been part of the larger diaspora communities' conversations about the importance of trade and investment in Africa now that there's the continental-wide free trade agreement? Equity has been uh, fully engaged and involved in uh, cross-border our uh, trade uh, discussions. We believe that um, in uh, an agricultural setup, uh, the solution lies uh, in picking agricultural produce from uh, uh, surplus regions to deficit regions and uh, organizing the logistics thereof. Whatever name you call that, that is trade. And it can be from village to village, from region to region, from country to country. And that truly is what uh, helps uh, supporting because uh, food and agriculture is beyond uh, trade, is about nutrition. And every uh, part of uh, community and society uh, is uh, acting for that uh, nutrition uh, in their food, the diversity in surprise. Uh, and as a result, uh, trade and commerce becomes the vehicle through that exit and uh, of food and value uh, can take place. Coming back into the region, uh, uh, Equity has uh, set up um, a strategic plan to facilitate agricultural pro uh, produce uh, from one country to the other uh, through the East African uh, community, through the SADAC, the Comesa region, and recently uh, through the African continental free trade area. But equity financing agriculture, and Africa being a major exporter of raw uh, agricultural produce, raw materials, means it facilitates trade. Unfortunately, it has uh, been facilitating a, a skewed trade where farmers grow uh, raw material, exports uh, for uh, production and processing, and then imports the finished product. And now the issue we are asking can we play on the competitive advantage of each country and help the farmers in each country to add value to what they produce? 
uh, one that reduces the, uh, and increases efficiency, creates value, in enhanced value to the farmers, and is, uh, makes logistics uh, of food transportation much easier. So I know you've been thinking about this in many sectors, agriculture, in mining, in other manufacturing services, and you, you've been talking out in the larger community about a Marshall Plan for Africa and something really specific in East and Central. Can you share with our viewers your vision about that sort of integrated, large-scale vision? We have been studying uh, the history of Africa for the last uh, 100 years, and every effort has been made to transform Africa, to improve the quality of lives of uh, uh, the African uh, population, but there is very little to show for all that effort. So that inspired us to study other communities. And uh, as we studied, whether it's the agrarian revolution, whether it's the green revolution, whether it's the Marshall Plan, as you have said, we realized all these solutions have worked because they are homegrown solutions. They are owned by the people. They are aligned to their interest and they're inspired by the need to transform themselves. So we chose to inspire the, inspire the African continent to own its own transformation, its own development. Africa doesn't lack in national resources. It doesn't lack in labor. What Africa has really been lacking is entrepreneurship that can combine and organize uh, African resources, its, its people, its youthful uh, population that is excellent labor, um, its natural resources. It has 60% of uh, the world's albulad. Al it's endowed with uh, natural resources, particularly mineral wealth, and then invite international capital to complement. Uh, and so the rest of the world will then align to the return to their capital as Africa aligns to ex extraction and exploitation of its own resources and the entrepreneurs take the leadership of organizing that process. And we then think that is the only way interest would be aligned and driven by uh, the, uh, the African people for themselves while the rest of the world benefit from uh, a return of their contribution and participation. We believe that is not only sustainable, but scalable from one generation to the other. And that is why we started with Eastern and Central African region. We learned a lot of lessons from the COVID uh, experience. Equity chose to, uh, with its partners to set aside $17 million to protect uh, the host communities. And we chose to provide them with uh, uh, all their hospitals, 116 hospitals in Kenya, with the PPEs to protect the doctors so that they could be there for everybody. Unfortunately, with $17 million, we could not get any PPEs for the doctors because uh, global supply chains were broken. Then we sat down with a couple of doctors and invited global consulting firms to train 106 manufacturing uh, companies to repurpose and to retool their processes to provide the PPEs. Kenya today is self-sufficient in all PPEs, and Kenya has become a major exporter of PPEs. So we realized that uh, uh, solutions are within reach if the alignment and motivation is right. And that lesson from dealing with COVID has taught us a lot of lessons that we can take other sectors, starting with agriculture, uh, and then transform it. Why start with agriculture? Because 53% uh, uh, of African population are living from agriculture. By transfer, uh, spot, uh, transforming agriculture, you will have changed the rights of 53% of the population. 64% of Africa's exports are of agricultural commodities. So essentially, you can in enhance productivity, transform agriculture, but also get raw material to industrialize uh, Africa by agro-processing factories. And we are saying agro-processing is an economic activity, a global class of assets which can draw international capital. So essentially it's a win-win for everybody and we can see a resilient 
uh, uh, transformation of our plan uh, that would lead us see uh, the region uh, transform based on its competitive advantage. And so most of the problems that uh, are articulated by the sustainable development goals. Well, that's an especially inspiring story about those over a hundred uh, factories being able to be repurposed and now to have the doctors and the people working in the front line protected and to create more supply for the world market. Of course, it's good for exports from Kenya, but it's good for the planet that this, it was still a broken supply chain in protective gear and protective personal products, but you're now making a contribution to that, solving your problem there in Kenya, but helping the world solve its shortage. I'm thinking of other examples of where COVID has, in a way, forced some solutions. It sounds like Kenya has been very, very aggressive and thoughtful and forward-looking in converting solutions into long-term, bigger pictures. I know that the many of the diaspora here in Minnesota and in our region coming from east and central and southern parts of Africa are extremely entrepreneurial, starting businesses right away and starting up farms. We are um, in a moment now where there are many very successful diaspora members inside the United States, I'm guessing also Canada and other countries. But is there a mechanism for our diaspora community and others to become more directly involved in this vision, this moving ahead that you're helping to drive there from equity? Africa's diaspora it will be the most powerful tool uh, in our plan. Uh, it's a diaspora that uh, is uh, socially exposed. It's a diaspora that uh, has uh, acquired the skills and competencies and have the ex requisite experiences uh, in the uh, world that uh, Africa would like to become, uh, a modernized, a transformed uh, a world. So essentially, we are creating incentives to bring them uh, back home. We at uh, Equity uh, Group, through Equity Group Foundation, have sent out uh, uh, some of the best brains in Kenya, 900 of them to international universities, uh, 256 of them in Ivory schools. And uh, essentially, we are looking for opportunities to them to stay in the countries they are in uh, in order to come back after five years. They are coming with the uh, skills exposure to technologies, uh, markets, and global networks that they can use. And as then what we do is to facilitate them with uh, credit facilities and debt capital. We've also uh, uh, created partnerships with the fintechs uh, to facilitate uh, global remittances that becomes the um, seed capital in most of the projects that we have been talking about. And I'm glad to say this year, equity alone who process approximately 4.8 billion US dollars in remittances. We have started seeing a shift of these remittances from uh, simply being social uh, a support for their families to setting uh, aside half of their amount to be investments, whether it's in real estate, whether in the mm -hmm. stock exchange, whether it is uh, in government stocks. And essentially, we are seeing that as a first step of uh, preparation of that diaspora population to come back and utilize the savings uh, they are making at home as an investment vehicle. We have also seen significant uh, partnerships uh, between the diaspora and African resident population. People who know each other, networks of educated people, uh, so that the factories are being set, but they are set uh, with uh, connections and networks of uh, Africa's uh, global uh, network and skills are being uh, uh, exchanged, uh, market knowledge is being expressed, uh, technology knowledge is being so the diaspora is acting as a linkage uh, for transmission of, of capital, of skills, and technology. I know from watching the development of fintech 
in agriculture that a lot of the innovations are coming from Africa. And I'm also aware that many of the innovations are being farmer driven. Farmers are saying to their bankers, this is a product or this is an approach that I would like to see. Do you imagine or is it already happening that we can build some global partnerships on FinTech and agriculture, sharing the ideas of farmers, the innovations coming from Africa and really from the whole world? Um, maybe equity could be part of a convening that says we want to take FinTech and have it move forward as fast as the farmers and the agro processing businesses are moving forward themselves. Uh, it's uh, remarkable that the world has um, become humble to appreciate it can learn from each other. There can be South-South collaboration, there can be North-South collaboration and cross learning across the board. Africa has uh, most of uh, the most significant remaining problems. And so if there will be uh, a fertile ground uh, to host and to motivate innovations, it's Africa. As we try to both solve both social and economic challenges uh, that still remains. And uh, deployment of technology, again, the place that it can have the highest return on investment, again, will be in Africa because it will be solving. What has really amazed me uh, is the uh, interface between technology and youthful population. The mean age in Africa is now around 17, 18 years old. And so it's a generation that has been born and brought up during the digital era. And they are forcing their fa our families to migrate. You'll notice that, for instance, in Kenya, uh, the famous M-Pesa mobile uh, platform that allows uh, in a very efficient way uh, payments and uh, um, uh, movement of money uh, uh, in the country. We have seen uh, the leap of equity uh, group, which uh, 30 years ago was number 66 out of 66 in the financial sector. But leveraging on technology today is the largest group, banking group in East and Central Africa. And simply is because the population, plainly of farmers, young people have adopted the digital revolution that equity has spearheaded uh, to adopt. 98% of all equities transactions happen online. That, that is wow. how much uh, the population has embraced. Wow. As a result of that, we have decided to provide communities and the retail commerce with the pay with equity to ensure that we digitize retail commerce. Once we digitize retail commerce, then it's not just efficiency, but technology will be accepted on a broad base, uh, uh, basis. Equity has formed a technology company called Azenia, and we have gathered together uh, a target of 1,250 engineer developers. And essentially, we are trying to move uh, the population that we have, we, and we interact 15 million customers to adopt digital trends. When 15 million uh, people in a country of 50 million people adopt that technology, their interaction and advocacy would get the entire population. And essentially, then we then want to say, equity has done banking, it has done payments. Why don't we digitize agriculture? Why don't we digitize health? Why don't we digitize education? I'm glad to say the government has also embraced uh, digitization, and we are now talking of e-commerce. Once the government moves, then uh, it is easier for the individuals uh, to move because policy and enablement and the environment is digitized. Well, I know a little bit of that story of equity being 66th on the list. And you, put, you took a big risk leaving a successful career in banking and deciding to transform equity. But what I hear you saying is that it was the digitizing and then the adoption of the digital approach with young people, with farmers, with others that really has been what has allowed equity to become now the biggest player and the leading player from a 
technology and future orientation. That story, it seems like, also transforms equity. Now you're seems to me truly a global bank, a global financial and technology institution based in Nairobi, but working everywhere that the digital can find. Is, is that your vision that equity is now that global player touching the planet anywhere and everywhere that innovators want to be part of your exciting vision? Uh, equity is a good idea, and good idea said to attract uh, attention. We have drawn the attention of the Wall Street. 51% of our share uh, our capital comes from uh, the West world. It's the, uh, the little names that uh, can see uh, the growth story, the return story, and the impact story. We're seeing social investors are being drawn by equity. But to be able to scale equity, we adopted the technology. And increasingly, we have adopted uh, the fourth industrial technology. Initially digitizing, and then using um, technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, using um, uh, big data concepts, uh, using machine learning, and essentially, with these capabilities, we're able to do personalized uh, credit risk pricing. We're able to almost personalize a credit product to the customer level and give that customer their own price. That is what has differentiated equity and made equity more than a bank, a movement where people are getting attracted because it's a movement that enables them uh, to uh, take advantage of opportunities that can scale uh, their wealth creation ambitions, while at the same time helping them to transform the lives of their families and giving themselves dignity uh, of, by uh, setting themselves aside uh, from the challenges that uh, we have always associated with Africa of poverty, of hunger, of civil war. People are finding productive in it. It is because of this that equity has moved out of Kenya and gone to another six countries. And in, out of those five countries, we have become a systemic financial system in those countries, beyond our country. And that attraction is what we said, is because we have differentiated ourselves and we have responded to the challenge that people are facing and we have aligned ourselves with uh, demographics, like this is young people, this is what they require. This is women who have no securities. This is how they can circumvent. So it's customizing the solution and more so co-creating. But let me also say we set 2% of our total revenue uh, to, as a shared prosperity contribution uh, to host communities. And we use that to build their capacity. So financial literacy, entrepreneurship training, health training so that they actively be, uh, participate and have the requisite skills, requisite uh, capability to actively participate uh, in this new thinking. So when our diaspora communities here in Minnesota are speaking and educating the broader public, you know, we have large diasporas from Asia, from Latin America, from Africa, and so it's an important part of the community, but they are often having to really do basic education about moving into the future. What is Africa's role and relationship to the planet? For example, very few people know Africa has the resource of available arable land for the future production, whether food and bio crops they often are th hearing little bits about how Africa has the mineral and special metals needed for the green economy, but that's only now in the beginning stages of thinking. And almost no one has taken a look at or thought about the fact that the young people on the planet are going to be in Africa, on the African continent, and the population of the planet will shift to Africa being 
the most important market for ideas, for products, for culture in the not very distant future. These big uh, um, factors of the future seem to be coming at the same moment of consciousness as you are leading on technology, financial matters, on integrating social inclusion, social progress in the entrepreneurial spirit. Do you feel hopeful that these awarenesses and these technological social innovations will move together, move us together, Africa, North America, the planet? I think, Mark, it is conversations like this that uh, will feed into uh, that uh, whole uh, ecosystem of thought process. The silver lining uh, of COVID-19 is raising the consciousness and awareness of the world. And you have put it very well. People have woken up to the reality that uh, Africa with 1.2 billion people is a sizable market to allow the rest of the world to continue to grow. With the minute being uh, 17 years for an entire continent, that 1.2 billion, people can see the formidable labor that has been born and brought up during a digital era. So they are digital natives and can quickly be converted to become uh, increasingly the labor force of the fourth industrial revolution. The third one is that I think people have woken up to the reality uh, of the need to reverse the adverse effect uh, of climate change. And part of it is clean energy. Uh, it's the electric car. When you take specifically the electric car, the world has woken up to the reality that 60% six, uh, of the resources that we need to use um, if we are to succeed uh, in our initiative for green energy will come from Africa. So I think Africa has won its place as an equal partner who, who has a contribution to big, whether it's labor contribution, whether it's the 60% Arab world to feed the future uh, population of the world, whether it's natural resources in reversing the adverse effect um, of global warming, uh, Africa has a, a seat. So that ability for the world to consciously recognize that and have this debate is what was lacking. With that debate taking uh, 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 place, we would assume uh, the world is wise and the global population will be wise and will make the wise decision of not leaving Africa behind anymore and allowing Africa to tell its own story, to allow the African narrative not to be distorted and to allow the Africans themselves to tell their story. So, and hopefully accept the need to change global structures that would make it easier for Africa. Uh, and that, and really come with the partnership, real partnership, value exchange. And that leads me to the conclusion that the solution lies not in aid, but trade. Trade in the right terms, where we trade not in raw materials, but in finished product. There's no harm with the Western world processing, helping us with its capital to process the raw materials. Can we, but can we process them in Africa and jointly export them to the world and share value so that the young African population can get jobs? That's all that uh, uh, will make this work. A fair world where nobody is left behind, a resilient world where everybody feels there is fairness and justice and where everybody is passionate because their vote counts. To me, you are spot on. So your story of trying to find protective personal gear and not being able to find it, and then converting your factories to be producing for Kenya, for doctors and frontline, but then being able to contribute to the world, it seems like you've been walking this path of contributing to the whole planet by building up the resources, the capacity, 
in this area, health. I mean, COVID suddenly made mask and PPE everybody's worry. But I can feel the same um, debate and questions, for example, on the question of vaccine. Uh, we have built a kind of a global charity model, but Kenya could produce the vaccine. South Africa can produce the vaccine. Uganda can produce the vaccine. It feels like you have a vision of the proper balance of self-sufficiency and community care and trade and investment that is a two-way street. And for those of us like myself who drive an electric car, I'm now aware, but I need to be more conscious that my future electric car depends on Africa's capacity to mine and process my future health and good nutrition is linked to our ability to have a world food system that's local and global in proper portions. I'm so grateful that the Oslo committee chose to honor you for your contributions to peace because it seems to me that if we don't move in the direction that you're describing, where we respect and understand all of our contributions, the conflicts that grow out of, you know, water and food and animals and all of the things that happen at the local level and the wars that happen at the ideological level, we won't be able to solve that scourge of humanity unless we solve these direct problems of food and water and climate and the other things. I had the good fortune of uh, listening to the speeches from the Oslo, the presentation of the award. Can you share a little bit of how you felt with this recognition about your contributions to the kind of the most fundamental thing, peace? among people and among the nations? Mark, allow me to summarize what I've understood with what you said uh, before I answer the second question. I think you are saying the world has an opportunity to reset itself. I recognize and appreciate interdependence and share the prosperity. The world has enough for all of us. It's how we share that uh, is the problem. So if we reset our systems, if we reset our capitalism and give it a, a, and tamper it with a human heart, give it a soul, the world will build back better. The world uh, will have its, uh, will reduce the inequality, and the world will become very, very resilient and sustainable. Now going to Oslo, it was a very humbling experience for me because. I was being recognized for leaving my purpose. Uh, I was being recognized uh, for doing what I enjoy doing. So that was the most harboring thing. And um, I realized I was doing uh, something meaningful to others. When we moving from 2000 customers, we ended up with 15 million customers and getting 60% of all bank accounts in a country with 43 banks. I realized we were relevant to community. But more importantly, we were giving honor and dignity to the low income by allowing them to participate uh, in uh, our economic activities. We were enabling them. We were uh, allocating resources to them to actualize their dreams. We were fueling their aspirations. And essentially, they stopped treating equity as a bank, but saw it as a movement of socioeconomic transformation, which they wanted to be part of. I never saw myself as transforming them, but I saw myself as enabling them to acquire the tools to transform themselves and change their destiny. Little did I know that by doing that, I was creating a brand that was enjoying um, social capital. 
I was building enormous trust with the community. So I realized equity was at peace with the coast communities. And uh, the, the, it was more of a symbiotic uh, relationship. But by allocating everybody within community, the resources they required to realize their dreams, everybody had the skin in the game and everybody cared and everybody was peaceful. When everybody is peaceful and at peace with everybody else, then the community has peace. And so I could then relate what we had done uh, with um, uh, the Oslo uh, Business for Peace Award. But it then reflected back. That was uh, many years after 2005, winning the Global Vision Award, whose caption was initiators of the concept of the future that to shape the global economy. It's only now that uh, I could see the, uh, the wisdom and the insight. And I'm glad that we have lived uh, through this to see uh, that big picture now flourishing and uh, giving knowledge to the rest of the world. And I'm glad that the award came at a time uh, when the world was reflecting, when the world was going through that movement of uh, uh, looking back and saying we could have done uh, better. And we, then we were being given as an example of people who might have got it right early alone. So that is why it was very, very humbling. But I'm very grateful for the recognition. And it goes to uh, the 10,000 of my colleagues uh, who tirelessly uh, make the wheels of equity rotate. Well, this morning we heard again from Governor David Beasley, the head of the World Food Program, who was our um, main speaker last year on World Food Day. And it was about a week after the recognition came to the World Food Program about their contribution to peace. The Nobel Peace Prize Committee recognizing their work in uh, resisting people who would use food as a weapon of war, their work in reducing conflict by addressing agriculture and nutrition and food issues, and also their direct work in preventing the underlying conditions that often lead us to war. I'm very proud that our Global Minnesota World Food Day is honoring and bringing in the voices of Peace Prize winners who understand where food and agriculture sit at the crossroads of peace and justice. But I'm also so grateful for your comments today, helping all of us today and for as long as we can remember and be reminded that Africa will sit at the crossroads of the peace and prosperity of the future. You had a phrase that we have what we need. It's how we have failed to distribute. You talked about the difference between thinking of it as transformation and enabling. You've given us insights into how equity went from being the lowest rank to the highest and the way that it has become a movement. I'm just so honored to be able to speak with you today about the things that you've done that make the world a safer, more peaceful place right there in your home country and region, but in the larger planet, the whole way that you've expressed yourself. But I'm also aware that we have much, much more work to do. We have our own communities to mobilize together. And so as we end our time together this morning, I want to again invite you to come visit us when it's safe. And I know that your message in our diaspora community and in our whole community will resonate. Sometimes we talk of Minnesota as a state that specializes in organized kindness the thought process about how we treat each other you've demonstrated and your life's work and the work of your colleagues and your movement is one of the largest and most successful and most peace creating examples of organized kindness i've ever come to know thank you so much for joining us here and thank you for being a maker of peace i'm so grateful that the world has recognized that 
and we have much more work to do. Thank you very much, Mark, for giving us a chance. And uh, maybe we should uh, be having more of this kind of conversation. So Pufre uh, will inspire a few more. And one day we shall create a critical mass of believers. It's when we have a critical mass of believers, then uh, we shall have uh, the needle moving and hope for it. it will move much faster during our lifetime so that we can see a more sustainable yes. and world because uh, like your right reset, uh, the severity uh, of the world will be known by how we treat the lowest. Yes. You know, food yes. uh, to me is the ultimate hunger is the ultimate uh, indicator of poverty. It's yeah. when you lose your dignity because of food, uh, then you wonder uh, what uh, else should we be preserving than the dignity of people by avoiding hunger. And we can avoid hunger. We have work to do and we have all of these young creative people growing and becoming the next generation that'll make a difference. So absolutely, thanks let's a lot. teach them. All right, see you again. Thank Bye you. Now. Thank you very much, and your colleagues. Welcome back, everyone. This opportunity to hear from one of the most important thinkers and leaders from Africa, but also to opportunity to be able to think ahead is really where we want to go this afternoon because we're doing this day with a focus on the impacts of COVID, climate change, on conflict, on food security. But having gotten a big picture in each of these, we are gonna be focusing on solutions that are on, on the ground, working, which are both putting food on the table or addressing food insecurity somehow and addressing the underlying problems, the underlying creating forces for climate change, for the COVID running through us in pandemic, for conflict. So this, uh, this afternoon we'll have panel presentations of uh, some of the most exciting success stories, exciting projects, things that are going on. We'll have a little tiny break now uh, for uh, whatever you might need or want to do. We're going to share some of our videos, short videos again by a couple of our really um, you know, great organizations that we get to work with. One, the McKnight Foundation, which has been very important in uh, the work around the future of food, which has been really important to see what people are doing around the planet in that regard. And we'll also be seeing a little bit more from the world, from the FAO about their heroes of food, their food heroes. Um, but I wanna um, take this moment to remind you that there is uh, information about getting the uh, closed captioning if you need that. And it's in the description box over at the YouTube channel. And also again, to thank, uh, you know, there's a lot of pieces to making a day like this happen. And so it takes a whole team, a great big giants, team of people, our staff, our board, but we also rely on uh, the donations of our members, of our companies, our nonprofits and others. But we also had some very special contributors and I wanna call them out because they really made today possible. Our uh, gold sponsors, Hormel, uh, right here in Minnesota, McKnight Foundation and Land of Lakes, right here in Minnesota as well. Our silver sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield, You'll be hearing from uh, one of the important leaders from Blue Cross Blue Shield later today. Regenerative Agriculture Foundation, who I mentioned earlier, um, had uh, today announced a, a whole series of support and grants for um, indigenous and people of color farming organizations and food organizations working in regeneration and in recovery. Um, and also, um, of course, it's really important um, the sponsors and others who support us day in and day out, year after year, like Carlson Family Foundation, um, Delta Airlines, et cetera. And so having these supporters give us the opportunity to make these um, presentations, these symposiums available free worldwide. I think there's 67 or 68 countries represented 
Uh, no, I'm sorry. I think it's um, 36 or 37 countries who signed in uh, and are participating today. And I think about that same number of states from around the United States. So we know it's a global audience. It's a national audience. Um, we are knowing that caring about food and hunger is something that many, many people do care about. And today we hope that you're getting information that helps you think strategically and that you'll get inspiration from hearing about some of the successes and ideas about how you can plug in to help all of us together reach that 2030 goal of zero hunger. We're moving now to a brief period of the videos and we will gather again right at the top of the hour for the panel, the first panel for the afternoon. Thank you. Mi nombre es Alejandro Bonifacio Flores, soy ingeniero agrónomo de profesión. Trabajo en la Fundación Proimpa, que ha sido patrocinada en su investigación eh, por la Fundación McKnight desde hace 20 años en la parte de la investigación y desde hace 16 años en la comunidad de práctica, que es una actividad que tenemos relación entre varios proyectos de Sudamérica, inclusive con, con África, y trabajamos en, en la quinoa, personalmente yo soy un mejorador de quinoa, pero la quinoa no está sola, siempre decimos que no está sola, sino que está en una interacción, en un sistema de producción, entonces abordamos la quinoa en un contexto de, de su paisaje, de su ambiente. Entonces, así que aparte de la quinoa, trabajamos con especies nativas, arbustos, pastos, y además está en interrelación con, el, con la llama, el productor de quinoa está, es íntegro, maneja todo un sistema. Que sabemos que en la diversidad está la sostenibilidad, la diversidad de cultivos en tema de quinoa y la diversidad, la biodiversidad en otros ¿no? que están asociados a la quinoa. ¿no? La diversidad de papa, la diversidad de quinoa, la agrobiodiversidad, o sea, especies nativas que son también diversos. Entonces, estamos conscientes de que a la larga la diversidad, la biodiversidad, nos va a contribuir fuertemente a afrontar el cambio climático y la sostenibilidad de la producción en el altiplano. Yo he nacido en un pueblo que se llama Orinoca, que queda en la provincia Sur Carangas, del departamento de Oruro, una zona árida una zona donde se produce la quinoa, se cultiva un poco de papa y se cultiva quinoa. O sea, en mi infancia he es, estado relacionado con eso porque mis, mis padres son ganaderos y eran agricultores. Entonces mi, mi vivencia de nacimiento es en ese contexto, en ese ambiente. Entonces yo siempre digo cuando me preguntan dónde ha nacido, yo he nacido, digo en, un poco en, en broma, que yo he nacido en cuna de paja y cuna de arena. Con respecto a la, al, al conocimiento local y el conocimiento científico, que es un, un tema que muchos proyectos, muchas instituciones abordan, bueno, puedo comentarles de que es evidente, es, es muy apropiado considerar el saber local y el saber científico, porque en el campo está el saber local y la gente ha manejado por miles de años la tecnología, el conocimiento, todo eso, pero ese, ese conocimiento no está escrito, ¿no? solamente se transmite por vía oral. Entonces, en mi caso, a través de la vivencia con, con mis padres, mi mamá, todo eso, he tenido la oportunidad de conocer muchos aspectos del campo, o sea, la, la, la vivencia en el campo, el manejo, el abordaje de algunos problemas, pero también, o sea, la formación académica me ha permitido también cómo explicar eso, o sea, la, la, esos conocimientos, en otras palabras, cómo relacionar el saber local con el saber científico que se llama. Con respecto a la confianza de los agricultores, yo creo que nace de la, de la ascendencia mismo que uno tiene, ¿no? Por ejemplo, yo me comunico fácilmente con los productores en su idioma nativo, el Aymara, ¿no? Y si fuera el caso, también Quechua. Tengo esa suerte de hablar los, los dos idiomas nativos y puedo comunicarme con ellos con mayor confianza, especialmente cuando se trata de mujeres. Las mujeres siempre son un poco más reservadas, no quieren hablar en otro idioma, entonces cuando hablamos en Aymara nos comunicamos, nos entendemos muy bien, entonces eso me favorece y por eso a los jóvenes también les ando un poco sugiriendo que deberían estudiar idiomas nativos también para comunicarse, pero estamos viendo estamos actualmente con otras 
formas de llegar a la, a la gente y puedo mencionar por ejemplo la, la red de agricultores e investigadores, la comunidad de práctica, la comunidad de práctica de la zona andina. Entonces a través de, de ellos mi experiencia, mis conocimientos puedo compartir ¿no? para poder aportar los conocimientos y también Aprender, o sea, ¿no? el aprendizaje es mutuo, como decía, ¿no? O sea, aprendemos de los productores y ellos también aprenden de nosotros, donde esa interacción puede ser beneficioso. Porque ahora estamos en un contexto de cambio climático que ha movido el piso de la agricultura, si es posible, ¿no? O sea, antes era totalmente diferente, ha cambiado el tiempo. Ese, ese mismo tropiezan los agricultores, por eso la migración. O sea, más fácil es irse a la ciudad, buscar alguna ocupación en la ciudad, ¿no? y en el campo es, es, realmente hay problemas y eso queremos revertir o si no es revertir por lo menos parar, estabilizar que la gente por lo menos se quede en el campo que haya alguna, alguna actividad productiva o que pueda combinar digamos entre la ciudad y el campo pero que no abandonen el campo ¿no? eso es el, el desafío y en eso estamos trabajando ¿no? y se necesita mucha gente se necesita tiempo, se necesita recursos se necesita alianzas con otras instituciones y eso es la Fundación Proimpa busca ese tipo de alianzas. La vida, ese cariño que hemos tenido para toda la vida, ay 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 huaycheña, para toda la vida, ay 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 huaycheña, para toda la vida.
Welcome back, everyone. We're about to begin our panel discussion on climate smart actions, solutions that people are pursuing. In one case, it'll be the whole country in Costa Rica. Another, it'll be very specific about how it's working in some regions. But in all cases, what we're looking at this afternoon are examples when people have tackled both short-term issues that related to food security, but done it in a way that was addressing the underlying or more fundamental causes. In this case, first one will be climate. Um, we're gonna open with a, a good friend of Global Minnesota, Paula Caballero, who now serves as the Managing Director for the Lands for Life at RARE, an international biodiversity conservation organization. But we first began working with Paula when she was the author of and chief lobbyist globally for the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 SDGs that we're all so devoted to focusing on and, and moving forward in her role as a part of the Foreign Ministry in Colombia. She and a group of colleagues around the Colombian Foreign Ministry and in other places came up with uh, a very specific way of following up on the Millennial Goals, which they ended up calling Sustainable Development Goals and coming up with the list and making them into the global movement that drives us so directly today and provides such a North Star for all of us. Paula's work and addressing climate specific uh, uh, solutions is extraordinary. She's all over the planet and we'll hear from her uh, first. And then we'll be joined by uh, the organization and one of the groups that was honored by the Regenerative Agriculture Foundation today, the Iowa tribe of Nebraska and Kansas. Um, we'll be um, uh, joined by uh, Tim Rod, who is their both the tribal chairman, the executive director, uh, but he's also been one of the main drivers on their um, real transformation of their agriculture, uh, their farm and their farming um, uh, farming aspects of their operations there. And their um, program consultant and climate resilience staff person. So the scientist um, member of the tribe that's been part of this is uh, Brett Ramey. He is also a program uh, advisor and a consultant for that Regenerative Agriculture Foundation. So we'll be hearing about the specific things that they've been doing that has put more food on the table for their tribal members, but also address fundamental issues of climate. And then we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Edward Mueller about the approaches that have been taken in Costa Rica. So these are uh, opportunities to see where we can put our finger on something that can be helping address food security right now, but also we can see how they are part of much larger solutions that are addressing the underlying causes of why we've gone backwards the last couple of years in food insecurity. So let's uh, roll this uh, first interview and thank you again for joining us for World Food Day 2021. Welcome back everyone and thank you again for joining us today at World Food Day 2021. Global Minnesota and partners around the planet are taking a good look, a comprehensive look at the impacts of climate of COVID and conflicts on food security around the world. And what are people doing at the local level, at the regional, the national and the international level to address the short-term issues and the long-term causes of these challenges, these threats to food and food survival and food sovereignty and food security around the planet. I'm really pleased to have a good friend and colleague for my next guest for today. Um, Paula Caballero has been the Managing Director of Lands for Life program at RARE, one of the really amazing global institutions working on biodiversity and protection of the environment, promotion of the Sustainable Development Goals, something that's very close and dear to her, one of the original founders and the original creators of that concept and of those SDGs as they're often called. Paula, it's wonderful to have you on today on our program. And we know that you've been focusing on questions around climate and climate change for a number of years, and you've seen the planet. You've been out in the communities throughout the world. Can you give us 
a sense of how has climate and the climate crisis been impacting food security? And how do you see that in community response that builds out the sort of resilience and the protection of food security that every single person on the planet must have? Well, first of all, Mark, thank you very much for inviting me back. It's always great to chat with you. You're asking really very salient questions that are at the heart of uh, the intersection of many of the crises that, that we're facing right now. Um, I think we're, we're facing the climate crisis and the biodiversity uh, loss crisis, and the, these intersect very neatly with the great opportunity that we have to really transition to an agriculture and to food systems, um, to fisheries that are much more resilient, sustainable and inclusive, and that deliver not just a lot of environmental benefits, but long term productivity for uh, a lot of populations around the world, in particular, a lot of communities that are very vulnerable and that depend almost entirely on their access to these viable and, and hopefully very vibrant in the future food systems. The reality though, is, as you well mentioned, is that climate change is already having huge impacts. Um, we're seeing massive droughts in Madagascar, for example, where they're facing very, very serious issues of famine. Um, we're seeing droughts impacting and exal exacerbating conflict in places like Ethiopia and Afghanistan. And even here in the US, we're seeing um, the, a very prolonged drought that is having uh, and will continue to have very severe impacts, not just in terms of, of the wildfires, for example, that we're seeing, uh, but water levels and water security for the medium and longer term. So the realities in terms of um, soil erosion, soil degradation, um, in terms of water um, uh, scarcity, uh, in terms of the lowering productivity of, of many crops, uh, we're already seeing that, and these will impact hugely on populations and communities around the world. And this plays out obviously at national level. Um, countries with a lot less resources will be very strained to be able to provide the kind of solutions and support to their communities to be able to um, move onto more resilient trajectories. And, and the, one of the results of that that we're already seeing are climate refugees. A lot of the people that um, we label economic refugees are really climate refugees, people who can really no longer eke out a living, no matter how hard they try, from their um, plots, from their land where they were born because of a combination of climate change and also bad practices that have contributed also to soil erosion, soil degradation, and mismanagement of water resources. So it's a huge problem, but I would say that the big um, uh, um, solution or the big uh, positive side that gives me optimism and that I'd like to focus on is that sustainable and inclusive agriculture also holds the key to um, helping resolve and tackle effectively a lot of these crises. Get, do you have some specific examples that you could help our audience see um, what some of these hopeful signs, what some of these inspiring examples looks like? Sure. So one of the um, key aspects about agriculture is that it is a main source of what we all know now as greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, it's a driver of climate change. Um, and a lot of these practices that drive climate change, if we change them, if we modify them to make them more sustainable, we can actually be part of the climate solution and at the same time, increase the resilience. So there's a lot of momentum right now, for example, around soil health, uh, because a good soil, a soil that is healthy, is a soil that can become what we know as a carbon sink. It can absorb those, uh, that carbon, whereas soil that is overtilled and uh, mismanaged becomes a source of these emissions. So good soil health not only delivers on the climate, but obviously if you have really rich soil health for poor communities, it means that they're going to be spending a lot less money on unnecessary agrochemicals, and they're going to be ensuring the productivity of their land, not just for the short term, but what is really critical for the long term. Another really good example is just around trees. Um, agriculture has led to a pushing of the agricultural frontier in many cases. 
um, or to um, an understanding of what good farming or good ranching looks like, which is to cut down all the trees and just have entirely huge areas with either livestock or with monocrops. And sustainable agriculture or agroecology, there's many different terms for it, but, but agriculture that's more climate smart is also about putting the trees back into the land in terms of living fences and many other different approaches, um, silver pastoral systems. And again, putting the trees back in has all these dividends. And as we know, trees are a really key part of nature-based solutions so that we can again figure out ways of generating less emissions and of absorbing the emissions um, that may exist. I'm trying to put this simplistically because I know that these are, it's, it's a complicated uh, matter, but at the end of the day, it's really simple. It's agriculture can be a good solution. Well, and this bringing together of these two concepts, I mean, even in the United States in our 1930s, when we talk about the Great Depression, but we talk about the beginnings being the, the dust storms and the blowing of uh, sand and, and dust particles continental wide. This year we had fires with, you know, soot. And so we know that these combination of proper practices, you know, building up the soil and holding it in place with crops and with trees and all of these things can do those two short term and long term. But you think about this, I know also from a policy perspective, a, a larger territorial perspective, changing hearts and minds and practices takes a combination of things. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen that's been successful in places where they kind of tackled it in that way that you're describing? Certainly, I think that's a really good question, Mark. Let me tackle it from sort of two ends. On the one side, we need to provide the um, access to timely, to quality, technical advice, agronomic advice to farmers so that they um, understand and are able to shift their practices. But a part of the problem that, that I have seen worldwide is that it's, it's oftentimes very projectized. There's a lot of projects and then the projects and, and um, the projects usually provide some kind of incentives, the incentives ends and we're sort of right back where we started. So I would say that one of the really key aspects to success if, if in, to make the solution a reality is to make these changes stick. And to make them stick, you need to have farmers just change their mindsets and communities and you talk about policy, local leaders, changing the understanding of what good farming looks like, what a farm, what an entire landscape, a productive landscape should look like. And changing those mindsets is something that we at, at RARE are very good at. Um, and we work using a lot of behavior levers, but also community dynamics, the fact that human beings are very social animals. And we often follow the leaders. We often, if we, and if we're given proof, tangible proof that something works, well, we may follow that. So there's a lot around the, the social dynamics uh, that we can work on and the way that people are approached so that we really appeal to uh, and, and support them as informed decision makers, not telling them what to do, but giving them agency and empowering them so that they have all of the information they need so that they can become informed uh, producers who are better able to take all the decisions they need to take to make their farmings and their, their land productive for the short and long term. So that's at the sort of individual level and capitalizing on the social dynamics. But we also need both to deliver on the climate solution as well as ultimately on the productivity solution. We need entire territories, entire landscapes to change, not just a few scattered farmers, but everybody. And there again, the behavior change and the social dynamics play a really key role. Technology is going to be and is already being decisive. There's a lot of, of a huge plethora of these really amazing apps around the world that are making it more cost effective and easier for farmers and even in remote areas to be able to access timely and, and more information. So changing those mindsets is really important. But I think that another key aspect so that we can really mobilize entire territories um, is one to engage local and regional authorities so that they're behind that. Um, we have, for example, the governor's um, task force on, on climate 
and Environment, if I get the name right, that was launched at the um, summit in California that, that took place two or three years ago. And a lot of regional authorities signed up to that, a lot of governors, and they want to make their territories a sustainable territory. So there's a lot of political momentum, but it's hard because in some of those very same territories, um, there's actually very high rates, for example, of deforestation. So political will is not enough. And I think a very important complement of that is to bring in the private sector. And by private sector, I mean a multinational like Unilever or Cargill, but also a cooperative or a farmers association, the whole spectrum. And we need to be able to really leverage the power of value chains, of supply chains, to help shift to more sustainable practices. Because if we're able to have those shifts come around, um, that can really um, deliver lasting and durable chain in the both. And this is important, not just then in the productive, productive side, which is what you and I have been talking about, but also triggering much more demand for sustainably produced uh, commodities and products from the consumer side. And at the end of the day, we need to have the push and pull of the producers and, and the, the demand, the supply and the demand to really transform these value chains. And if we get that right, if we get the, the incentives right, if we get the price signals right, a greater recognition and a willingness for markets to price sustainably produced um, uh, crops in an, in an appropriate way, um, and then on top of that, if we're really working at an entire landscape level so that we can access climate finance or other forms of payment for results or payment for ecosystem services, this will generate with the supply chains and these um, uh, supply chains that, that can really harness the market dynamics, generate the additional resource streams and incentives we need to bring about the durable chain. So. As you see, there's many different elements that can come into this equation. And I think more and more organizations around the world, um, multilateral banks, you name it, um, organizations like the World Wildlife Fund or TNC, the World Bank, um, are all really trying to push and advance much more these kinds of, of jurisdictional uh, approaches. Well, I note that in the crafting of the seven, the sustainable development goals that you were a key early leader in really founding that, that new movement, but it has all of these components. It has responsible consumption. It has the goal of zero hunger. It has response in terms of water above ground and below ground, gender equity, other issues. It seems like somewhere in that process of discussing what should be our aspirational goals, this 15 year goal to 2030, you came up with a 17th goal, partnerships, a little different yeah. than zero hunger, than good, ed, good health and well being for all. It was a way of describing how you thought we would be able to get there. Can you give us a little flavor of that in this? central focus on climate and food security? Sure, I think partnerships are key. I mean, what we're all, what we're trying to do is, is bring about systems change. And, and that's really hard to do. Um, if I can say right now, when we talk about COVID and what the response should be, we talk about build back better. And I, I'm begging everybody to not build back better. We need to build back differently. Because if we just do what the same thing that we've been doing better, we're still going to be in the bind that we're at. And so getting to build back differently means a need for very transformative partnerships because nobody can bring about those kinds of systems chain by themselves. So when I talk about, for example, these, these sustainable supply chains, right, and, and creating these supply sheds, uh, sustainable supply sheds across entire jurisdictions, they're already, you need very, very intense partnerships you need to have an alignment of private sector actors, both the ones that have a bigger pull and bigger cloud in the market. We need to leverage the farmers, the farmers associations and the producers um, also as a way of, of creating multipliers on the ground. We need to very much engage local authorities that are 100% behind this with the right policy signals at both local as well as national levels. And then there has to be, for many of these particularly commodities like beef or uh, cacao or, or soy, um, 
a lot of the right signals at an international level. So we're talking about not many, only many different entity points, but many different scales of action. And at every single one of those intersections, we need those partnerships. And we also need the partnerships because we have to bring in many different voices. You mentioned gender. Women play a fundamental role in, in these shifts uh, and many in, in, in all of these transitions. But since we're talking about food systems, women play a key role as the youth. One of the key challenges, I think, coming out of COVID is a fourth crisis. We have the biodiversity crisis, biodiversity, uh, climate change crisis and the pandemic. A fourth crisis that I have that I'm speaking to is what I call the generational setback. And that is that we have an entire generation of youth that are going to be whose, whose educational trajectories and livelihood opportunities are being really impacted by, by the pandemic, by the lockdowns, by the difficulty in continuing to access education. A lot of girls have fallen out of the school systems and may remain out of the school systems. So um, part of really addressing these challenges, particularly in rural settings, will be to address and to generate livelihood opportunities for youth. Because otherwise, um, what's happening in Colombia and in many other parts of the world, there's just this big outflow of the talent, of the energy, of the dynamism that youth bring to cities outside of exactly those spaces where we could have very vibrant landscapes if we manage it right. And for that, we need partnerships. So it is all about sort of radical partnerships. Thank you so much for giving us that inspirational look at how the partnerships can help lift us. This COVID, the, the crisis that you've described, Thank you for your leadership in the global level and your home country in Colombia, but at the global scale. And I look forward to our next conversation, but I also know that you are finishing up a book about where the SDGs are going. And so we're all will be looking forward to that. So thank you again, Paula Caballero from Rare. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure and look forward to our next conversation. Welcome back, everyone, wherever you're watching from around the planet. Global Minnesota's World Food Day 2021 Symposium is focusing on food security and the impact of the COVID pandemic, the climate crisis and conflict between and across borders on food security. And why have we seen such a large increase in the number of people planet wide who are insecure in their food? This morning in the program, we saw and heard about the big picture. This afternoon, we're looking at the solutions, the success stories, the ways that people are tackling food security and simultaneously addressing the underlying causes. I'm really pleased today to be joined by Brett Ramey from the uh, Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. He's the climate resilience planner, bringing those skills and his scientific training to that question of how do we become resilient to what the climate crisis is causing and creating in our lives today. And Tim Rod, who's the chairman of the executive committee of the tribe, the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. This is his, he's in his third term. And uh, he's uh, really passionate and clear about how agriculture is the solution, but also the ways that Doing agriculture in some ways has been a cause of the problem. And in the Iowa tribe, as he uh, educated me, uh, the word for soil is about the skin of the earth. And so I'm just so pleased, uh, Chairman Rod, to have you here uh, in your role, um, both as the executive leader of the tribe, but also your passion as a leader in agriculture. I'm handing the microphone over to you to hear about your success stories and how you're taking on this challenge of this climate crisis. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, you know, it's it's definitely been a long journey uh, for the Iowa tribe and Iowa farms. Um, you know, uh, I've been in, in leadership since uh, 2007, um, and I've been an integral part of the farming operation um, back in 2007 all the way up through today uh, you know and what i've seen um, over those 14 years is 
you know, a competition between neighbors and other farmers and other producers, um, you know, who can, who can raise the highest yield, um, you know, and it, it, what I've learned over, over those 14 years is it, it takes a lot of inputs and a, and a lot of dollars uh, to raise a monoculture crop um, that, you know, doesn't really, um, you know, come back to the tribe and the members for, you know, food. So, um, you know, one of the biggest uh, issues that uh, we're faced with here in Kansas and Nebraska on our reservation is, you know, we've got uh, producers that is putting on the, the harmful nitrogen source, which is anhydrous ammonia. And, you know, that um, nitrogen source is very detrimental to the soil biology, uh, you know, because the soil is alive. There's living and functioning organisms throughout the soil that has to work in a symbiotic relationship to provide, you know, the food uh, to those organisms and to the plants and to the animals and, and, and you know, which in turn, you know, turns back to us uh, for our protein sources. So, you know, and what we've did is we've changed our model. Um, we took a good hard look at where our dollars were going out. And a lot of those were chemicals and fertilizer. Um, you know, so we, what we did is uh, we start with the soil and there's six soil health principles. Um, number one is know your context. Um, you've got to know what you're farming for. Um, you know, and we as a tribe are farming now for our membership and the community to provide more healthy, nutrient dense quality food to those individuals. Um, you know, number two is, is cover the soil. You know, um, Mother Earth, um, her skin, you know, is, is the, the top of the soil that we walk on and what we see every day. Uh, and we've got to keep her covered because, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, what we've done is put, um, you know, cover crops in, uh, not only to, to feed the biology, but to keep her covered. So we don't have that, uh, evaporation, uh, rate that, that, you know, we're, we're, it facing issues today. So uh, number three is the minimum uh, soil disturbance. This is where we as producers have made a big mistake. Um, you know, through tillage and plowing, it it has degraded and disturbed that, uh, that soil. Um, and, you know, we've got to keep that intact as much as possible. And through heavy tillage, you know, from our operation, what we've done is uh, we've you know, disrupted that system. And, you know, basically we're not able to infiltrate water. You know, the soil should be just no different than a carbon filter that we have on our faucets. You know, that water should be infiltrating down through the soil, through the pore spaces and, and getting back down to the, to the aquifer. Um, you know, number four is increased diversity. You know, hundreds of years ago, uh, how this environment used to be, you know, it was, it was lands just full of, um, you know, natural habitat and different varieties of, of plant species. And, you know, I always um, use this as a, an example, you know, hundreds of years ago when the, the bison had, you know, roamed across all of these areas, you know, they, they've, they've grazed those areas, you know, and they weren't stuck on a certain amount of perimeter fence to where um, they overgraze and overstock sometimes. So uh, increase in diversity, it also uh, helps with uh, feeding uh, the soil biology with keeping a, a living root in uh, the soil 24 seven, 365 days a year. You know, those, those plants will actually, through the root exudates, uh, will feed the biology. And then the last is uh, integrate livestock. And this is, you know, where I've talked about, you know, years ago when the bison and the wild animals had roamed through here. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a quick turnaround on our soil biology and also um, our organic matter is increasing. Uh, we're not having to put in as much nutrients back into the soil. Um, you know, so integration, integration of uh, livestock is, is, is very helpful. You know, our old model was uh, conventional farming, monoculture, heavy tillage. Uh, we were chasing yields and, and profits. Um, but, you know, when you look at the bottom line of your whole operation, um, it's the bottom line that is, is what really matters because we've got to farm in a way that we can self-sustain ourselves. And right now, um, for the Iowa tribe and its, and its old model, um, 
you know, there was all those dollars going out and really nothing coming back. Um, you know, so the lack of biodiversity in the cropping systems, um, you know, that was an old model of ours. And we've spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last 14 years that I've been here just trying to fix uh, the soil erosion. Because what we do, you know, Mother Earth and her skin, if we can keep her protected and, uh, and that living plant 24-7, 365 days a year will actually keep that soil intact to where a lot of, uh, when it rains, you know, we've, we have heavy rains here and, and a lot of those nutrients and, you know, the topsoil is being eroded away and washed down through the creeks and the streams and the river and, you know, we, we can't get that back. You know, um, one of the biggest exports uh, of in agriculture today, and, and a lot of people don't realize this, is is uh, topsoil. You know, and if we think about that just for a minute, um, exporting topsoil. You know, there's 50 to 60 years that that they're predicting that we will not have enough topsoil here. Um, you know, without that topsoil, it's going to be very, very hard to grow the food that our community and our membership needs, uh, you know, to survive. And, you know, through COVID uh, this last couple of years, um, you know, it was, you know, access to, to, to food was, it was insecure. You know, it was here on our reservation, um, you know, where we've got to travel, you know, 30 miles to go to the nearest grocery store. Um, you know, so what we're doing is we're focusing on the soil biology. We are adding um, more food production uh, throughout our land, uh, which will in turn um, be able to um, provide all of that nutrient dense quality food that that our members need. You know, we're gonna we're gonna outsource that. We're actually in the process right now of of um, expanding one of our um, sea store operations here on our our, our uh, reservation. And, you know, through that, um, we will actually be able to have better access to, to food. Um, you know, so that's pretty, pretty rewarding um, to see this transition, not only economically, um, but for the better health of the soil, the community, the land, the water. And, you know, overall, that long-term goal is what we're trying to, to fix is, you know, human health uh, amongst our, our uh, membership. You know, and we as Native Americans, um, you know, years ago, we were hunters and gatherers and we ate the foods that were in season and, and we had access to, you know, so what what is happening out in the in in our farming operation and has been for a number of years is, um, you know, we, we are farming in a way that uh, is detrimental to um, the land, the water, the air and our um our, our human health. And I, I give this an analogy uh, from what I've seen here throughout the years is, you know, we keep adding um, nutrients, you know, the nitrogen, the chemicals and the fertilizer to the land. And what is happening, um, it's degraded that soil system, right? And, you know, we're seeing an increase in, in diseases, you know, we have pests coming in, we have a fungicide coming in, we have, you know, there's just all these different um, increase in diseases. And it's actually, I believe, is what we are adding uh, to the land. And it's disturbing and disrupting the soil biology. And we as humans, uh, with the gut microbiome uh, in ourselves, um, with all the processed foods and, you know, the things that we eat and the sugars and stuff um, is having an impact on the gut microbiome of us. And that's where we're actually seeing these, these uh, diseases increase in, in our systems as well. I'd like to uh, share one more example, uh, and that's kind of the economic uh, model of how we're able to tra transition from a monoculture uh, into a more of a food production uh, polyculture system. And this is a um, pretty neat and very successful project that we we started. And, you know, Brett Ramey, a uh, tribal member, has um, has introduced us to a, a company from, from Lawrence, Kansas, that is um you know making tofu now the 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 end uh comparison here on this uh tofu uh, bean you know which is a organic seed it, there was no seed treatment with an insecticide on that seed and it was planted into standing rye and we are actually going to be getting you know 33 to 34 dollars per bushel 
out of this product. So, um, you know, just this one small um, 80 acre track that we've, we've grew these, these soybeans for this, this customer, uh, we're gonna be doing that across the whole landscape and every farming operation that we have and every tract of land that we have. And, you know, eventually what I foresee is, is transitioning out of this monoculture into more food production, uh, a healthier uh, food production because we've actually did not put any inputs, any nutrients to grow this crop because all of the nutrients was in the soil because of the different practices that we're instilling here. So, you know, we're, we're correcting several different things here. You know, we're not adding a herbicide. We're not adding a fungicide. We, we don't have to, to add the inputs and nitrogen and, and all the nutrients that it takes for these plants to grow. So we're decreasing those input dollars that cost the, the operation money. And at the end, 13 to 14 dollars a bushel in the old model, 33 to 34 dollars a bushel on the new model. So we're actually decreasing the input cost, increasing the revenue, which means more dollars in our pocket. Great. Brad, it seems like this is a really important way forward that solves many of the problems that have been underlying the economic, the ecological. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, Chairman Rod named a lot of those intersecting issues throughout what he shared from, from health of land to the health of our gut microbiome and how those things can't be considered separate. And so I think that's one of one of the roles that we have as indigenous communities and what other people can learn from is, is we we don't live in a world that's you know traditionally that separated things out in that way, where we always knew that the health of one thing relied on the health of the other. And and if we're polluting our water, you know, for short-term economic gain, ultimately we're going to be paying the price short and or long term and the health of our bodies, the health of the land, you know, all of these things. And so I'm just so excited and, and proud of, of what the, our tribe is doing, you know, under Chairman Rod's leadership, along with members of the farm team who are, who are seeing the need to, to transition into different practices and how largely a lot of those practices, while the specifics might look different, right? The roller crimper going over the rye cover crop, you know, we didn't have roller crimpers, you know, that we were pulling behind Buffalo back in the day. <laughs> But nonetheless, like the values and the, the general ethic behind it is, is still the same. It's very much you know, traditional values that are being carried forward. And, and I think another kind of key piece to that in talking specifically about these, these soybeans is that you know, kind of that ethic of, of relationships being kind of a primary, you know, of primary importance. So relationships across you know, health of land, health of people, like I just restated, but also relationships regionally with, with customers, with other community members who are going to then have the opportunity to, to benefit from, from eating, eating these foods as well. And, and so I think you know, that ends up being part of one of my roles as the climate resilience planner for the tribe is kind of, you know, taking a bird's eye view of, of, you know, our economy, you know, our lands, you know, our human health and trying to find these intersection points again to, to bring them all back in together to this more cohesive, healthy whole. And, and so that ends up being that I get to, you know, make connections between, um, you know, what the tribe is doing, you know, in agricultural practices and helping find, you know, customers through different networks and relationships. You know, in this case, the, the tofu factory here in Lawrence, Kansas, which is, you know, 80 miles away from, from our reservation. And, and so for, as we're continuing to thinking, think about, you know, what, what does it look like to reinstate in our traditional practices, traditional values into the landscape as part of this broader climate, climate resilience, you know, ultimately it looks at, you know, how we continue to, to view ourselves as humans within the, this broader ecosystem of, of, of the cattle, of the beans, of the water, of, of the carp even, right? And so how do these kind of, you know, quote, invasive fish, you know, end up actually serving to, to benefit and, and further our, our goals um, as humans, you know, in the reservation that is ultimately benefiting everything else as well that, that lives and depends on that same soil and water that we do. And as, you know, we've, we've heard recently, you know, there's been reports that suggest that, you know, 80 percent of remaining biodiversity is in indigenous lands. And so that alone right there signals to the absolute necessity for for everyone to kind of take notice of, of what our tribe is doing, what all other indigenous peoples are doing around. Because within 
our respective ways of doing things, we do hold a lot of these solutions that address the climate impacts that, that we're seeing globally, right? And so as much as we can kind of acknowledge that, yes, like within Western paradigms, Western science, there are very valuable tools that support moving forward. Um, that has to be coupled with a, a deep understanding that the ethics, values, worldviews, the see interconnections, the see the necessity of, of um, interrelationships that so many indigenous peoples hold, like that is ultimately what is needed is that shift in thinking um, because just even just like the tools alone, implementing them within an otherwise you know, system that is just the same that we've always been through is not gonna be sufficient. And, and that's one, one thing that just wanted to, to note in relation to this is that, that today um, the Regenerative Agriculture Foundation um, where we put out a press release for what we call the Restoring Regenerative Agriculture Program. And so I was fortunate to work with, with RAF to, to design and lead this funding program that was specifically and explicitly for you know, Black, Indigenous um, communities of color in the regenerative agriculture space, um, many of which don't even use that terminology just because by nature of what they've always been doing like is regenerative. Um, and so we were able to to provide direct support to 15 organizations um, who are doing this work, who are in their own respective ways, leading in similar ways that Chairman Rod mentioned that the Iowa tribe is doing as well. Um, so just invite people to kind of, you know, take a look at some of that work their Regenerative Ag, Ag, Regenerative Ag Foundation is doing, both in terms of, of the types of organizations that we are funding that are leading forward with a different ethic, that do see the necessity of soil health, and carbon sequestration within their practices. And um, in addition to that, know that there has to be a different way forward that, that honors you know, everybody who's working the land. You know, so we're honoring farm workers always. We're always ensuring the health of the soils. You know, we're always ensuring that we're forwarding our ancestral knowledges. And so those are those sort of additional layers that a lot of these organizations bring forward in addition to the necessary pieces of ensuring healthy soil and healthy ways to, to address climate impacts through sequestration or otherwise. And so I'm just so happy to be able to learn from those organizations and the way I'm learning from Chairman Rod and others within our tribe to, to really put forward some other ways of, of doing things and not just the what they're doing, but actually the how we're doing it and the ethics we're leading through, which is ultimately, I would suggest more important than some of the specific practices even. Mm -hmm. So I just appreciate being able to be with you all and share a little bit today. Chairman Rod and Brett and Ramey, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your experience, but also giving a hopeful message about the logic of leaving behind certain things that are damaging our climate and moving towards climate solutions that are also healthy for people and for the planet. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Very welcome. Thank you. I'm honored and humbled to be a part of this and uh, looking forward to, you know, telling the story and, you know, because it is it is a model that can be implemented anywhere. It's just following those soil health principles and practices. After that, you know, everything's going to work together uh, for the greater good at all. So we've got to quit living for yesterday. And today and tomorrow, we've got to start looking out uh, as we as Native communities, you know, those seven generations that we should be preparing for and looking ahead that many years. That's where we're going to make these changes. And we cannot do that until we educate ourselves in, in a different type of a model of farming. So it was a pleasure being a part of this uh, today. And, you know, I look forward to the message getting um, sent out to all over the you know the the country because this can be um implemented anywhere so thank, thank you. you welcome back everyone and we're looking at the climate impacts on food security food insecurity and solutions that are addressing both the short and long term. I'm thrilled to have my next guest and would invite him onto the screen, Dr. Edward Mueller from Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica is really maybe the world leader on decarbonization, on addressing the greenhouse gas emission, but also thinking about 
all the different sectors, food and agriculture and transportation. Your role as president and founder of the University of Ag for International Cooperation has put you at a pivot point in Costa Rica's making this transformative effort inside of Costa Rica and becoming a global leader. Can you share with us how the society moved together to make Costa Rica such a North Star for the planet? Thank you, thank you uh, so much for inviting me, Mark, to be part of this. Um, Costa Rica is, is different. Um, maybe because it, in 1948, we abolished the military and a lot of money was put into health and education. And in the 80s, we were one of the first countries to establish a Ministry of Environment. And I think it's one of the few countries that has gone from 21% forest cover to more than half of the country now covered with forest. So there is a high level of environmental awareness, but we've had uh, a series of governments and a series of international policies that have been pushing the same policies from other countries that have been very detrimental for the environment. So Costa Rica is at the same time one of the highest consumers of pesticides per person in the country, in the world. Uh, so we have this dichotomy of reality and uh, the dream that we pursue. But at the same time, it allows us to have focus on us, have the lights shining on the country. And that is what we're trying to use when we walk the path of regenerating the country at a country level. And this has come to uh, inspire other countries. We now have Colombia. Yesterday, we launched Chile Regenerativo. Uh, we have Mexico. Denmark uh, has joined. So I think we will be able to show country at a time and all countries together that we have to do things differently. And so the specific ways that you've tackled agriculture, and I was not aware of that heavy pesticide use and have only visited a few times, but I can see that in the world of agriculture and food and all of that, there are different forces. So within Costa Rica, there were decisions taken, and now it's more forested. There's new available kind of crops and cropping practices. Do you see the strength of that movement with these new countries and new, I'd say, spotlight, as you mentioned, giving Costa Rica the strength to just carry on and to continue to lead by example for the rest of us? Well, yes, inspiration comes from Buck Fuller. Uh, don't try to fight the system to make it a better <laughs> one. And the other one will become obsolete very quickly. We tried to fight the pineapple industry and the banana industry, which are the highest use of pesticide. They're killing our biodiversity. They're killing our children with, with cancer and other diseases. And it's, it's still pushed because it's, it's one of the most important export products. I think Costa Rica is the largest exporter of pineapple in the world. So, of course, uh, government doesn't want to give this up. And, of course, uh, these big corporations that are behind that, they find it easier to use all these chemicals. So what we've done is actually demonstrate that we can not only produce high quality food, abundant food, high diversity. We're doing intercropping, multi-cropping with 30, 40 different crops in beds, uh, a tremendous recovery of the soil health. We've had insect populations bounce back. Amazingly, two months after we started the process, we just see these insect populations bounce back. So we're bringing back biodiversity, we're capturing carbon in the soil. We hope to have sensors next year that we can demonstrate this at a large scale. Um, and we're producing really good and abundant quality food for people that didn't have what to eat. We're mostly now in this area of Guanacaste, which depended on tourism, tourism locked down overnight. So these people were kicked out of their jobs without a bank account, without food production in the area. And we were told you can't produce food with people that have no experience and all these degraded soils in Winacaste. We're producing now eight to 10 tons of food per hectare managed by communities that are learning agriculture, regenerative agriculture. This has been inspired by the Cuban model. Felix Cañet was one of the founders of the Cuban food security uh, process in the early 90s. 
he's the dean of our of our one health school and we're now uh, incorporating Mel Landers with indigenous agriculture so Mel has been recollecting re experience from some indigenous agriculture for over 50 years and we're just combining this with food forest all these other alternatives and uh soil erosion was mentioned before in the talk before Costa Rica loses as Central America, about 200 tons of topsoil per hectare per year. That's 20 to 30 dump trucks loaded with soil and dumped into the rivers, which end up in our oceans, killing our, our reefs. So we can actually reverse the planetary degradation by producing better food. And we bring in self-esteem. We're working on culture. Our regenerative development process links politics, bringing younger people into uh, politics the spiritual level, we bring social and cultural regeneration, environmental and economic regeneration. So by focusing on local production, local consumption, our tourism is starting to become regenerative tourism, which is actually inclusive of the local communities, sustainable tourism that didn't include the local communities, really. They were just, you know, in the gardens or, or, or cleaning the rooms. Now we're really bringing a holistic approach to a bioregion development that will bring communities to participate in the development, empower them to make decisions. And it's amazing to see these women uh, talking that they don't need any psychological assistance anymore because we did set up a, a, a psychological assistance for, for all the trouble they were going, the trauma they're going through. We see these kids just so excited, learning. Uh, we see people really coming together and working again in, in solidarity. So instead of competing, we're actually collaborating. We see one community farm preparing plants to give to another community farm. So it's, it's, a, it's this whole mix, which makes better money, makes better food, and we really reverse the planetary boundaries we've exceeded. It's a win, 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 win. I think this is the thing that's been the most inspiring. And of course, one of your at least temporary export is young, brilliant leaders who go around the planet and lead international bodies or international conferences or whatever. And the rest of us pick up on their wisdom, their experience, their insights. I'm wondering the role of the university and can more people access that because it's now virtual and they could get online? How, how could that become even more dynamic? Yeah, I founded the University in 94 to implement sustainability. So bringing environment, society, uh, and economics together. Very soon, we transition to bringing culture, politics, and spirituality into the sustainability framework. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started working on regeneration. We realized sustainability wasn't there anymore. It's, it, that train left already. But we started migrating to online education back in 1996. So we have students in over 60 countries and graduates in over 60 countries. Now um, we have brought uh, together some tremendous alliances, for example, with Ubiquity University, Green Project Management, Donut Economics Action Lab, a lot, Savory Institute, Capital Institute. So we're now networking. We launched a master's in regenerative uh, action uh, we're launching the Global Regeneration Corps, where we expect to be able to train thousands of children around the planet, young people around the planet, to become first responders for regeneration. We need to scale this up by millions of times. It's just a question of funds and scaling to be able to get around the world with armies of young regenerators really showing differences to their neighbors. We try to convince uh, chemical farmers to move away from chemical farming. It was impossible. So we picked 20 of their kids and started regenerative farming with them. And now the parents are realizing the kids are making a lot more money, producing better food, not depending on, uh, on these chemical companies to throw their money into. So they start looking and they start changing. So it's just showing with cattle production. A lot of people are saying we need to get rid of cattle. The previous speaker said bringing animals actually increases fertility, increases soil carbon. And we have done that. And we have farms that have been monitored even before us uh, by the Ministry of Agriculture. They're producing one centimeter of topsoil per year with cattle. We're now doubling the amount of cows in a, in a farm and reducing the area for the cattle by giving area back to biodiversity. 
So they're making more money. So we don't really have to convince them. Uh, they're coming to us because they can double their production and say, uh, serve as a really important carbon sink. What are the sensors that you referenced before that you might have next year? Okay, um, there are groups working on sensors to fix, to be able to determine carbon almost in real time. And um, I really can't uh, say much more than do that than that, but that will actually be uh, the, the game changer. And together with the training program for development, we launched the first certificate uh, on regenerative entrepreneurship at the university uh, in 2019. Every one of these students that graduated from that, I'm not talking students, uh, all 18 year olds, we had students over 60 years old have changed their life and now are regenerating. So bringing these tools will actually allow us to uh, make things a lot more effective, but it's a nature-based solution. It's biomimicry, actually building biomimicry, applied biomimicry, not only material biomimicry, but looking at how nature has solved things for millions of years. And that uh, brought into educational programs changes the mindset of students. And we need to move away from the reductionist approach. We need to get students to unlearn and actually be able to then really have action in regeneration. And that it goes across every single activity. It's not only environment, it's not only agriculture, it's not only biodiversity, it's economics, it's local development, it's tourism. You name it, we need to work holistically. Culture and spirituality, you also mentioned that before. I can see that you're thinking very long term, and so I'm going to make a hypothesis that you've started thinking about and perhaps already started working on what kind of North Star might we want on the other side of the 2030 timeframe of the current sustainable development goals? Your work on the millennial goals and then moving forward, uh, the work on the sustainable goals. Um, we're within striking distance. We won't make them all. We will want a continued emphasis looking ahead, kind of governance by goals has really taken hold of our hearts and our minds. What are you folks working on there? What are you imagining you might do in helping lead a global conversation on that what's next? Well, we're actually already in that global conversation. In the economic part, we launched, launched Bounce Beyond uh, a year and a half ago. That's new economies for local development. We have the, the Regenerative Communities Network with Capital Institute, which already has 15 countries and new countries are coming in. So bioregions collaborate to, to regenerate uh, and, and co-create solutions for a regeneration. So it's, it's all over uh, moving way beyond our borders. Um, and okay, yes, the sustainable development goals will help, but again, we need to demonstrate it, it's, it's enough talking we just have to show that we can do things differently, make it better and have people actually do it, not talk about it. I, I just, I'm not really willing to spend time talking about and going to these forums and going to the big uh, conventions and more blah, 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 as, as Greta said, and it's really has to come to action. So we don't need rocket science. We, I always say this is the best scientifically documented planetary extinction. We know exactly, we have the science to know why we're gonna go kaput. We just have to turn all this to wisdom and show that it happens. When, when I was young, Buckminster Fuller gave the convention or the graduation speech at a small college near my little hometown in Iowa. And I went over to see him because I had fallen in love with domes and I had built domes. And what I remember about that day, it was a sunny Iowa summertime, was somebody who wanted to make sure that there were young people alive and out all over the world, just excited about taking the world to a better place. I feel that same passion in you. I feel that same vision. I'm looking forward to all the other ways we might collaborate and work together. My life was changed by some young women leaders who from Costa Rica said, well, you know, we don't have an army. I said, what? 
They said, yeah, you know, and we've kind of changed our agriculture. I said, what? They said, yeah, yeah, but we're behind that. We got to change transportation. And I go, oh, and so having that experience of meeting my new teachers and having this opportunity today to talk to you just gives me a sense of some opportunities that we have to find these dynamics. And I'm the lucky one in my state where there's lots of action and lots of things going on. And I feel energized and inspired when we can connect on action, but also on that commitment down into the long term. So thank you so much for being part of this conversation today. And I'm looking forward to coming and visiting you whenever it's safe and sound and to be part of that transformation you're leading there. And sometime when we're doing some fun things here, having more of those young leaders and perhaps yourself come see and be part of our process. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the, for the possibility of having this conversation. Actually, I'm not willing to learn how to adapt to a changing planet. Uh, climate change adaptation, I think, is a big mistake. We still have time to co-create a future together. And nature has shown us with the vacation we gave it last year that it is willing to keep on co collaborating with us. So let's build a future and not learn how to live in a collapsing planet. Amen. Thank you very much. Bye now. Bye-bye. Welcome back to our Global Minnesota World Food Day sessions. We're looking this afternoon at some of the solutions, some of the exciting ways that people are tackling a number of the ways in which food security has been pushed backwards, has been weakened. Um, our first session was on climate, the impact of the climate crisis. We're now going to look at how the weakening of public health has given us a COVID pandemic that's been devastating to farmers and people applying to buy food and feed their families. And what are some of the uh, uh, approaches that people are using today in the public health arena to both tackle the public health issues and strengthen food security for families, for communities, for nations? Uh, we're gonna be first hearing from Dr. Mary Bussell who heads up the Vaccine Ecosystem Initiative of the Economist Group. And then we'll have um, Vice President, Chief Medical Officer from Blue Cross Blue Shield, Dr. Mark Steffen. And then uh, two co-authors of an exciting new book called Inflame, Dr. Raj Patel and Dr. Rupa Ma Maria. And uh, first we'll start with Dr. Mary Bussell. Welcome back everyone, wherever you're viewing around the world to Global Minnesota's World Food Day 2021 Symposium. I'm very pleased to be joined by a new friend and colleague, Dr. Mary Bussell. She's the lead at the Vaccine Ecosystem Initiative at the Economist Group. And her vision of how we are tackling this problem, this challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic, We've seen today in earlier presentations the impact this has had on food security, on economic survival and security worldwide. The Economist Group has taken a very special focus on solutions that are big picture. And Dr. Bussell is our lead today to give us a sense of how that larger vision is coming about and how it can help us find those solutions that are both short-term 
but also long-term. Welcome so much, and thank you again for joining us, Dr. Basil. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much for extending the invitation to me. Can you give us a sense of the ecosystem initiative, how it came to be, and what your approach is, how that's working? Well, it's incredible to think that we're coming up on life with this novel coronavirus. Two years, it's amazing um, what, what global economies have been through, what human lives have been through in the past nearly two years. At The Economist Group, we started thinking about the, the future and the next steps. A lot of people, a lot of discussion was going on trying to understand what we are doing now to deal with the current pandemic, but we wanted to take a bigger picture view, understanding what is going on now, but working to improve the vaccine ecosystem for all diseases that are amenable to prevention through vaccination. And hopefully then take the lessons from what we are living with today to improve the opportunity for a better and healthier future. And in that approach, how have you seen the evolution now? And what are the particulars that your initiative are approaching that are beginning to be taken up by governments, by large institutions? It seems like you're beginning to have a very significant impact around the world and specifically in the policy making arenas? Well, crisis can be a, a real catalyst for innovation and progress. We wanted, we've seen organizations, businesses um, across the board collaborating in ways that are new or further developing collaborations that have been started in recent decades. And we are, we are finding that people are engaged in this discussion to a greater extent than has been the case beforehand. So what we decided to do in forming the Vaccine Ecosystem Initiative was bring together some of the global leaders from multidisciplinary backgrounds and from different aspects of the ecosystem in order to start this conversation for looking to build a stronger, more robust, more resilient vaccine ecosystem for the future. Bringing them around the table was, was a great, was a great um, uh, opportunity for us um, and really exciting. So we started the communication. Then we needed to build on the collaboration. And in order to, to do that, you needed to come, we needed to come together and think about how we can build consensus. The, throughout my career, what I have most enjoyed is having discussions with people and helping to build awareness because it is through awareness that we can identify opportunities for innovation and opportunities for improvement. And over, over the years, I've developed a little mathematical formula uh, which says communication plus collaboration plus consensus brings change. So that's something that we applied to the development of our vaccine ecosystem initiative. We brought together some global thought leaders in the area of vaccines and global health security to talk about these issues and help guide us in our thinking. Our work at The Economist Group and with Economist Impact, our new sister company to The Economist Intelligence Unit, is always about understanding the evidence because it is, use, it is using the evidence that we can understand where we are today to help provide the insights for where we want to be tomorrow. So 
I know that your uh, work was successful in creating a consensus declaration, a wonderful website that you have for the Economist Initiative. Can you give our viewers just a taste of what were the elements that were the most important in terms of binding people together, leading them towards collaboration that came out of that consensus declaration? Well, I, I had envisioned creating a consensus statement and working with our experts in helping them to help us provide direction. Because when you bring experts from various corners and various backgrounds around the table, you want to make sure that we're all going to be talking about the same thing, that our goals are going to be in alignment. So we started by putting forth some thoughts about where we felt that this initiative could go. And I was just absolutely thrilled with the way in which each of our experts latched on to this idea. And over a number of weeks, this consensus statement became something that came from their word, it was their words, it came from their hearts. And it isn't something that the Economist Group wrote, but it's something that we collaborated with the experts to create. And that's really impactful. And given this, the, the breadth of the work that we are looking to accomplish, I think it's really important that everybody buys into it. Understanding that, that issues related to vaccines and ensuring that vaccines are available to people around the world who need them. So improving access, improving understanding, improving the ability for research and development to, uh, to continue so that over time, over the, over in future years, we will have better science, we will have more information, we will be able to, to really be in a better place to promote global health security. If we look back to Edward Jenner and his first vaccine um, in, seven, in the 1790s, vaccine, the word vaccine comes from his work because it was his uh, observation that milkmaids would be exposed to cowpox, but they wouldn't get smallpox. Or if they had smallpox, they would not have as severe a disease as other people. So vodka from cow, we, we've got the first vaccine in the 1790s, yet it took until 1980 for smallpox to be eradicated around the world. What can we learn from that and what can we do better We've only eradicated two diseases from this planet, smallpox in 1980 and rinderpest in 2011. Rinderpest is an animal disease, but it had significant impact on human well-being and human livelihood because it impacted the animals that were being raised for food. So what, what can we do to make sure that we have more vaccines that can address disease for animals and for humans. Right now we have about 28 human diseases can be prevented by vaccination. Let's see what we can do to improve that number and help people to live healthier lives. Well, I note that you chose the word vaccine ecosystem. This is a big word. It is clearly implying the natural world and the human interaction. And also you were just mentioning how um, the, the evolution of the notion of vaccination has now become one where we understand we even have a vaccination for cancer, for one form of cancer. So you are building on several hundred years of science, but a science that has accelerated dramatically. And just my father spent 20 some years 
working on hog cholera to come up with a vaccination for one of the most important food sources on the planet. And it was because he saw people dying of hunger as a soldier in the uh, in China after the Second World War. He wanted to do something, and that was his chosen path in science. I'm wondering if you're taking that initiative and putting the word ecosystem around it gives us a sense that the future will be much more understanding the interaction of these to help the science that we evolve to go even further, deeper, and to be more available on an equitable basis to the whole planet. I hope so. I, I hope it does. Um, just last week, we launched our framework report for our ecosystem work. And we've created, uh, we've designed our work to fall into five pillars. So we will look more deeply into research and development, into manufacturing, into procurement, pricing and finance, distribution, logistics and supply chain management, and user acceptance and uptake. Each pillar is vitally important to the breadth and the health of the entire vaccine ecosystem. If any one of those pillars is weak, we do not have a viable vaccine ecosystem. But there are issues and opportunities for improvement in each of these pillars. Running across all of them is improved understanding from being able to ensure that the scientists have the technological abilities and access to the, to the technology that they need, all the way to the person who's bearing their arm for the vaccine to make sure that they have the knowledge and understanding that these vaccines don't just miraculously appear in a syringe, that there is stringent science and great care and dedication that goes into producing each vaccine. Dr. Bussell, give us a little bit on the Economist Intelligent Unit's World Food Security Index. Thank you. Um, this has been around since 2012. Our work on it has been supported by Corteva and it sets the standards for measuring food insecurity in 113 countries. We look at affordability, availability, quality, natural resources and resilience across 34 indicators. And this has helped in a number of ways over the years to develop improved food security, better strategies, and better investment. Dr. Bussell, I understand you're making a, an index uh, for the vaccine ecosystem. Tell us about that. Thank you. At the moment, it's called the Vaccine Ecosystem Readiness Index. We're in the process of uh, agreeing on the number of countries that we will look at and the specific indicators that we will measure. But it is our way of measuring where a country is in this moment in time to better understand where they rank compared to other countries and help to identify what can be done to improve the situation in each country. So we will be looking at a cross section of high, middle and low income countries to be able to uh, provide some direction. I think you have given us a big picture that has been only maybe possible if for a large part of the globe to understand because we've had a pandemic. If there's a polio outbreak in Afghanistan or an Ebola problem in the Northern uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo or a, a measles outbreak here in Minnesota, these have seemed isolated, individual, limited. They haven't generated the understanding that this pandemic has created the language that we're not all safe until we're all protected. And a year ago, when we uh, had a similar symposium on World Health Day, 
and we looked at that larger picture, it seemed like humanity has been given the gift of the opportunity of understanding how we are truly interrelated and how taking care of each other is the only way to care for ourselves. Minnesota had a politician uh, died tragically in a plane crash, but he he's famous for many things that he said and did, but he would always come back to the notion that we all do better when we all do better. I don't think Senator Wellstone had this experience of a pandemic, but if he had, I know he would have translated that into, and we can't all do better until we make sure we're all okay and we're all better. Your work, it feels to me, and I've seen now that uh, evolution with the new, with the declaration and the work plan and these five pillars, you're giving all of us a framework for a hopeful approach, but you're also defining many places where everyone can play a part. The fact that the, you know, the mischaracterization, we used to call it quackery, but all of the notions, especially in the per capita wealthier countries, will continue to generate new variants until that wisdom can be transmitted and it turned into something like it's happening in Spain and Portugal, where near the entire population is now safe. But also we know that the distribution channels have been broken, not working, whatever word we want to choose, but the injustice of it is right alongside of that's bad for the whole planet. So you're giving us areas to understand and those become places we all can make a contribution, talking to our family and friends and to our colleagues, uh, being part of a volunteer effort on a vaccination campaign, being part of the science. I know young people are looking at the amazing science. All of these things seem to be part of that larger ecosystem. And you've taken the point that it's not just to admire a problem or an ecosystem, is to engage in all elements of the ecosystem to bring us to a better place on the planet. Can you look ahead a year for us and talk about where you hope you will be next year and how that will then drive your hopes and ambitions beyond? Gosh, yes, if I had a crystal ball. Um, we at the, uh, our, our sister company, the Economist Intelligence Unit, has created uh, a projection of when we can hope to have the world access vaccines for COVID-19. And sadly, in some of the low income countries, it doesn't look like they're going to be um, getting vaccine until 2023. And this is, this is a real problem because not ensuring that the world has access to vaccines gives this virus an opportunity to create further mutations and further variants. And we live in horror and fear that something worse than Delta could come along. This would be a disaster. Um, so what we, if I can just look 12 months from now, we will have had an opportunity to dig more deeply into each of those five pillars of the vaccine ecosystem. And we will be in a better position to really point to the opportunities that we can address in the short term, and then the ones that we can tackle a little bit later on. So we're coming up to the end of our first year of the vaccine ecosystem. So looking into year two, it's trying to take those lessons, take those opportunities and maximize them, making sure that we really work with, within a one health context, because it's not just 
humans that we care about on this planet, but we coexist with animals and environment and making sure that um, that the environment that animals and humans have access to health and well-being. Uh, we want to make sure that we get leaders involved and that they understand the issues because lockdowns, while we tried to use them to limit the spread of this virus, it had significant economic ramifications. And in some places, economies still have not fully recovered from, from these, uh, these experiences. In some cases, economies have not fully recovered. So we want to be able to under, under, we want to be able to ensure that global leaders are endorsing the steps that need to be taken in their countries to promote the health and well-being of their citizens. We need to ensure that we can build on the confidence of what the scientists have been able to create to help us deal with this pandemic and the health challenges that confront us all. Well, it's been very important to get this big picture from you, this notion that we should be thinking beyond just this one, but that is in that, that general framework of learning from what we are experiencing and applying those, those three C's that you spoke about, communications plus collaboration plus consensus as being the secrets to change. It feels like your initiative there, the ecosystem initiative, gives us the framework for being better in prevention, being better in preparedness, being developing the science as we can, being better in the response in the short term, thinking about the ecosystem and the economic system implications and being prepared to deal with all of those as part of the human story. Thank you so much for sharing your hopeful and I would say, you know, sober vision of what the challenges are but the idea of the optimistic view that you've given us that we can take what we're learning and use that as the building blocks as long as we keep communicating, collaborating, finding consensus, and we are aiming for change that is fair and equitable for all people, yes, of course, but the planet and all who we share this planet with. Thank you so much, Dr. Bussell, for being with us today. And we look forward to staying in communications and sharing as we all go forward together. Thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome back. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Mark Steffen. He's the uh, Chief Medical Officer and Vice President at Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Minnesota. And Blue Cross Blue Shield has the reputation well deserved and earned working in our community on the social determinants of health at all levels, but especially around food, exercise, the built environment, such a uh, widespread of their understanding of what it means to really talk about wellness and well-being for all. Dr. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for being part of Global Minnesota's Global Day, World Health, World Food Day. And I want to open just asking you, Blue Cross Blue Shield early on became one of the chief spokespeople for the viewing the whole ecosystem, viewing the whole person, viewing the whole health experience and putting your money where your speaking was in helping the community get active, think about its built environment, all these things. How did that come to be? Yeah, Mark, thanks. And, and it's a pleasure to be here. And, and thanks for uh, having me join. 
You know, it, Blue Cross has really been uh, ingrained in the community since uh, the beginning of its existence. Uh, we've really had the pleasure of working with community on uh, designing solutions to really address some of these uh, systemic issues associated with you know, what we call, Mark, uh, social determinants of health. And, and those are, are far uh, reaching. Um, we've been fortunate to have uh, some organizations uh, internally. So we we have an area in our company called the Center for Prevention uh, that is solely focused on impacting community factors so that we can make a dent on the health inequities uh, that we see uh, in the communities. In addition to that, we have our Blue Cross uh, Foundation, who very similarly uh, is working hard on those very upstream social determinants of health. Uh, including things like safe and welcoming communities, as well as early childhood education. So I know from my own experience about your work, uh, you know, particularly in communities where there were inequities that then had direct health impacts. And I know that you supported very creative when people say, you know, we really need a, a, a community garden, or we really need a cooperative food store, that kind of thing. But I know that you've been thinking into the future and making some changes and new directions. My wife is a very, very happy Blue Cross Blue Shield member. And uh, so I, I get some of the magazines and all of that. But I, I'm very curious about how you see the things that you're doing fitting together in this larger picture of really tackling what has got to be a very, very significant food insecurity in our own backyard moment here in Minnesota. Yeah, Mark, I think that's exactly right. And you know, we've had food security issues uh, for a long time uh, in Minnesota, and we have fantastic uh, community-led uh, organizations that have been working to impact uh, uh, food security. You know, I'll call out a couple that we've worked with, Second Harvest Heartland, Hunger Solutions. I mean, there's a number of individuals who have been really dedicated uh, to impacting food security. It, when when COVID hit, um, boy, it, it seems like yesterday, but uh, we're now you know 18 plus months uh, into the pandemic. We knew that this was going to be exacerbated, uh, and we work closely with uh, Second Harvest Heartland uh, and uh, provided a $750,000 donation to them to help support emergency food uh, relief. So Second Harvest Heartland was out in all of the communities across the state. Uh, delivering emergency food boxes to families that struggled uh, with food insecurity. And, and you know, we didn't really want our efforts to stop there. We've continued to look at the impact of food on health, um, and, and particularly as we look at the uh, impacts uh, among uh, racial uh, or sociodemographic uh, health inequities. Um, we've partnered with some of our uh, local uh, clinics, uh, our North Memorial uh, Clinic, to help identify those patients uh, that need assistance the most and then get them the support they need. Um, a, another program that uh, we're working on, uh, both with Second Harvest uh, Heartland um, and a couple other partners uh, is uh, helping to work with uh, uh, pregnant uh, mothers to uh, ensure that during a pregnancy and then following after pregnancy that the family has uh, plenty of food. You know, we see uh, significant disparities in maternal health uh, outcomes. Uh, and, and we really think that uh, thinking more globally about what might impact those health outcomes uh, with impacting things like uh, the food that they're able to get access to and consume uh, can really help uh, alleviate some of the disparities that uh, we see uh, across the state. Well, so I know that, um, uh, you know, we're a, a big kind of system here with many different providers of health, health products and healthcare and all of that. But there's a kind of common theme that I hear more and more, a good friend from Ghana uh, who runs food service at downtown at Hennepin County Medical or now, you know, Hennepin Medical, you know, the big billboard, you know, food is medicine. I mean, this is really the thinking 
And um, I'm believing that the evolution of that becomes then, well, then what is the way that we become more like food as medicine in terms of thinking about its quality? And I know, you know, we have a cooperative in Minnesota that grows medicinals for Chinese traditional doctors in China. And they like the ones that they can import from Minnesota because sometimes they're the right hotness and they have very special words. So I know that there is more to it than just saying food is medicine and there's more to it than just let's reduce salt and all of that. Does Blue Cross Blue Shield have partnerships or relationships uh, that begin to give a kind of future orientation to what do we mean and how do we really harvest the true value uh, in individual lives and in population health of applying that thinking, but to actually how we're growing the food and preparing the food and consuming the food? Yeah, Mark, I, it, it's a great question. And, and I'll tell you, I, I grew up uh, on a, a small apple orchard in Southeast Minnesota. So I have spent my life in sort of the local food uh, system. And, you know, uh, they, they say an apple a day uh, uh, keeps the doctor away. It turned me into a doctor uh, somehow. But, um, you know, I, I think food, uh, both as medicine, but we also need to remember that food is also local. And, and, and so what we've seen uh, in working with some of the uh, both providers and community associations uh, is the more that we're able to leverage some of the local uh, food supply, uh, and particularly uh, able to provide uh, culturally relevant uh, food to individuals, the, we increase the likelihood of them uh, uh, engaging and consuming uh, those foods. And as more and more people participate in both uh, the uh, production, delivery uh, of food, I, I, I think it really brings uh, both people and communities uh, together in a way that goes way beyond the health benefits of the food itself uh, and, and really fosters and, and nurtures some of the community connections uh, in, in those social connections that I also think, you know, we want to see um, uh, improve uh, because we know that those will also uh, improve not only the health of the community, but the health of the individuals that live in those communities. Absolutely. I know that in our last panel today, we'll be looking at food and how it affects things about conflict. And in our own community, we know what the need is to reduce violence, to build more peacemaking and food and community gardens and you describing those social aspects in addition to, let's say the medicinal or to others just makes me very, very happy. And I'm looking forward to finding many more ways to partner with Blue Cross Blue Shield, but also partnering with you in this thinking process of where we go forward. You know, we've had a rough period here if you want to just count COVID, but that's not the only thing. And uh, last night we had a, you know, more trauma in our community. And so we have to be aware of these things as we consider uh, something that's as long term as our food system. You don't just pop a farmer out of the sky, nor a doctor, but we need to be thinking long term. And I just so appreciate Blue Cross Blue Shield's leadership and that kind of thinking and your leadership at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for being the leader who you are. Thanks, Mark. Bye now. Our last panel members are two writers, two authors who come together to produce a book that has created both a new vision, a new discussion, a new conversation. Um, but I think it's a book that has really helped us to begin to think about the real way that we and our bodies are really uh, part and parcel of, maybe use that word fractal, of the larger society and the larger ecosystem. Their book, Inflamed, is a hot item. I had to get it on my Kindle because I couldn't get a hard copy. And uh, I'm so happy that they could join us today. Dr. Raj Patel and uh, Dr. Rupa Maria, welcome to Minnesota, Global Minnesota's World Food Day. And 
please come join me here on the uh, Zoom on the Zoom. <laughs> Welcome. So grateful you two could participate today. Thank Thanks you. So I'm just I'm just getting my video started in just a moment. Oh, it's working good. We can see you now, I think. Well, terrific. Uh, while, while Rupert is uh, uh, just uh, figuring out uh, the, the 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 video on that, and I, I I wonder whether I might just entertain your you and uh, our, our viewers today with just a a, a little anecdote um, uh, as a point of correction um for uh, our friends from the economist group i mean I, I don't want to throw shade on the economist group but it's it's hard to break the habit of a lifetime uh, and i i'm uh, I, I do want to just observe that uh, you know the the story about edward jenner and vaccines is one that, that probably could do with a little correction uh, it, we all know uh, because we were taught in school that, that uh, edward jenner invented the smallpox vaccine by just observing that uh, you know uh, milkmaids were uh, not getting uh, smallpox because they got cowpox and uh, in his enlightened way he he took that opinion and turned it into science um, but the fact is that in 17, 1717 uh, British ambassadors to uh, to uh, Turkey were observing that Turkish women were inoculating children with uh, with cowpox uh, and in fact with, with uh, the, the the best part of smallpox is, is the way it was reported uh, and that children were uh, rendered immune uh, from that process uh, and uh, unfortunately it, it was uh, a woman uh, the, the wife of one of the ambassadors came back to the United Kingdom and uh, tried to spread this practice in, you know, in the early uh, 1700s. Uh, but because she was a woman and because it was other women who were doing it uh, in the Middle East, she was not taken seriously. Um, and that's one of the big points we have in our, uh, our book is, and when we're thinking about World Food Day, uh, the kinds of technologies and the kinds of in innovations we're, we're going to be needing are not necessarily the ones that have been sanitized by being passed through Oxbridge, uh, but uh, are more likely to be, have, you know, historically have been stolen from uh, women and Indigenous people in the global south, and we kind of need a return to that. So now that Rupert's here, uh, we can we, we can take off. But I I, I thought I would uh, suffer you, Mark, to, to hear that just because it's it's an important correction and one that sets the tone for the kind of conversation we're about to have. Thank you very much. Well, maybe it it's a good way for me to ask you about the dedication of your book, which is to children and to those practitioners, past, present, and future. And I wonder if you want to elaborate on how, when the two of you wrote together, kind of a, a new experience, you came to that particular dedication, that particular way of thinking about who the book should be dedicated to. Well, we talk in the book about the concept of deep medicine, and we dedicated the book to the practitioners of deep medicine. And um, the way we understand deep medicine is um, precisely in the same way that we think about deep ecology. So instead of centering our understanding of ecology as a human-centered phenomenon, making um, ecological balance work for humans, ecological balance should work on its own and for its own sake, for the benefit of all the entities um, that are part of an ecological system. Same with the, with medicine. So medicine can um, really, it's quite futile to envision health in, in the perspective of uh, something you seek for individuals, that we have to understand that health is a phenomenon that emerges out of systems working well together um, so that we can't vaccinate the global north and leave the global south behind and not expect a variant to come and bite us in the butt, which is what has happened, um, that we have to really look at the whole system, whether it's um, the health of communities, the health, health of families, and how those intersect with the various systems from the food systems to the way that the water water is um, treated to the ways that our soils are tended to the ways that um, people um, make their livelihoods. Um, and so when, when all of those things are in a win-win-win um, dynamic, um, where no one is left out, where folks are not, you know, some have more than others, um, but that where we are um, contributing to a um, economy of mutualism and care and respect, that is deep medicine. That is where health can be possible. That's where health emerges from. And not just health of humans, but health of whole systems. And, and you took the metaphor of inflamed and used it to help us as readers to understand our own bodies, almost like medical school was a kind of a joke Raj made there in the book, but also to give us a new way to understand what's happening in the world at this special moment, but also just what's happening in the world in general. 
Was it always in your minds together that that was the right metaphor and that's what's going on and that's what to do? And so that's why you started getting up at five in the morning every day to talk about this and to get this book out before Christmas so we can all give it to our friends and family? Well, yeah, I mean, the the, the idea of inflammation is, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not just a metaphor, is it? I mean, it, it's uh, actually, you know, the, the inflammation we see of wildfires, the, the, the oxidation we see in the soils uh, uh, because of uh, industrial chemistry spurring forward the, the you know, the, the processes of oxidation happening in the soils are not just uh, coincidental, but they are directly and causally related to a system uh, in which uh, you know, our food and medicine, first of all, have been separated. And so, you know, this is World Food Day. Uh, but the idea that food and medicine are distinct things uh, is only something that emerges in, you know, in Western colonial capitalism. I mean, you know, most other civilizations see food and medicine as coextensive. Uh, and the, the care of ourselves and our bodies and the health of ourselves and our bodies as coextensive with the, the health uh, of our uh, of our planet. And, and that's one of the things about deep medicine is that it is unpatented. It flows freely between uh, different communities. And, you know, uh, just to sort of uh, add a, a little coda to uh, the, the, the remarks about our dedication of the book to the practitioners of deep medicine. Uh, one of the things about those practitioners is that the way the practices that they have uh, are ones that aren't patented. Uh, now, for groups that uh, are interested in COVAX and have supported COVAX and other sort of vectors for uh, the transmission of vaccines, uh, COVAX is, of course, uh, set up to ensure the integrity of patents, uh, but instead uh, to, to ensure that the cash is funneled uh, to the pharmaceutical industries and that the integrity of international property rights remains unviolated. Um, if we are serious about uh, vaccinating the Global South, then lifting the patents and giving the Global South the uh, Moderna vaccine that we in the United States have already paid for, uh, um, which we own the intellectual property for, I think it's probably the best way to go. So if we're thinking about deep medicine and practices of health uh, uh, and of uh, reducing the inflammation of a planet, uh, then we need to adopt not just the, the sort of technologies of deep medicine, but also it's overwhelming, you know, it, it's sort of guiding ideas of transmission and its practices and its movements uh, that are absolutely free of the burdens of private property. So, also to, go ahead. And also, and I'm sorry, and also to be cognizant of what deep medicine is not. Um, so, for example, uh, your last guest, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, the health insurance industry in the United States um, is a part of the same extractive mentality um, where money has been removed from the system to, you know, it leaves the system and it doesn't benefit the patients or the providers. Um, decisions are made within COVID even um, that have seen record profits for health healthcare systems while nurses are in trash bags, um, not getting the PPE they need, where the decisions are made that are not keeping patients or providers safe, whether you're in a nonprofit system or a for-profit system, all these systems are working under the same corporate architecture. And so that's something that we really take a close look at in the book is what is the mentality of that corporate architecture, whether you're talking about the food system, the medicine system, um, the way our society has been organized globally through colonialism and the exportation of this economic model that has led to the degradation of our foods and medicines and our bodies and our planet. Um, and so it, in understanding what deep medicine is, it's also in understanding what it's not. So many years ago, I worked at the Foundation for Deep Ecology there in the Bay Area. And one of the things that was important about that moment was that there was a recognition there were still some old timers alive from the Second World War in that period where there were philosophers and writers about deep ecology. When you use that dedication to those practitioners from the past and present future, are there practitioners and writers and thinkers from this past period that are important for the next generation and all of us to be knowledgeable about and to be you know, paying attention to and getting their books and following? I mean, there's so many of them, I would say for myself, um, I work under understanding that I live on occupied stolen land here in Ohlone territory. Um, so I work under the knowledges and the, um, and the deep ec ecological principles that indigenous people continue to 
to manifest. So I follow the workings of grandmothers like Winona LaDuke, um, her writings in Shutting Down Line 3, um, the pipelines. I follow the work of uh, Black Elk uh, Medicine Man in the work that I'm doing with um, the Lakota Dakota community. I'm here sitting in the Friendship House, the oldest, uh, longest run Native American nonprofit in the country. Um, and so I, I, I follow mostly the 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 teachings of these elders um, through their writings and through their actual actions right now. Um, Raj, do you have any well, other? You know, we, we also drew uh, in, in the book on you know the, the, the long sort of Marxist history of medicine uh, with uh, practitioners like Rudolf von Virchow, uh, who again circulates, uh, in, you know, whose, whose ideas circulate in an attenuated form when he's uh, sometimes called one of the fathers of immunology, but there's, there's an abundance of paternity in medicine. There are fathers of this, that, and the other, but not, not many mothers. Uh, and uh, the, other, the other person that, that we, we really learned a great deal from was the practicing psychiatrist Franz Fanon. Uh, it's, it's often forgotten that uh, you know, the author of Black Skin, White Masks and The Wretched of the Earth was also a, a fully qualified psychiatrist. And while he was decolonizing, uh, while he was engaged as a, a psychiatrist in Algeria, uh, you know, he, he tried to decolonize medicine uh, by doing things like listening to his patients, which uh, still uh, sadly remains a, a fairly radical thing to do. Uh, but he was, you know, he did things like, you know, with the middle class French women who are under his care, um, reconfigure the hospital so that there was a cinema club and a, a printing press so that they could, you know, see themselves represented in certain ways. And for working class Algerian men, uh, that wasn't a priority for them. Instead, what they wanted to do was get out of the hospital and play football. And in the end, for, for Fanon, uh, what was important for him is to walk away from the hospital because for him, uh, as he observed, uh, the physician often owns the land. And when you have that kind of relationship of power in, in place uh, and those relationships of control and domination in place, um, as you know, as I know you're, you're wrestling with in Minnesota, the, 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 those histories of colonial power and ownership are inimical in many ways to a, a process of decolonization and a flourishing. So his experience in Algeria <clears throat> was one that, you know, I knew from just, you know, and you mentioned it in the book, but are there then threads now that say, okay, going forward, this is what was the conversation at that time. This is the conversation now. Here's how we can imagine the conversations in the next generations. And are there hotbeds? Are there places where people are really like gathering and, you know, trying to think through uh, particularly now with the, the incredible uh, kind of challenges everybody is facing at the moment. I mean, I, I was, you know, in the Bay Area for a decade, and there were always places where new kinds of approaches to wellness and well-being seemed to be bubbling up. Are those places seeming to be bubbling up? And is there kind of new, uh, new energy, new inspiration, new ideas all over the planet, uh, all over? Well, there's a beautiful work that we're doing um, through our organization called the Deep Medicine Circle um, in partnership with the Friendship House here in the American Indian Cultural District. It's work that's happening also in the Lakotas with the Minnewichoni Health Clinic and Farm. It looks like there's a village going up in Seattle and now Dolores Huerta has just reached out because she's interested in um, creating the same model down in Bakersfield. And the model, we call it Farming is Medicine. And it starts with returning land back to indigenous people and really honoring their sovereignty as knowing how to manage the resources of their own lands through their cultural practices, whether it's burning, whether it's um, how the soil is tended and working under their leadership to grow food and to care for the earth. Um, the food then is liberated from the market economy and given to people um, who need it, which is everybody. Food is a right, just as health is a right, just as clean water is a right. Um, and so it's reimagining those um, relationships to land and to each other um, that is um, a restructuring of our social relationships, of our cultural relationships as settlers and indigenous people together on stolen land. Um, and so that work has been extremely exciting um, because it's bringing back and reattaching people to land and also um, creating new ways of being together on this land that we never had an opportunity to experience under the colonial architecture that was handed to us. So um, imagining new ways of being together opens and invites the opportunity for health to be possible in ways that used to exist here. So here in San Francisco, occupied Ramatishaloni territory, 
there was never a thing as a homeless person, um, or there was never a thing as a hungry person um, in these communities. That was not known um, that in the last 150 years that you know, we have an epidemic of homelessness and people have been left out on the streets in the midst of this pandemic. And they've been left out in the streets with the pandemic and the AQI, the horrible air quality from the wildfires. So what is it about that severance of care that we have as a part of our culture? that so many of us are traumatized by, that we're, we're just burnt out by, that we're so so deeply saddened by? And what are the opportunities to reconnect with our humanities through reimagining other economies? And, and that is happening right now. And it's an understanding that health you cannot have wellness without dealing with the structures around not only individuals, but entire communities. So you can't just go to yourself and your, you know, your little meditation zone and do your ohms and your yoga and then expect to get better when everyone around you is you know, falling apart. So how do we work collectively and how do we work together bridging cultures to heal from the wounds of colonialism, specifically through food and medicine? Um, and that's the work that we're doing and many groups are doing around the country and it's it's very and also around the world it's very exciting it's rejecting the logic of um, domination that we've all inherited um, through the colonial apparatus well, it's so great that dolores is still so active you know her early leadership of the farm workers the creation of the cooperatives for the cherry tomato i mean all of that history fighting the water wars I mean, you know, this is a woman of lifelong, uh, not just engaged in the struggle at the front line, but also an observer and a writer about uh, her books have been very insightful in that way. And I've been surprised just in terms of seeing the transformations taking place in many of the tribal council owned farms we had on the climate adaptation uh, staff and the tribal chair from uh, the Iowa tribe of Nebraska and, and Kansas talking about you know both transforming the mechanism the way they're producing but also the marketing system and how they're using it to address hunger and, and malnourishment uh, within the tribe and you know there's the Oneida farm and there's just a whole lot of land that is either could be or is being cultivated but is an opportunity that you're describing and it seems like that's a very hopeful sign um you know i i'm always uh, uh and, you know this last week uh sal fujimoto and a few others were highlighted in some book reviews that i saw and there are others like a sal who were the mentors for most of us i mean i spent many years with a sal and he um you know not all of them are still around, but Dolores is still around and Esau is still around. And it's um, it's an opportunity for, um, you know, building out and building out uh, a new way of thinking. But it's exciting for me because, uh, you know, we have, um, you know, bits and pieces of this. And then so I, you know, I, I wasn't joking about getting the book for Christmas. But for example, a really good friend um, uh, from Ghana, um, uh, Isaac Owens, uh, has been the head of the food service at the downtown it's a hennepin what used to be the hennepin county library but anyhow he got stuck in ghana during covid uh, he was home visiting and um you know up on his top floor in the cafeteria it's like food is medicine but he said that they were stuck because they couldn't import rice from china and tomatoes from you know and so they had to go back to recovering their food self-sufficiency but they also began remembering the herbs and other botanicals that they use for epidemic and pandemic protection when they were kids and people started ordering them from the Ghanaian diaspora in Frankfurt and London and all over, would they get these particular herbs and particular crops and put them in a you know DHL packet and send it up to Frankfurt, Germany. But it was a reminder and we would have long phone conversations about how this pandemic has created new kinds of ways to think and remember or be reminded or first learn about something um, that's been, you know, lost or stolen or in a way uh, painted over, shielded in some way. And that's what I loved about the book was that just opening up those kinds of conversations. Uh, you know, I read Francis Fanon for a, a different kind of purpose in 1968 than reading about how he thought about medicine and wellness and so that's a kind of gift of a deeper understanding a deeper learning just like there's deeper ways to think about medicine so i was really in, amazed just listening about your writing process when i uh, caught two of your interviews and so the one yesterday 
you were uh, new to writing together, which I was thought really amazing. And your description of it was really inspiring about what quality and deeper depth comes when there's two different bodies of general expertise and experience and, and interest and all that bumping up and bumping up and then coming together, you get a much deeper understanding of things that are not, uh, they're not deserving of shallow attention. And so if they're deserving of deep attention, then having two of you like you did come together and make that treasure is a very important accomplishment and contribution um, at a big scale. Well, thank and, you. And, and um, now in the conversations about it, do you two have a next volume in your minds if you haven't told each other or that you have? I want to make a movie. I want to make a movie. Um, oh, I just also have to be mindful. Now we're I'm, talking. Okay. <laughs> I, I would love to uh, just, Raj is such a great storyteller visually. I loved his movie, The Ants and the Grasshopper. Um, everyone should see yes. it. It's beautiful. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but I would love to make a movie or a series uplifting deep medicine practitioners around the world and showing, because yeah. people will be like, oh God, this is just too big. How do you do this? And I'm like, well, it's already happening. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's hard for people who don't, who aren't involved in this work of creating new culture to see what that actually looks like and, and yeah. see how it can be scaled, not through, you know, getting a mega conglomerate to do it, but through sharing of ideas and, you know, trading and um, networking. Oh, um, this I say is that, wonderful. I, um, I thought about it only a little bit because the movie about Fumble Talk, I mean, the book was fantastic, but the movie in particular, which I said, how could you show this? How could you explain that? I mean, how could a movie transmit that much trauma, healing, unbelievable, but she did it. And, yes. you know, we, we use it a lot. And it, uh, it gave me a different way of understanding about um, sitting and seeing really hard things. And so I'm picturing what you could do, but especially if you were to bring the elements of different possibilities around the planet and around uh, the world. This would be, uh, well, I, I mean, mean that, that's, you could do that in little, uh, you know, uh, like they do the food chip. You know? well, but, but that's the, the joy I, I apologize. Of the moment, I, uh, I'm, I apologize, I'm so sorry. I have to jump off. Um, I, I have been called so, to another thing. So we do, we but, all But, but do. Let, please let Raj finish and then I'll just give my love to you guys. Thank you so much, I'm sorry, Raj. See you in the movie. Well, that, I mean, you know, just uh, very briefly, that, 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 that's the joy of this moment, um, that uh, we are, you know, World Food Day is, is increasingly a depressing day because the, the figures are just getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, but when it comes to the alternatives, the good news is that we're not at the beginning of the alternatives, we're already in the middle. Uh, and uh, now's, now's a good time to, to, to join in to, to help us reverse course. But thank you so much. Amen. Mark. Thank you, Raj. Thank you so much for the gift of this book and getting it out before Christmas. But we'll be back to this conversation and talk about that movie. Thank you again. Bye now. Bye-bye. Welcome back, everyone. We're entering our last hour of Minnesota, Global Minnesota's World Food Day. And we've been looking at these issues of how COVID and climate change and conflict has impacted the world in terms of moving backwards on food security. We're more food insecure now, and we were making such good progress. So today is partly devoted to seeing how we can get that momentum moving forward. But one of the things that we've been understanding more and more is how these factors are interconnected around conflict. Uh, conflict of famine and access to water or land for grazing and creating conflicts within communities, but also how conflicts 
sometimes become so violent, people have to flee. And so we've had a lot of uh, specific information and general big picture, but this afternoon we're focusing on some of the ways in which we're having the opportunity for real success and for uh, positive uh, moving forward. John Ellenberger is the senior VP at Land of Lakes Adventure 37. John's one of the people who's really taken the notion of how food and hunger become intertwined with conflict and why we have to find solutions, fundamental. And uh, Lando Lakes has been one of the real leaders in that. I'm so glad that John, you could join with us today and be part of our conversation about how conflict resolution that promotes food security is part of how we go forward now, tackling the problems that have been in front of us. John, the, the, uh, the aspect of this uh, program that you will be addressing will come after we have a, a brief opening uh, video about uh, conflict resolution and thinking about it uh, from the point of view of, of sort of personal. So um, I'm hoping that our conversation with Land of Lakes having such a global vision that you can help us take it into that global vision. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate John having his SDG badge on and um, we'll be returning that uh, to the SDG. And um, here we have our first uh, segment. Uh, we've had the opportunity to talk to Joanna uh, Foreman, who's the founder and CEO of Conflict Cuisine. And Conflict Cuisine has been looking at food, how food is used in conflict, but also how food can help bring us together for addressing conflict. Uh, Joanna is uh, uh, the uh, director of this program. Uh, she's had a, a, a very successful career in the foreign service and in our di public diplomacy. And now she's helping us all think about cuisine and conflict together. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Mark Ritchie. I have the honor of serving as president of Global Minnesota, and it's my pleasure to be able to moderate this next part of our panel. Today, we've been looking at the impacts of climate crisis, of COVID, of violent conflicts on food security. Earlier part of the day, we got the big picture. This part of the session, we are looking at solutions. We're looking at the positive agendas. We're looking at the ways that people are both tackling the problem of food security directly and tackling the underlying causes of the conflicts of the climate crisis and thinking about how the short term and the long term term fit together. Joanna Mendelson Foreman is one of the most important voices of that hopeful way. She created an organization out of her life of working in diplomacy. Now, sometimes people are using the word gastro diplomacy, and now we talk about social gastronomy. But Johanna has been the leader, voice, and thinker, and doer in the area of seeing how food can move us to a place of resolving conflicts, how food can be a tool of diplomacy, bringing people together where our kitchens become part of our nation's foreign policy. I want to invite uh, Johanna to join us on the screen and to hear her story of where did conflict cuisine begin and how do we keep the momentum to solve these conflicts who are damaging our food security so dramatically. Welcome, Johanna, to the panel. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to join you and all the other distinguished panelists who've been here at this program for World Food Day. Uh, it's an honor for me, not only because I have great respect for the work that you've done at Global Minnesota, but I think talking about the message that should come out of all the tragedies that we've seen because of climate change, because of conflict, and because of the pandemic, uh, we need to look forward. But first, let me tell you a little bit about who I am, because uh, I'm not only a person who works on food, but I spent my career dealing with some of the most intractable conflicts. I worked for the U.S. government, for the World Bank, at a time when people were recognizing that what we thought was the New World Order when the Cold War ended was really the New World Disorder. 
and many, many conflicts arose because of the chaos that happened when the Soviet Union collapsed and when the United States became the sole global power. So I come to this as an academic. I teach the course called Conflict Cuisine, War and Peace Around the Dinner Table, uh, because I believe that food does have a tremendous power to give people a chance to share. And there's a lot of interesting things about the word that food and coming together, which you may not realize. Uh, coming together, commensality, coming around the table is nothing new. It comes from the ancient Greeks. The word commune was really about having a way to come together as a community. Uh, the word company, which we talk about, we have company when we dine, it means coming together around bread. So this has very deep roots. But what's different today about coming together over food is that we know that sharing a meal and doing things around food is a less dramatic or less conflictive way of resolving conflicts. Uh, so that's why I'm hopeful that moving forward, there are many things that one can do with food that can help build peace. But let's look first at what the situation is and why I got involved. And that's because we know, as you've heard in, I'm sure, earlier parts of this program, that the world has more hungry people now because of the climate changes we see. The UN Development Program did its report called Life in the Anthropocene, that is man-made. Climate change is affecting everything on this earth and we need to do something about it. And we also know that if we could solve some of the conflicts that have not been resolved, and the estimate is between 23 and 33 conflicts out of 195, 23 to 23 to 33 countries that have conflicts out of 195 countries, we could solve 60% of the hungriest people in the world. We could resolve that. And so that gives me hope that it's a lot easier to tackle 23 wars than it is to tackle wars all over the world. But I'm realistic as well. I do think we need to address what is called the crisis that has evolved out of COVID and the crisis that has set us back towards the sustainable development goals. Having said that, and with the goal of trying to get to zero hunger by 2030, it's going to be very hard. And I'm not going to review the reasons why. I'm sure you've heard presentations about that. But let me tell you what I think we can do going forward. As I said, we have out of this pandemic, and I'll work backwards from the pandemic going forward, a new generation of chefs who've become activists. And what I mean by that is not only are chefs practicing what you've heard earlier, social gastronomy, using food as a means to have social impact, but they're getting out of the kitchen and they're becoming leaders. They're becoming leaders around things that we know are important to address our changing climate. They're addressing of uh, the issue of food waste. And we know from all the reporting that if landfills were a country, it would be the third largest carbon emitter after the United States and China. So they're addressing food waste. They're becoming leaders in trying to deal with inequities. We know that social inequities are at the root causes of people being hungry. Even if you had access to food, if you don't have money to pay for that access, you're not going to be able to survive. So if we think about this pandemic solutions through the leadership of chefs, but also Mark mentioned something that I think we need to address and that's gastro diplomacy. Citizens have taken up the cause of using food as a tool to meet their neighbors, of creating communities, of creating livelihoods. One of the most interesting phenomena that has come out of this terrible refugee crisis has been the rise of refugee training in culinary arts, the rise of using people who come from other places to become active in the food space. And we have seen this over and over, not only in the United States, where I'm sure you've seen programs that help refugees, but globally. Over the last three years, I was working in a program in Turkey that was working with Turkish citizens and Syrian refugees, trying to teach them 
entrepreneurship around food. And what was interesting is though, even though that both groups did not speak the same language, when it came to getting together, what they realized was the cuisines of the Levant, that is the area that makes up Turkey and the Middle East, were very similar. And so as men and women spoke to each other, Turks and Syrians and from other areas like Afghanistan, they realized that they had this common root of food, common profile. I mean, food is a part of culture. And when you realize that you share a culture, it is a borderless component of building peace. Then the other thing that I think is very important out of this whole idea of how do you resolve conflict with food is that the leadership of communities is very important in building up resilience. It's very hard to build up resilience against shocks in price, shocks from climate alone, but there is a community-based approach that is very, very strong towards dealing with what we're facing. Uh, we know in the United States how communities have come together around dealing with the aftermath of hurricanes, dealing with the aftermath of fires in this country, but communities are also working globally in the poorest places in the world. Recently, I heard a director of the World Food Program in the Central African Republic, a place which has been plagued with conflict, plagued with bad governance, speaking hopefully about how the communities were saying, we're not waiting for the national government, we are gonna solve our food problems together. And that gives me hope that if you work at the local level, you will be able to get more done today. So to go over just what I said, for COVID, we have a chef's revolution in food, chefs who are working around the clock to get out of the kitchen and help people. For the idea of climate, we have lots of great work at the community level to build resilience in farming, building resilience in urban centers. And then we also have, in terms of the whole question of conflict, global conflict, a understanding of what it will take to resolve some of these conflicts and reduce hunger. So that's just so important, dear positive vision. You're not sugarcoating anything, but you're saying we have things that we can do. And I, I'm reminded there's a little film at the farm of uh, President Eisenhower's up by. Um, you know, um, right by Gettysburg. And he's uh, asked by Walter Cronkite, wow, why don't you buy this farm? He said, well, you know, I thought I'd torn up so much land on the planet, I should restore one. And so that was it. But he said, the real reason I'm here is that when I want to talk to a world leader, I invite him up to the farm and we go walk and look at the cattle and they want to talk about the cattle and food and food production and hunger. And they realize that he cares about what they care about. And then when they go back into the house to sit down and talk about something very hard, he's built a relationship with them around that connection that you described so beautifully that is something that brings us together. So you, you have a wonderful phrase about the kitchen being the new foreign policy venue. Uh, I think maybe uh, Talleyrand had a sense of this. He, didn't he famously say uh, he had the best chef in Paris and that was his secret to diplomacy? Are we um, relearning and are we catching up with Eisenhower and Talleyrand and are we gonna do a better job in this next period? Did, are we gonna come out of this uh, with some oomph? Oh, well, I I would you know love to say that this would be the uh, silver bullet or the silver uh, duck press. But in <laughs> fact, uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right in mentioning Talleyrand because during the Congress of Vienna, which was the second phase of after the Napoleonic Wars of dividing up Europe, it was the chef, Karim, who Talleyrand brought to cook for the Congress. And when he needed a deal with the Russians, with L Nestle Road, he actually had come to create a, the, what do we know as the Nestle Road pie, a special dessert for the, him and as a way of softening him up. So this is a perfect example of culinary diplomacy. But I think what I also said, Mark, and you're so right, is citizens are practicing food diplomacy as well in their kitchens. Uh, we are very interested in the cuisines of others and we embrace them. And that's why for me, the biggest question is, um, 
when a food becomes generic, and this is something that academics talk about, we don't think of Italian food as something foreign to the United States. We all like to go out and get a pizza or get some kind of Italian dish, and we don't even give it a second thought. Or we like German food, and we don't think of it as German food. So the real belief that food can help assimilation and make us, you know, out of many one is really very true. And the question will be, I think we're getting to that with Mexican food, by the way, where we don't even think of it as something that's different. We have regional Mexican cuisines in the United States because of all the different uh, Mexican groups that have come to our country. And we have regional Latin American food. So we do have this very powerful ability to come around the table and work with people. And I'll just say Franz Kafka always said, you can't fight when you have food in your mouth. <laughs> well, so we have also had expressions about, you know, armies and marching. But what you're pointing out is that there's the element of food that's sort of tactical, but there's the element of food that's strategic. And by that, I mean the changing the way we understand how we come to be truly brothers and sisters, truly neighbors, truly all in our case, Americans in this continent, this place where we are, but you are pointing out that it is something that citizens, people just instinctively know that coming to the table of coming to a cuisine that we've come to love and we've tasted and we've tried it and we have talked about it and we share recipes in that way, we can get to a different level of understanding that can help us then, you use the term softening up. I like the fact it's dessert that is the softening up in that story, but that's my own preference. But as a practical matter, breaking bread together, sharing bread, all of these phrases that we come to through our language and through religious traditions and all kinds of things are gonna be part of what we need to bring ourselves out of this sort of the crisis period into a sunshiny period where we tackle things like changing our climate dynamic, changing our conflict-ridden regions, changing this problem of some people with healthcare and others and the never-ending deltas and other kinds of things. You're giving us hope by your story. Tell me your single favorite hopeful thing before we run out of time on our panel this afternoon. You were ta- you were giving me a little hint of it, and it was related to our good friends in the North. Well, I do think that what makes me hopeful is science and technology and the application to agriculture. We do produce enough food in the world for people and will continue to produce enough food. The question will be, how do we, in a globalized economic environment, ensure that everybody has access to good, nutritious food? And I think the science will provide part of the answer. And the other part will have to be provided by the leadership of those in the agricultural sector, the corporate sector, as well as in the international community to demonstrate that we are willing to make certain changes for the benefit of our planet and for our neighbors. I'm gonna take that story, I'm gonna tell it everywhere I can, and I'm gonna invite you back for another time and we can talk even more deeply and wide about this really important subject. Thank you for your work. Thank you for the hope that you've shared with us today. And I look very much forward to our next conversation. Joanna Mendelson Foreman, thank you for all you shared today and your organization, Culture Cuisine, and folks will get that website so they'll be able to find you. Thank you again for being part of World Food Day 2021. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. That was a great way to look at the parts of the culture and how food fits together and how we come together with our hearts, maybe how we soften up things and make human relations turn into a more peaceful, a more le- or a less conflict ridden. But we are seeing how this happens out into the larger framework. And uh, John Ellenberger, who is the vice president and <clears throat> 
head of the special unit at our local cooperative Land of Lakes. Um, that unit, uh, Venture 37, looks at the larger global picture and food security specifically. And uh, John is someone who's been part of our community helping raise consciousness, especially about how Minnesota connects with other parts of the world, including especially Africa, but other, uh, other aspects as well. John, thank you so much for being part of this session today. And thank you for bringing that big picture into our community. We're so fortunate to have you here. I understand you have some slides that are basically ready, if, uh, if I'm correct. Um, I do. I'd like to, you jump right in. I do, Mark, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to join you today and to tell a little bit of our story and share some examples of, uh, of this question of how food can play a role in driving uh, global security and plays an important role. And, and I, I'm very fortunate to be a part of a team that's uh, had a hand in helping in some countries that I'll, that I'll speak to. Uh, Carolina, uh, can you put the slides up? I can't, uh, okay, then I can see them. Thank you. Um, well, good, good afternoon to all, good evening, as the case may be. Uh, my name is John Elleberger. I'm the executive director of Land of Lakes Venture 37, as Mark said. Uh, and I think before I go much further, I, uh, I will introduce my organization. Uh, I'm sure there's a broad audience who, some of whom may have familiar, familiarity with us, others who may not. So if we could advance maybe a couple of slides, uh, Carolina. Um, Land of Lakes uh, Venture 37 on the next slide is kind of a unique organization. Um, and let me explain first the name because it's, uh, it's not uh, self-evident. The 37 of our name refers to the approximate percent of the Earth's land that's used to uh, grow the crops and raise the animals that are used to feed the soon to be 10 billion people on this planet by 2050. Um, the venture part of our name refers to the belief that we have that we've got to work together in unique ways across continents and countries and communities to drive the kinds of outcomes that old models of development are probably not fit for purpose with some of today's challenges. And so we really are increasingly looking for new ventures, uh, for ways to uh, deliver the kind of food security that is so needed and to do that in a way that sustains the health of our planet, which is so very important. If we could turn to the next slide, please. Since 1981, Land O'Lakes has had an international development team, and our team has been focused on delivering integrated solutions that build and improve food and agriculture systems. Uh, as you know from our name, we're affiliated with Land O'Lakes Inc., which if you're outside the United States, uh, is one of the largest farmer-owned cooperatives uh, in the world and an organization that has been helping global communities thrive through agriculture and reach their full potential for a long, long time. Land O'Lakes uh, Inc., as we call it, the for-profit cooperative, is actually celebrating its 100th year uh, this year. Our work in Venture 37 focuses on four key pillars. We call them the four mores. We're focused on working to build more competitive markets, to help build more resilient systems, more nutrition secure communities, and more inclusive societies. Next slide, please. Thank you. In 2021, we have been operating about 20 programs in almost as many countries around the world. Uh, and the unique thing about the work that we do is that uh, apart from a relatively small number of people that are based here in the US to support the operations of our country team, we employ local staff, local leadership, work with local partners in the 20 or so countries currently that we're in around the world. Over the 40 year history of Land O'Lakes Venture 37, as you can see from the map, uh, we have been in, we've done uh, north of 350 different development pro, uh, programs in the areas of dairy and livestock and crops and other activities in over 80 countries. Um, and through that, we've, we've, we've worked throughout to strengthen farmers and cooperatives and commercial agriculture related businesses along the way. 
When we stop and think about food security and conflict, we think it's critical to think through the root causes of each and how they impact one another. As pointed out in the US government's uh, global food security strategy, increased food insecurity threatens other and mainly all forms of global security, leaving countries and communities vulnerable to increased instability, increased conflict, increased potential for violence. And the overall risk of food insecurity in many countries will increase over the next 10 years. And that certainly is, is not helped by the effects of the pandemic. Food insecurity, in our view, is both a driver of conflict and the outcome of conflict, two issues that are interconnected and causal effects kind of running in both directions. And that's how we approach our work at Land Lakes Venture 37. We've learned through our work that understanding root causes can help us achieve more sustainable solutions and that there are a lot of issues that are very deeply related to food and agriculture systems, particularly in emerging countries around the world. Let me uh, give you three examples from our experience that I think help to make the case. In Sri Lanka has a very long history that for those that may not be aware of, of ethnic conflict and suffered uh, over 30 years of pretty intense civil war that left behind many widows and single mothers and you know, injured and disabled people. Since the war's end, the country has been facing dramatic periods of political, social, and economic challenge up until current day. Sri Lanka has continued to experience a high youth unemployment, slowed economic growth, and is still really recovering from the aftermath of the civil war that ended in 2009. To increase opportunities for vulnerable members of rural communities in Sri Lanka, USAID through the Biz Plus program that Venture 37 implemented, partnered with small and medium-sized enterprises and facilitated investment to establish and expand businesses and employment opportunities in economically lagging parts of the country. Using this private sector centered approach, Venture 37 generated more than $22 million of capital investment into Sri Lanka and creating over 9,000 jobs and income creating opportunities. BizPlus partnered with, with businesses across the spectrum of industry, but the real focus was on rural poverty and rural food insecurity. And often that resulted in investments that were made into food and spice processing businesses that you know, alone generated over 2,500 jobs. One example uh, was a partnership with an organization called North Lanka Family Foods that enabled the country to open a new value-added food factory in the heart of one of the most co uh, conflict-ridden parts of Northern Sri Lanka. The investment highlighted the role both of the private sector, but also the importance of the private sector in the reconciliation effort. The market-oriented solution connected 200 farmers who provided inputs to North, uh, North Lanka Family Foods through an extension outreach program, creating both on-farm and off-farm employment opportunities in local communities. And the produce collected from these farmers in the region were transported to the factory and converted daily into higher quality products for Sri Lanka and for markets outside of the country. The next example uh, speaks to uh, our experiences in Rwanda. If we could advance to the next slide, please. There we go, thank you. Uh, Rwanda has struggled uh, similarly for many years with ethnic conflict. Everyone's probably aware of the genocide in 1994, but since then, Rwanda has made amazing and significant strides towards stability in part because of ongoing sustainable development programs that have helped to address uh, and create cross-cutting solutions for peace. Since 2007, uh, my organization's been working in Rwanda to strengthen food systems and ha which has the cascading effect of benefits for economic and health and stability. And currently we're doing a program called Feed the Future uh, uh, Aurora Wahaze, which is focused on uh, through local partnerships to increase the availability, accessibility and affordability of important animal sourced foods. 
by integrating evidence-based social and behavior change through the work that we're doing, we're directly reaching 160,000 livestock producing households and indirectly the reach extends to another 350,000 uh, rural homes and households. We're taking action through our work in Rwanda to increase production, to increase market access for producers, to help them with greater access to financial services and support to educate about the importance of nutrition and to help innovate in the areas of animal sourced food uh, product development. And across all of these interventions, we're doing it with an inclusive approach to make sure that women and youth and people with disabilities are involved and brought along. Through that kind of community development, Venture 37 is contributing to an equitable environment in which all citizens can thrive. The last example I want to share with you briefly is from Lebanon. Um, and boy, you don't have to look very far uh, than yesterday's paper, I think, to see some of the challenges that that country is experiencing. And in, in conflict pr prone countries like Lebanon, we're working to create enabling environments that strengthen food systems and work towards better markets. Um, it is a country that's experiencing some of the most uh, severe financial crises in centuries. And those economic conditions, socioeconomic conditions, are truly threatening peace in the country, as you saw as, as recently as yesterday. Agri-foods in Lebanon are a major contributor to the economy, but the agribusinesses there face constraints, not just in capital, but in product development and marketing and insufficient production and poor food quality and safety standards that limit their uh, ability to compete in broader markets. And these are the kinds of factors that are faced by growers and input suppliers and distributors and buyers. And so through a program that we're doing in conjunction with USAID called Lebanon Investments in Quality or LINK, we're currently implementing with local partners, working with high uh, potential uh, agribusinesses and processors and growers to help them overcome so many of these challenges. We've helped them reduce their reliance in Lebanon on expensive imported goods and to create a more sustainable self-production system in the segments of the market where we've been working. And so it's just another and third of these examples of, the, of, of where we've done some work that I think is meaningful in towards the intention of helping to ensure that food security creates and adds to overall civil security. If we could go to the final slide, please, Carolina, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Not all of the work that Land O'Lakes Venture 37 does is focused in areas of conflict where it's either a current or a past factor, but our experience, our global experience in those markets and in those experiences tells us that profitable and inclusive systems that create food and nutrition security is a, pre is a prerequisite for lasting peace and prosperity for all. And Mark, I, I really appreciate you asking me uh, to take part and letting me contribute some examples to today's important discussion. Thank you. John, well, thank you so much. And I have to say that uh, Land of Lakes and the Cooperative Movement, the parent uh, gave birth to this, is also part of the society-wide understanding that food and food production is part of the community and it is you know, central to our own story, but it's central to the world story. And it just uh, makes me so proud. It's the hundredth year, I guess, for Land of Lakes and uh, uh, it's much newer, but I know that uh, you, know, you were re referencing 1981 when the mm -hmm. real work, and this was also the year of the first observance of World Food Day. And so there was some consciousness being created in the broader arena that uh, perhaps the energy of the famine and the human suffering coming out of the Second World War that really per, you know, gave birth to the Food and Agriculture Organization and that sort of uh, larger institutional uh, needed to be re-energized, needed to be refocused and reminded. And the cooperative movement in the United States was really part of that you know, bringing that back around. So it's 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 a thrill to hear um, both these advances that you're making, but also 
how these are also part of our diaspora communities right here, right here at home. And so the connections that you were uh, describing and making were ones that really help us understand. Um, we just right, have well, a- Can, I, can I just interject with one comment? Yeah. Yes, I, I really think you're, you've you've mentioned a couple of times the importance of the, the notability of our group being, you know, connected to a cooperative, and and I really think that's important. That is that fundamentally farmers want to help farmers around the world. They're all in it for the same reason, and you know the purpose of Land of Lakes, really everything that has a Land of Lakes name on it, um, is to put farmers at the heart of helping to create a better world for all of us, and. You know, we're doing it through our Venture 37 outreach in, in emerging countries around the world. Land of Lakes is principally doing it uh, here in the United States, but also through, through its um, a membership who sell and market products outside the United States. So it's, uh, it really is uh, no surprise, no accident that a cooperative like uh, Land of Lakes is at the center of this. Yes, and it's probably not a surprise because we're kind of the world center of cooperatives here, up here in the upper Midwest and especially now. <clears throat> but I do love that notion that, uh, of course, I grew up in a farming community in Iowa and that belief that farmers want to help farmers. And uh, our next guest will be also bringing this message about gardeners want to help gardeners. But I think the thing that's important in general is that we have come to specialize in the things that create conflict and then how to prosecute wars. My goodness gracious, do we know how to spend money and destroy lives? But we also really know how to make beautiful, wonderful, delicious food available and have it for all on the planet. And we just need to lift up that part of our humanity and make it in that sort of center to our core. And uh, your work in Land of Lakes is really part of that. And it's such a great honor for us to have that kind of leadership here in our community, but also it keeps reminding us, uh, Minnesota as a welcoming place. Uh, we're a welcoming place uh, and we are very proud of that, but you always have to refresh each generation and you have to tackle each new kind of external shock to keep that life and that virtue and those values alive. And Land of Lakes has done it. So thank you so much for joining us here today. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. All right. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. Bye now. It. Our last segment today brings us back from our opening where we looked at the big picture and we looked at how the disruption of our food supply and the creation of more food insecurity, uh, whether it was because of COVID or climate or just the conflicts, um, how those things have torn us asunder and how we've gone backwards in our efforts to really achieve that zero hunger goal. But there are people everywhere, and including our next uh, guest in the last panel for our day, uh, Michael Cheney, please join me here. Michael's the founder and the sort of driver of one of our most exciting and, and really the uh, something very, very nationally and internationally recognized. But uh, Michael describes his work of Project Sweetie Pie as, um, you know, the kind of way that we can provide environmental and public health benefits that fight climate change, provide secure and healthy food to marginalized community, offer public green spaces and growing local leaders. And Michael, you've been getting recognition in new ways, uh, now becoming part of this million gardens movement. But it seems to me that what I feel when I'm talking to you or in just coming into contact with however you are engaged and the whole project is engaged, um, is that you're using food and the production of food to help build the relationships between people that then allow for a more peaceful community and more peaceful resolution of the conflicts that occur in, in life. Am I understanding Sweetie Pie and Project Sweetie Pie's uh, origins and portraying them in the way that you're taking them into the future. Certainly, uh, thank you, Mark, for having me today. I wanna to begin this conversation the same way that I begin any conversation, whether it's, it's with 
uh, state representatives and politicians or uh, daycare children. North Minneapolis is going green. Give us a call and learn what we mean. Where once lie urban blight, now sits luscious garden sites, gardens without borders, classrooms without walls, architects of our own destinies, access to food, justice for all. And now, like sweet potato vines, our missions and goals all align. Thanks for having me today. Fabulous. Michael, you were just uh, throwing a hell of a garden party. You were chosen uh, with national recognition for a grant to support a big community party celebrating your garden. Tell us some more about that. Well, I'm sure some of your listeners have heard of a fellow by the name of Elon Musk. Um, you know, he's in the news quite frequently. Uh, but he has a younger brother named Kimball Musk, who is the founder, executive director. Uh, he's a restaurateur, owns restaurants in Boulder, but also has a nonprofit called the Big Green Org. And it's been their mission to establish uh, schoolyard gardens across America. He joined forces with another philanthropist, a Canadian-born uh, citizen by the name of Frank Justra, who is a... Um, a uh, miner, uh, industrialist, who, but also a publisher who has a company called uh, Modern Fun and also a movie mogul, uh, Lionheart Entertainment. And so they came together with this brilliant vision that they wanted to start one million gardens across the United States and across Canada, very similar to the Victory Gardens, as you've I heard you talk about earlier today. So a campaign to really mobilize and energize the food movement and come up with real solutions and birthing the next generation of food fighters, uh, environmentalists, et cetera. And so they created this thing called the Million Garden Movement Ultimate Party. They did a national challenge, or I guess in this case, international, since Canada was also in the running. And we were very blessed and fortunate uh, Project Sweetie Pie applied and, and we were the recipients of the inaugural award of their event. Uh, it's been very exciting um, and it really shows that if we come together in partnership, in collaboration, uh, what incredible gains and um, motion in terms of moving the needle. Well, so now in the next phase, the garden party was a huge success. Michael, I know your vision is to take this and really make it global, but you do that in community. You've been uh, talking to some of our colleagues down in the South, seeing if there's a way we can do more exchanges within our own country. You've been bringing this to a new, you know, to a new level. What do you see in this work in terms of that process where you're greening the north side, bringing a new kind of community feeling to the north side, where do you see this going as you look ahead in this period? Well, we say at Project Sweetie Pie is the story of a community that came together, worked together for the common good of the youth and families of its community, for it takes a village to raise a child. I heard that echoed throughout many of your speakers today, and it was actually the Milan Pact in the work coming out of the UN that really was transformative for me, because I realized that we started off as an effort to try to stop the killing of North High, which is a historical African-American school in North Minneapolis that people were trying to move to close. And so we moved forward because we felt that the killing of a heart of us, the killing of a school is the killing of a heart of any community. And so in all good conscience, we couldn't do that. So we started off as an act of social protest. Then we went to an after school program. Then we went to a, a pathway to higher education. And along the way, we created the first urban farm uh, legislation in the nation with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Now, you, if you're a nonprofit, uh, a faith-based community, for-profit venture, you can apply for their agri-grant and get um, 
and get receive seed for money to build your program. So that's the kind of, I heard you mention seven generations. We've become kind of the Johnny Appleseed of urban farming, kind of the town crier, you know, really trying to get the community to realize that we are all um, environmentalists. We're either good environmentalists or poor environmentalists. And the thing that's unique about gardening is is that it's like a petri dish you know in a petri dish you add a little of this you take away a little of that but it's through that that you change the culture and so we see gardening as the landing strip for planting the seeds of equity and inclusion that we see as the seeds that uh, we should be doing as a nation um, i feel that the um local food production and urban farm movement is the latest iteration of the civil rights movement because it's not just about growing food it's really growing economics in a community and so we can't just narrow this to be you know some kind of feel-good activity but it's really for many people it's the lifeblood of the economies in their neighborhoods and it's unfortunate that for many, many years, there was so much regulation that made it uh, taboo that if what I'm doing today, I would have done 15 years ago. We started in 2010, but it would have been against the law. And so slowly those onus uh, kind of regulations and restrictions, we've been stripping them and really raising the consciousness. Because when we talk about urban farming, we should be, t and we should be talking about uh, land sovereignty. We should be talking about workforce development. We should be talking about global warming and climate change. I mean, there's uh, social justice, food justice, climate justice. The list goes on and on, and there's much work to be done. We've been very fortunate to, again, uh, recently, as you said, be awarded this award from the, um, from the Kimball Musk Organization. But we also won in 2021, we received from the University of Minnesota, a, um, the Community uh, Service Award uh, for our collaboration of, of, for the last six years, we've had an initiative called Growing North Minneapolis, where we bring egg and egg ed education students out into the community to work along with elders from the community so that we're all working together we're all rowing the boat in the same direction, and we're trying to guarantee that all boats rise. Well, Michael, one of the things that was really exciting over the last year was your uh, first part of putting together the notion of some uh, exchange programs within our country, from down in the deep south, Texas, actually where I'm from, from Georgia, but with our um, uh, upper Midwest. And so let's play out a little bit how you see that kind of people to people exchanges playing out in terms of building out this garden movement into a million gardens. Yeah. Well, um, that initiative, as you refer to Mark, was a thing I called the great migration. You know, people have been migrating across the country, around the world since time immemorial. And so, Clearly, the world is no longer flat, as demonstrated by this brilliant expose today, where we've had conversations with people from all around the world. So I took the long journey to Atlanta, Georgia, to uh, talk with Shirley Sherrod, who um, has bought the largest former slave plantation in Georgia uh, through money she received through the Pickford lawsuit. And the proposal I made with her was, could we create an exchange program, kind of a winter farm school, summer farm camp, where we would bring youth from the south, from the rural south to the north, establishing a exchange program that put them in direct linkage to the Cargills and the General Mills and the Land of Lakes, so that we can start building a pathway to diversity in those in those food and ag corporations. And at the same time, could we bring young African Americans and students of color and all children to the South, to her plantation, to spend some time so that we could 
overcome the stigma of racism, of slavery, to recognize that it is not a badge of shame, but it is a badge of honor, a badge of resilience. And so uh, they were very excited by the concept, black to the land of uh, the uh, great migration. And so how can we, as you know, uh, President Biden has shown us that uh, equity and farming intersect uh, two of his top priorities. And so it's through this kind of innovation and collaboration that we can really change the face of agriculture, that we can really address reparations in a very heartful and um, humanitarian way. How can we make equity, inclusion, access to all of these opportunities that are forthcoming? How can we make sure that people who have been wronged historically, Native American uh, residents, African American residents, how can we bring them into the food and urban farm movement, into the environmental climate change, which are going to be the uh, industrial sectors, the workforce of tomorrow. So in many ways, Mark, what we're doing in the way that I perceive it is, is that we are operationalizing the Green New Deal. We're not going to wait on anybody. We're going to plant trees. We're going to do food for us. We're going to build pathways to higher education. We're going to do educational exchange programs, and we're going to keep on building economics and regenerative agriculture and regenerative economics, cooperative ownership that we need to have refresh our drink and look at a new tomorrow. And so we're building the future and it begins now. Well, Michael, what's exciting for me is I also know uh, Shirley and her husband were the central figures in the civil rights movement in my home state of Georgia. You know, their life story and their ability to articulate a hopeful vision throughout all of that. And there was plenty of it that was horrible and all of that. But just the opportunity to build out relations within our country, it's very visionary, it's very exciting and inspiring but it also can help us to think differently. And that's what one of the things that's exciting for me about us being able to take this national recognition that you've received and to push it through the local media, to push it through the local policymakers, but also to have new and innovative things like you're describing this great migration. I know that uh, you had some fabulous TV coverage recently. And if I have your permission, I would love to show that right this moment to our audience that's watching from around the world. Is that okay by you? Are we going to come back here to the, yes, to the we room, are. room room? Okay, yes, well, we are. Certainly roll it. All right. What's better than the taste of a tomato fresh from the garden? Well, a project in North Minneapolis that is teaching kids to both grow their own produce and potential jobs. It's called Project Sweetie Pie, and its goal is to plant the seeds of economic growth through urban gardening. Organizers hope that it teaches kids valuable work skills and opens the door to future careers. Bill Hudson is at the garden right now on 25th and Lindell. What a great idea, Bill. Isn't it a great idea, Amelia? They're really off to a great start. This is their first year. They've got five gardens that are planted and are being cared for by about, oh, 150 or so North Minneapolis youth. Now, more than just teaching them how to grow their own food, they're also trying to be a pathway to striking an interest in some agricultural careers. Don't need to step foot in a field to teach kids about farming. This is an urban garden where hands get dirty and the work's hard. It's really a process. Like, you just can't put it in the ground and expect it to be there the next day. It takes a while. You got to nurture it. But growing produce is just the start. Household scraps can be recycled, reused, and added to this. They're learning the advantages of composting over chemicals and how to sell their produce. For those who don't like growing it, there's lessons in cooking it. They try to emphasize the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, you know, the selling of quality stuff, quality food, quality life. You will naturally lose weight. To prove the nutritional benefits of organic cooking, chef Cynthia Johnson turned so avocados the into avocado. chocolate pudding. Ah, look how delicious. 
wasn't a spoonful left. Good Got them get involved in part of this whole green movement. Those so, behind the idea out. say urban gardening can plant the seeds to this area's economic growth. This is how you build a community from the ground up, by getting young people involved at an early age and just saying, we're not going to wait on anybody. We can do this. Row by row, plant by plant, sowing the seeds of change one kid at a time. We can find more, um, like I say, efficient solutions of growing food, then I think everybody wins. Absolutely, everybody wins. Now the next step is to grow on this model into a larger uh, economic model to bring more gardens on board and more uh, people buying the produce and more kids involved in the program. And Amelia, they want to prove that, yes, uh, agriculture can provide a lot of jobs and a lot of economic vitality, which, of course, North Minneapolis needs. Amelia. Absolutely. And Bill, can we where, do we where can we go to buy their vegetables or can we also buy their food too that they made there? Yes, you can buy the uh, you can buy the vegetables every Wednesday and Sunday at the farmers market on West Broadway. Anybody for some fried green tomatoes? Got lots oh, of them. Oh, that here. sounds good. <laughs> All right, Bill. Thank you. You bet. Great day to be in the garden, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Michael Yes, great sir. message, great coverage. Bravo. Thank you. That was an that was an old video. That was when we first started. We've been we've been around for quite some time. When we first started this, we were really looking at food access, uh, food insecurity, food sovereignty. Over time, we've come to really expand our mind and change our focus. Right now, we like to look through the prism of what I say: food, water, soil, waste, energy that we're not stopping at any, any, of, any one point, that we continue to grow. And so our motto is come grow with us. You know, let's grow some trust, let's grow some partnerships, and let's continue to address the wrongs of history and build a brighter future. Um, I, 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 you know, I'm also an artist, Mark, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, share with you a piece that I'd like to share with people that have been here because this is really about what we've all talked about today is our shared humanity. And uh, that is, you know, ver and so that's cr really critical in the message. Project Sweetie Pie was born because I wanted a name that really addressed, we all, regardless of what race, creed, or color, we can remember when we were nine or 10 years old and our grandmother came to visit us, she tweaked our cheeks and we got, all got embarrassed and fell through the floor. Well, that's the kind of love, the kind of humanity that I wanted to see Project Sweetie Pie emulate. And so we were born. But this is a piece that I call Roll Call. What was your role? How did you participate in advancing peace, in eradicating hate? Join us, my sister, my brother. Our work is not done as we journey toward peace on earth and love in our hearts for everyone. Thank you, Michael. Bless you, Michael. See you at the garden. See you again soon. Peace. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Good afternoon, everyone who joined us today for this World Food Day 2021. It was inspiring to hear the stories this afternoon of success, Michael sharing his poetry and hopes about peace, other speakers throughout the day giving us the opportunity to both strategically understand but also to tactically see how we can make a difference and be inspired. I wanna say the thank yous again to our staff and to our team at the board level and to our uh, video firm that helped us make today successful. There was a lot of work that came by everybody through that. I wanna thank our presenters because we had so amazing people all day long, some who were up in the middle of the night and some who had uh, participated uh, in between other responsibilities. So thank you also to all of those presenters. 
and our members, our sponsors, our supporters, the state of Minnesota, the State Department, and some very special people who helped sponsor today. Landa Lakes, who you heard from, uh, McKnight Foundation and Hormel were important sponsors or gold sponsors. Blue Cross and Regenerative Agriculture Foundation were uh, silver sponsors. We have our sponsors and our supporters who help us throughout the year. Uh, Carlson Family Foundation and Delta, our Cargill and GHR Foundation and United Health Group. But also all of you who are members, who through your annual membership and other ways that you support us, make it possible to bring these free public programs to the whole planet. I think we were, reaching people in 38 states and 36 countries, but all over every continent. But we also had a chance to reach into our own hearts and reach into um, the hearts and minds of others from other parts of the planet and right here in our own backyard in North Minneapolis or wherever it might be. So this is the close of our 2021 World Food Day. We'll have a lot more programming throughout the course of the year around food and agriculture, but we look forward to International Day of Education coming up in January, World Health Day coming up in April. We're partnering with uh, St. Cloud State and with a number of organizations all over the planet for International Day of Persons with Disabilities coming up in December. So uh, all of this information there on the Global Minnesota website. But again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being part of making this world a world that's better connected, that's more peaceful, more resilient, and one that doesn't forget how we got here, but one that's always thinking about how do we work together to make the world a better place. Goodbye. <laughs>